Chapter One of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. The Murder Trial. Billy Byrne squared his broad shoulders and filled his deep lungs with the familiar medium which is known as air in Chicago. He was standing upon the platform of a New York Central train that was pulling into the La Salle Street station, and though the young man was far from happy, something in the nature of content pervaded his being, for he was coming home. After something more than a year of world-wandering and strange adventure, Billy Byrne was coming back to the great west side in Grand Avenue. Now there is not much upon either side or down the center of long and tortuous Grand Avenue to arouse enthusiasm, nor was Billy particularly enthusiastic about that more or less squalid thoroughfare. The thing that exalted Billy was the idea that he was coming back to show them. He was left under a cloud and with a reputation of genuine toughness and rowdyism that had seen few parallels even in the ungentle district of his birth and upbringing. A girl had changed him. She was as far removed from Billy's fear as the stars themselves, but Billy had loved her and learned from her, and in trying to become more as he knew the men of her class were, he had sloughed off much of the uncouthness that had always been a part of him, and all of the radiosm. Billy Byrne was no longer the mucker. He had given her up because he imagined the gulf between Grand Avenue and Riverside Drive to be unbridgeable, but he still clung to the ideas that she had awakened in him. He still sought to be all that she might wish him to be, even though he realized that he should never see her again. Grand Avenue would be the easiest place to forget his sorrow. Her, he could never forget. And then, his newly awakened pride urged him back to the haunts of his former life that he might, as he would put it himself, show them. He wanted the gang to see that he, Billy Byrne, wasn't afraid to be decent. He wanted some of the neighbors to realize that he could work steadily and earn an honest living and he looked forward with delight to the pleasure and satisfaction of rubbing it in some of the saloon-keepers and bartenders who had helped keep him drunk some five days out of seven, for Billy didn't drink any more. But most of all he wanted to vindicate himself in the eyes of the once-hated law. He wanted to clear his record of the unjust charge of murder which had sent him scurrying out of Chicago over a year before. That night that patrolman Stanley Lasky of the Lake Street Station had tipped him off that Sheehan had implicated him in the murder of old man Schneider. Now Billy Byrne had not killed Schneider. He had been nowhere near the old fellow's saloon at the time of the hold-up, but Sheehan, who had been arrested and charged with the crime, was an old enemy of Billy's, and Sheehan had seen a chance to divert some of the suspicion from himself and swear accounts with Billy at the same time. The new Billy Byrne was ready to accept at face value everything which seemed to belong in any way to the environment of that exalted realm where dwelt the girl he loved. Law, order, and justice appeared to Billy in a new light since he had rubbed elbows with the cultured and refined. He no longer distrusted or feared them. They would give him what he sought, a square deal. It seemed odd to Billy that he should be seeking anything from the law or its minions. For years he had waged a perpetual battle with both. Now he was coming back voluntarily to give himself up, with every conviction that he should be exonerated quickly. Billy, knowing his own innocence, realizing his own integrity, assumed that others must immediately appreciate both. First, thought Billy, I'll go take a look at a little old Grand Avenue. Then I'll give myself up. The trial may take a long time, and if it does, I'll want to see some of the old bunch first. So Billy entered an L coach, and leaning on the sill of an open window, watched grimy Chicago rattle past, until the guards, Grand Avenue, announced the end of his journey. Maggie Shane was sitting on the upper step of the long flight of stairs which leaned precariously against the scarred face of the frame residence, upon the second floor front of which the lairs and pennants of the Shane family are crowded into three ill-smelling rooms. It was Saturday, and Maggie was off. She sat there rather disconsolate for there was a dearth of bow for Maggie, none having arisen to fill the aching void left by the sudden departure of Coke Sheehan, since that worthy gentleman had sought a more salubrious climb, to the consternation of both Maggie Shane and Mr. Sheehan's bondsman. Maggie scowled down upon the frowsy street filled with frowsy women and frowsy children. She scowled upon the street cars rumbling by with their frowsy loads. 
Occasionally she varied the monotony by drawing out her chewing gum to wondrous lengths, holding one end between a thumb and finger, and the other between her teeth. Presently Maggie spied a rather pleasing figure sauntering up the sidewalk upon her side of the street. The man was far too away for her to recognize his features, but his size and bearing and general appearance appealed to the lonesome Maggie. She hoped it was someone she knew, or with whom she might easily become acquainted, for Maggie was bored to death. She patted the hair at the back of her head and righted the mop which hung over one eye. Then she rearranged her skirts and waited. As the man approached, she saw that he was better looking than she had even dared to hope, and that there was something extremely familiar about his appearance. It was not, though, until he was almost in front of the house that he looked up at the girl and she recognized him. Then Maggie Shane gasped and clutched the handrail at her side. An instant later the man was passed and continuing his way along the sidewalk. Maggie Shane glared after him for a minute, then she quickly ran down the stairs and into a grocery store a few doors west, where she had asked if she might use the telephone. "'Give me West 2063,' she demanded of the operator, and a moment later, "'Is this Lake Street?' "'Well, say, Billy Burns back. I just see him. "'Yes, and you never mind who I am. "'But if you use want him, he's walking west on Grand Avenue right now. "'I just this minute seen him near Lincoln, "'and she smashed the receiver back into the hook. "'Billy Byrne thought that he would look in on his mother, "'not that he expected to be welcomed "'even though she might happen to be sober, "'or not that he cared to see her. "'But Billy's whole manner of thought had altered within the year.' and something now seemed to tell him that it was his duty to do the things that he contemplated. Maybe he might even be of help to her, but when he reached the gloomy neighborhood in which his childhood had been spent, it was to learn that his mother was dead, and that another family occupied the tumble-down cottage that had been his home. If Billy Byrne felt any sorrow because of his mother's death, he did not reveal it outwardly. He owed her nothing but for kicks and cuffs received and for the surroundings and influences that had started upon a life of crime at an age when most boys were just entering grammar school. Really the man was relieved that he had not had to see her, and it was with a lighter step that he turned back to retrace his way along Grand Avenue. No one of the few he had met who recognized him had seemed particularly delighted at his return. The whole affair had been something of a disappointment, therefore Billy determined to go on at once to the Lake Street Station and learn the status of the Schneider murder case. Possibly they had discovered the real murderer, and if that was the case, Billy would be permitted to go his way. But if not, then he can give himself up and ask for a trial, that he might be exonerated. As he neared Wood Street, two men who had been watching his approach stepped into the doorway of a saloon, and as he passed they stepped out again behind him. One upon either side, they seized him. Billy turned to remonstrate. Come easy now, Byrne, admonished one of them, and don't make no fuss. Oh, said Billy, it's you, is it? Well, I was just going over to the station to give myself up. Both men laughed skeptically. We'll just save you the trouble, said one of them. We'll take you over. You might lose your way if you tried to go alone. Billy went along in silence the rest of the way to where the patrol waited at another corner. He saw there was nothing to be gained by talking to these detectives, but he found the lieutenant equally inclined to doubt his intentions. He, too, only laughed when Billy assured him that he was on his way to the station at the very instant of arrest. As the weeks dragged along, and Billy Byrne found no friendly interest in himself or his desire to live on the square, and no belief in his protestations that he had naught to do with the killing of Schneider, he began to have his doubts as to the wisdom of his act. He also commenced to entertain some of his former opinions of the police, and of the law of which they are supposed to be the guardians. A cellmate told him that the papers had scored the department heavily for their failure to apprehend the murderer of the inoffensive old Schneider, and that public opinion had been so aroused that a general police shake-up had followed. The result was that the police were keen to fasten the guilt upon someone. They did not care whom, so long as it was someone who was in their custody. You may not have done it, ventured the cellmate, but they'll send you up for it if they can't hang you. They're going to try to get the death sentence. They ain't got no love for you, Byrne. You caused them a lot of trouble in your day, and they haven't forgot it. I'd hate to be in your boots. Billy Byrne shrugged. Where were his dreams of justice? They seemed to have faded back into the old distrust and hatred. He shook himself and conjured in his mind the vision of a beautiful girl who had believed in him and trusted him, who had inculcated within him a love for all that was finest and best in true manhood, for the very things that he had most hated all the years of his life before she had come into his existence to alter it and him. 
and then billy would believe again believe that in the end justice would triumph and that it would all come out all right just the way he had pictured it with the coming of the last day of the trial billy found it more and more difficult to adhere to his regard for law order and justice the prosecution had shown conclusively that billy was a hard customer the police had brought witnesses who did not hesitate to perjure themselves in their testimony testimony in which it seemed to billy the densest of jurymen could plainly see had been framed up and learned by rote until it was letter perfect these witnesses could recall with startling accuracy every detail that occurred between seventeen minutes after eight and twenty-one minutes past nine on the night of september twenty-third over a year before but where they had been and what they had done ten minutes earlier or ten minutes later or where they were at nine o'clock in the evening last friday they couldn't for the lives of them remember and billy was practically without witnesses the result was a foregone conclusion even billy had to admit it and when the prosecuting attorney demanded the death penalty the prisoner had an uncanny sensation as of the tightening of a hempen rope around his neck as he waited for the jury to return its verdict billy sat in the cell trying to read a newspaper which a kindly guard had given him but his eyes persisted in boring through the white paper and the black type to scenes that were not in any paper he saw a turbulent river tumbling through a savage world and in the swirl of the water lay a little island and he saw a man there upon the island and a girl the girl was teaching the man to speak the language of the cultured and to view life as people of refinement view it she taught him what honor meant among her glass and that it was better to lose any other possession rather than lose honor billy realized that it was these lessons that had spurred him to the mad scheme that was to end now with the verdict of guilty he had wished to vindicate his honor a hard laugh broke from his lips but instantly he sobered and his face softened it had been for her sake after all and what mattered if they did send him to the gallows he had not sacrificed his honor he had done his best to assert it he was innocent they could kill him but they couldn't make him guilty a thousand juries pronouncing him so could not make it true that he had killed schneider but it would be hard after all his hopes after all the plans he had made to live square to show them his eyes still boring through the paper suddenly found themselves attracted by something in the text before them a name harding billy shook himself and commenced to read the marriage of barbara daughter of anthony harding the multimillionaire to william mallory will take place on the twenty fifth of june the article was dated in new york there was more but billy did not read it he had read enough it is true that he had urged her to marry mallory but now in his lonesomeness and friendlessness he felt almost as though she had been untrue to him come along burn a bailiff interrupted his thoughts the jury's reached a verdict the judge was emerging from his chambers as billy was led into the courtroom presently the jury filed in and took their seats the foreman handed the clerk a bit of paper even before it was read billy knew that he had been found guilty he did not care any longer so he told himself he hoped that the judge would send him to the gallows there was nothing more in life for him now anyway he wanted to die but instead he was sentenced to life imprisonment in the penitentiary at Juliet. this was infinitely worse than death billy byrne was appalled at the thought of remaining for life within the grim stone walls of a prison once more there swept over him all the old unreasoning hatred of the law and all that pertained to it he would like to close his steel fingers about the fat neck of the red-faced judge the smug juryman roused within him the lust to kill justice billy byrne laughed aloud a bailiff rapped for order one of the jurymen leaned close to a neighbor and whispered a hardened criminal he said society will be safer when he is behind the bars the next day they took billy aboard a train bound for Juliet. He was handcuffed to a deputy sheriff. Billy was calm outwardly, but inwardly he was a raging volcano of hate. In a certain very beautiful home on Riverside Drive, New York City, a young lady, comfortably backed by downy pillows, sat in her bed and alternated her attention between coffee and rolls and a morning paper. On the inside of the main sheet a heading claimed her languid attention. Chicago murderer given life sentence of late chicago had aroused in barbara harding a greater proportion of interest than ever it had in the past and so it was that she now permitted her eyes to wander casually down the printed column murderer of harmless old saloon keeper is finally brought to justice the notorious west side rowdy billy byrne apprehended after more than a year as fugitive from justice is sent to Juliet for life barbara harding sat stony-eyed and cold for what seemed many minutes then with a stifled sob she turned and buried her face in the pillows 
the train bearing billy byrne and the deputy sheriff toward joliet had covered perhaps half the distance between chicago and billy's permanent destination when it occurred to the deputy sheriff that he should like to go into the smoker and enjoy a cigar now from the moment that he had been sentenced billy byrne's mind had been centered upon one thought escape he knew that there probably would not be the slightest chance for escape but nevertheless the idea was always uppermost in his thoughts his whole being revolted not alone against the injustice which had sent him into life imprisonment but at the thought of the long years of awful monotony which lay ahead of him he could not endure them he would not the deputy sheriff rose and motioning his prisoner ahead of him started for the smoker it was two cars ahead the train was vestibuled the first platform they crossed was tightly enclosed but at the second billy saw that a careless porter had left one of the doors open the train was slowing down for some reason it was going perhaps twenty miles an hour billy was the first upon the platform he was the first to see the open door it meant one of two things a chance to escape or death even the latter was to be preferred to life imprisonment billy did not hesitate an instant even before the deputy sheriff realized that the door was open his prisoner had leapt from the moving train dragging his guard after him End of chapter one Chapter two of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Escape Byrne had no time to pick any particular spot to jump for. When he did jump, he might have been directly over a picket fence or a bottomless pit. He did not know nor did he care. As it happened, he was over neither. The platform chanced to be passing across a culvert at that instant. Beneath the culvert was a slimy pool. Into this the two men plunged, alighting unharmed. Byrne was the first to regain his feet. He dragged the deputy sheriff to his knees, and before that frightened and astonished officer of the law could gather his wits together, he had been relieved of his revolver and found himself looking into its cold and business-like muzzle. Then Billy Byrne waded the shore, prodding the deputy sheriff in the ribs with cold steel and warning him to silence. Above the pool stood a little wood, thick with tangled wildwood. Into this Byrne forced his prisoner. When they had come deep enough into the concealment of the foliage to make discovery from the outside improbable, Byrne halted. Now say your prayers, he commanded. I'm a-going to croak you. The deputy sheriff looked up at him in wild-eyed terror. "'My God!' he cried. "'I ain't done nothing to you, Byrne. "'Haven't I always been your friend? "'What have I ever done to you? "'For God's sake, Byrne, you ain't going to murder me, are you? "'They'll get you sure.' "'Billy Byrne let a rather unpleasant smile curl his lips. "'No,' he said. "'You ain't done nothing to me. "'But you stand for the law, damn it, "'and I'm going to croak everything I meet that stands for the law. "'They wanted to send me up for life. "'Me, an innocent man. "'Your kind done it, the cops. "'You ain't no cop.' but you're just as rotten. Now say your prayers. He leveled the revolver at his victim's head. The deputy sheriff slumped to his knees and tried to embrace Billy Byrne's legs as he pleaded for his life. Cut it out, you poor boob, admonished Billy. You've got to die, and if you was half a man, you'd want to die like one. The deputy sheriff slipped to the ground. His terror had overcome him, leaving him in happy unconsciousness. Byrne stood looking down upon the man for a moment. His wrist was chained to that of the other, and the pull of the deputy's body was irritating. Byrne stooped and placed the muzzle of the revolver back of the man's ear. Justice, he muttered scornfully, and his finger tightened upon the trigger. Then, conjured from nothing, there rose between himself and the unconscious man beside him the figure of a beautiful girl. Her face was brave and smiling, and in her eyes was trust and pride. Whole worlds of them, trust and pride in Billy Byrne. Billy closed his eyes tight as though in physical pain. He brushed his hand quickly across his face. God, he muttered, I can't do it, but I came awful close to it. Dropping the revolver into his side pocket, he kneeled beside the deputy sheriff and commenced to go through the man's clothes. After a moment he came upon what he sought, a key ring confining several keys. Billy found the one he wished, and presently he was free. He still stood looking at the deputy sheriff. I ought to croak you, he murmured. I'll never make my getaway if I don't, but she won't let me. God bless her. Suddenly a thought came to Billy Byrne. If he could have a start, he might escape. It wouldn't hurt the man any to stay here for a few hours, or even for a day. Billy removed the deputy's coat and tore it into strips. With these he bound the man to a tree. Then he fastened a gag in his mouth. During the operation, the deputy regained consciousness. 
He looked questioningly at Billy. I decided not to croak you, explained the young man. I'm just going to leave you here for a while. They'll be looking all along the right away in a few hours. It won't be long before they find you. Now so long, and take care of yourself, Bo. And Billy Byrne had gone. A mistake that proved fortunate for Billy Byrne caused the penitentiary authorities to expect him and his guard by a later train. So no suspicion was aroused when they failed to come upon the train they really had started upon. This gave Billy a good two hours start that he would not have otherwise have had, an opportunity of which he made good use. Wherefore it was that by the time the authorities awoke to the fact that something had happened, Billy Byrne was fifty miles west of Juliet, bowling along aboard a fast Santa Fe freight. Shortly after night had fallen, the train crossed the Mississippi. Billy Byrne was hungry and thirsty, and as the train slowed down and came to a stop out in the midst of a dark, solitude of silent, sweet-smelling country, Billy opened the door of his box car and dropped lightly to the ground. So far no one had seen Billy since he had passed from the ken of the trust deputy sheriff, and as Billy had no desire to be seen, he slipped over the edge of the embankment into a dry ditch, where he squatted upon his haunches waiting for the train to depart. The stop out there in the dark night was one of those mysterious stops which trains are prone to make, unexplained and doubtless unexplainable by any other than a higher intelligence which directs the movements of men and rolling stock. There was no town, and not even a switch light. Presently, two staccato blasts broke from the engine's whistle. There was a progressive jerking at coupling pins, which started up the big locomotive and ran rapidly down the length of the train. There was the squeaking of brake shoes against wheels, and the train moved slowly forward again upon its long journey toward the coast, gaining momentum moment by moment, until finally the way car rolled rapidly past the hidden fugitive and the freight rumbled away to be swallowed up in the darkness. When it had gone, Billy rose and climbed back upon the track, along which he plodded in the wake of a departing train. Somewhere a road would presently cut across the track, and along the road there would be a farmhouse or a village where food and drink might be found. Billy was penniless, yet he had no doubt but that he should eat when he had discovered food. He was thinking of this as he walked briskly toward the west, and what he thought of induced a doubt in his mind as to whether it was, after all, going to be so easy to steal food. Shaw, he exclaimed half aloud, she wouldn't think it wrong for a guy to swipe a little grub when he was starving. It ain't like I was going to stick up a guy for his roll. Sure she wouldn't see nothing wrong for me to get something to eat. I ain't got no money. They took it all away from me, and I got a right to live but somehow I hate to do it. I wished there was some other way. Gee, but she made a sissy out of me. Funny how a feller can change. Why, I almost like being a sissy, and Billy Byrne grinned at the almost inconceivable idea. Before Billy came to a road, he saw a light down in a little depression at one side of the track. It was not such a light as a lamp shining beyond a window makes. It rose and fell, winking and flaring close to the ground. It looked much like a campfire, and as Billy drew nearer he saw that such it was, and he heard a voice, too. Billy approached more carefully. He must be careful always to see before being seen. The little fire burned upon the bank of a stream, which the track bridged upon a concrete arch. Billy dropped once more from the right of way, and climbed a fence into a thin wood. Through this he approached the campfire, with small chance of being observed. As he neared it, the voice resolved itself into articulate words, and presently Billy leaned against a tree close behind the speaker, and listened. There was but a single figure beside the small fire, that of a man squatting upon his haunches, roasted something above the flames. At one edge of the fire was an empty tin can from which steam arose, and an aroma that was now and again wafted to Billy's nostrils. Coffee! My, how good it smelled! Billy's mouth watered, but the voice— that interested Billy almost as much as the preparations for the coming meal. We'll dance a merry saraband from here to drowsy summer camp. Along the sea, across the land, the birds are flying south. And you, my sweet Penelope, out there somewhere you wait for me, with buds of roses in your hair and kisses on your mouth. The words took hold of Billy somewhere and made him forget his hunger. Like a sweet incense which induces pleasant daydreams, they were wafted in upon him through the rich, mellow voice of a solitary camper, and the lilt of the meter entered his blood. But the voice, it was the voice of such as Billy Byrne always had loathed and ridiculed until he sat at the feet of Barbara Harding and learned many things, including love. It was the voice of culture and refinement. Billy strained his eyes through the darkness to have a closer look at the man. The light of the campfire fell upon frayed and bagging clothes, and upon the back of the head covered with a shapeless and disreputable soft hat. Obviously the man was a hobo, 
the coffee boiling in a discarded tin can would have been proof positive of this without other evidence but there seemed plenty more yes the man was a hobo billy continued to stand listening the mountains are all hidden mist the valley is like amethyst the poplar leaves they turn and twist o oh, silver silver green out there somewhere along the sea a ship is waiting patiently while up the beach and bubbles slip with white afloat between gee thought billy byrne but that's great stuff i wonder where he gets it he makes me want to hike until i find that place he's singing about billy's thoughts were interrupted by a sound in the wood to one side of him as he turned his eyes in the direction of the slight noise which had attracted him he saw two men step quietly out and cross toward the man at the campfire these two were evidently hobos doubtless pals of the poetic one the latter did not hear them until they were directly behind him then he turned slowly and rose as they halted beside his fire evening bo said one of the newcomers good evening gentlemen replied the camper welcome to my humble home have you dined no replied the first speaker we ain't but we're going to now can the chatter and duck there ain't enough for one here let alone three beat it said the man who was big and burly assuming a menacing attitude and took a truckling step near the solitary camper the latter was short and slender the larger man looked as though he might have eaten him in a single mouthful but the camper did not flinch you pain me he said you induce within me a severe and highly localized pain and furthermore i don't like your whiskers with which apparently irrelevant remark he seized the matted beard of the larger tramp and stuck the fellow a quick sharp blow in the face instantly the fellow's companion was upon him but the camper retained his death grip upon the beard of the now yelling bully and continued to rain blow after blow upon head and face billy byrne was an interested spectator he enjoyed a good fight as he enjoyed little else but presently when the first tramp succeeded in tangling his legs about the legs of his chastiser and dragging him to the ground and the second tramp seized a heavy stick and ran forward to dash the man's brains out billy thought it time to interfere stepping forward he called aloud as he came cut it out bows you can't pull off any rough stuff like that with this here sweet singer can it can it and the second tramp raised his stick to strike the now prostrate camper as he spoke billy byrne broke into a run and as the stick fell he reached the man's side and swung a blow to the tramp's jaw that sent the fellow spinning backwards to the river's brim where he tottered drunkenly for a moment and then plunged backwards into the shallow water then billy seized the other attacker by the shoulder and dragged him to his feet you want some too you big stiff he inquired the man spluttered and tried to break away striking at billy as he did so but a sudden punch such a punch as billy byrne had once handed the surprised harlem hurricane removed from the mind of the tramp the last vestige of any thought he might have harbored to do the newcomer bodily injury and with it removed all else from the man's mind temporarily as the fellow slumped unconscious to the ground the camper rose to his feet some wallop you have concealed in your sleeve my friend he said place it there and he extended a slender shapely hand billy took it and shook it it don't get under the ridge like those verses of yours though bo he returned it seems to have insinuated itself beneath the guy's thick skull replied the poetical one and it's a cinch my verses nor any other would ever get there the tramp who had plumbed the depths of the creek's foot of water and two feet of soft mud was crawling ashore what do you want now inquired billy byrne a piece of soap i'll get yous yet spluttered the moist one through his watery whiskers forget it admonished billy and hit the trail he pointed toward the railroad right of way and you too john l he added turning to the other victim of this artistic execution who was now sitting up hike bumbling and growling the two unwashed shuffled away and were presently lost to view along the vanishing track the solitary camper had returned to his culinary effort and unruffled and unconcerned apparently as though naught had occurred to disturb his peaceful solitude sit down he said after a moment looking up at billy and have a bite to eat with me take that leather easy chair the louis quatorze is too small and spindle-legged for comfort he waved his hand invitingly toward the sward beside the fire for a moment he was entirely absorbed in the roasting fowl impaled upon a sharp stick which he held in his right hand then he presently broke into verse around the world and back again we saw it all the mist and rain in england and the hollow plain from needles to Purdue. he kept a ramblin all the time i rustled grub he rustled rhyme blind baggage hoof it ride or climb we always put it through you're a good sort he broke off suddenly there ain't many bows that would have done as much for a fellow it was two against one replied billy and i don't like them odds 
Besides, I like your poetry. Where'd you get it? Make it up? Lord, no, laughed the other. If I could do that, I wouldn't be panhandling. A guy by the name of Henry Herbert Nibs did them. Great, ain't they? They sure is. They get me right where I live. And then, after a pause, sure you got enough for two, Bo? I have enough for you, old top, replied the host, even if I only had half as much as I have. Here, take first crack at the ambrosia. Sorry, I have but a single cup, but James has broken the others. James is very careless. Sometimes I almost feel that I have to let him go. Who's James? asked Billy. James? Oh, James is my man, replied the other. Billy looked up at his companion quizzically. Then he tasted the dark, thick concoction in a tin can. This is coffee, he announced. I thought you said it was Ambrose. I only wished to see if you would recognize it, my friend, replied the poetical one politely. I am highly complimented that you can guess what it is from its taste. For several minutes the two ate in silence, passing the tin can back and forth, and slicing, hacking would be more nearly correct, pieces of meat from the half-roasted fowl. It was Billy who broke the silence. I think, said he, that you've been stringing me, about James and Ambrose. The other laughed good-naturedly. You were not offended, I hope, said he. This is a sad old world, you know, and we're all looking for amusement. If a guy has no money to buy it with, he has to manufacture it. Sure, I ain't sore, Billy assured him. Say, spill that part again about Penelope with the kisses on her mouth, and you can kid me till the cows come home. The camper by the creek did as Billy asked him, while the latter sat with his eyes upon the fire, seeing in the sputtering little flames the oval face of her who was Penelope to him. When the first was completed, he reached forth his hand and took the tin can in his strong fingers, raising it before his face. Here's to... to his nibs, he said, and drank, passing the battered thing over to his new friend. Yes, said the other, here's to his nibs, and... Penelope. Drink hearty, returned Billy Byrne. The poetical one drew a sack of tobacco from his hip pocket and a rumpled package of papers from the pocket of his shirt, extending both towards Billy. Want the makings, he asked. I ain't stuck on sponging, said Billy, but maybe I can get even some day, and I sure do want a smoke. You see, I was frisked. I ain't got nothing. They didn't leave me a sou, Marquis. Billy reached across one end of the fire for the tobacco and cigarette papers. As he did so, the movement bared his wrist and as the firelight fell upon it, the marks of the steel bracelet showed vividly. In the fall from the train, the metal had bitten into his flesh. His companion's eyes happened to fall upon the tell-tale mark. There was an almost imperceptible raising of the man's eyebrows, but he said nothing to indicate that he had noticed anything out of the ordinary. The two smoked on for many minutes without indulging in conversation. The camper quoted snatches from Service and Kipling. Then he came back to Nibs, who was evidently his favorite. Billy listened and thought. Going anywhere in particular, he asked during a momentary lull in the recitation. Oh, south or west, replied the other. Nowhere in particular. Any place suits me, just so it isn't north or east. That's me, said Billy. Let's travel double, then, said the poetical one. My name's Bridge, and mine's Billy. Here, shake, and Byrne extended his hand. Until one of us gets wearied of the other's company, said Bridge. You're on, replied Billy. Let's turn in. Good, exclaimed Bridge. I wonder what's keeping James. He should have been here long since to turn down my bed and fix my bath. Billy grinned and rolled over on his side, his head uphill. Chapter 3 of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Five hundred dollars reward. We kept a ramblin' all the time. I rustled grub, he rustled rhyme, quoted Billy Byrne, sitting up and stretching himself. His companion roused and came to one elbow. The sun was topping the scant wood behind them, glinting on the surface of the little creek. A robin hopped around the sward quite close to them, and from the branch of a tree a hundred yards away came the sweet piping of a songbird. Farther off from the distance subdued noises of an awakening farm. The lowing of cows, the crowing of a rooster, the yelping of a happy dog just released from a night of captivity. Bridge yawned and stretched. Billy rose to his feet and shook himself. This is the life, said Bridge. Where are you going? To Russell Grubb, replied Billy. That's my part of the sketch. The other laughed. Go to it, he said. I hate it. That's the part that has come nearest making me turn respectable than any other. I hate to ask for a handout. Billy shrugged. He's done worse things than that in his life. 
and off he trudged, whistling. He felt happier than he had for many a day. He never had guessed that the country in the morning could be so beautiful. Behind him his companion collected the material for a fire, washed himself in the creek, and set the tin can, filled with water, at the edge of the kindling, and waited. There was nothing to cook, so it was useless to light a fire. As he sat there, thinking, his mind reverted to the red mark upon Billy's wrist, and he made a wry face. Billy approached the farmhouse from which the sounds of awakening still emanated. The farmer saw him coming, and ceased his activities upon the barnyard, leaned across the gate, and eyed him, none too hospitably. "'I want to get something to eat,' explained Billy. "'Got any money to pay for it with?' asked the farmer quickly. "'No,' said Billy. "'But me partner and me are hungry, and we got to eat.' The farmer extended a gnarled forefinger and pointed toward the rear of the house. Billy looked in the direction thus indicated and espied a woodpile. He grinned good-naturally. Without a word, he crossed the corded wood, picked up an axe which was stuck in the chopping block, and shedding his coat, went to work. The farmer resumed his chores. Half an hour later, he stopped on his way to breakfast and eyed the growing pile that lay beside Billy. "'You don't have to chop all the wood in the county to get a meal from Jed Watson,' he said. "'I want to get enough from you, partner, too,' explained Billy. "'Well, you've chopped enough for two meals, son,' replied the farmer, and turning toward the kitchen door, he called. "'Here, Ma, fix this boy up with something to eat. Enough for a couple meals for two of them. As Billy walked away toward his camp, his arms laden with milk, butter, eggs, a loaf of bread, and some cold meat, he grinned rather contently. "'A year or so ago,' he mused, "'I'd have stuck him up for this, and thought I was smart. Funny how a feller or change, and all for a skirt. A skirt that belongs to someone else now, too. Hell, what's the difference, anyhow? She'll be glad if she knew, and it makes me feel better to act like she won. That old farmer guy now, who'd ever taken him for having a heart at all? When I seen him at first, I thought he'd like to sick the dog on me. And there he comes along and tells Ma to pass me a handout like this. Gee, it's a funny world. She used to say that most everybody was decent if you went at em right, and I guess she knew. She knew most everything, anyway. Lord, I wish you'd been born on Grand Avenue, or I on Riverside Drive. As Billy walked up to his waiting companion, who had touched a match to the firewood as he sighted the numerous packages in the forger's arms, he was repeating, over and over, as though the words held him in thrall of fascination, there ain't no sweet Penelope somewhere that's long and much for me. Bridge eyed the packages as Billy deposited them, carefully, and one at a time, upon the grass, beside the fire. The milk was in a clean, little, granite-ware pail, the eggs had been placed in the paper bag, while the other articles were wrapped in pieces of newspaper. As the opening of each revealed its contents, fresh, clean, and inviting, Bridge closed one eye and cocked his other up at Billy. "'Did he die hard?' he inquired. "'Did who die hard?' demanded the other. "'Why, the dog, of course.' "'He ain't dead as I know of,' replied Billy. "'You don't mean to say, my friend, they let you get away with all this without sicking the dog on you?' said Bridge. Billy laughed and explained, and the other was relieved. The red mark around Billy's wrist persisted in remaining uppermost in Bridge's mind. When they had eaten, they had laid back upon the grass and smoked some more of Bridge's tobacco. Well, inquired Bridge, what's doing now? Let's be hiking, said Billy. Bridge rose and stretched. My feet are tired and need a change. Come on, it's up to you, he quoted. Billy gathered together the food that they had not eaten and made two equal-sized packages of it. He handed one to Bridge. We'll divide the pack, he explained, and here, drink the rest of the milk. I want the pail. What are you going to do with the pail? asked Bridge. Return it. Ma just loaned it to me. Bridge elevated his eyebrows a trifle. He had been mistaken after all. At the farmhouse, the farmer's wife greeted them kindly, thanked Billy for returning her pail, which, if the truth were known, she had not expected to see again, and gave them each a handful of thick, light, golden-brown cookies, the tops of which were encrusted with sugar. As they walked away, Bridge sighed. "'Nothing on earth for a good woman,' he said. "'Ma or Penelope?' asked Billy. "'Either or both,' replied Bridge. "'I have no Penelope, but I did have a mighty fine ma.' Billy made no reply. He was thinking of the slovenly, blear-eyed woman who had brought him into the world. The memory was far from pleasant. He tried to shake it off. "'Bridge,' he said, quite suddenly, and apropos of nothing, in an effort to change the subject. "'That's an odd name. I've heard of Bridges and Bridger.' I've never heard of Bridge before. Just a name a fellow gave me once up on the Yukon, explained Bridge. I used to use a few words he never heard of, so he called me the unabridged, which was too long. The fellow shortened it to Bridge, and it stuck. It is always stuck, and now I haven't any other. 
I even think of myself now as Bridge. Funny, ain't it? Yes, agreed Billy, and that was the end of it. He never thought of asking his companion's true name any more than Bridge would have questioned him on his, or of his past. The ethics of the roadside fire and the empty tomato tin did not countenance such impertinences. For several days the two continued their leisurely way towards Kansas City. Once they rode a few miles on a freight train, but for the most part they were content to plod joyously along the dusty highways. Billy continued to rustle grub, while Bridge relieved the monotony by an occasional burst of poetry. "'You know so much of that stuff,' said Billy, as they were smoking by their campfire one evening, "'that I think you'd be able to make some up yourself.' "'I've tried,' admitted Bridge, "'but there always seems to be something lacking in my stuff. "'It don't get under the belt. "'The divine afflatus is not there. "'I may start out all right, "'but I always end up where I didn't expect to go "'and where nobody wants to be.' "'Member any of it?' asked Billy. "'There was one I wrote about a lake where I camped once,' "'said Bridge reminiscently, "'but I can only recall one stanza.' let's have it urged billy i bet it has nibs hanging to the ropes bridge cleared his throat and recited silver are the ripples solemn are the dunes happy are the fishes for they are full of prunes he looked up at billy a smile twitching at the corner of his mouth how's that he asked billy scratched his head it's all right but the last line said billy candidly there's something wrong with the last line yes agreed bridge there is I guess Nibs is safe for another round, at least, said Billy. Bridge was eyeing his companion, noting the broad shoulders, the deep chest, the muddy forearm and biceps which the other's light cotton shirt could not conceal. It is none of my business, he said presently, but from your general appearance, from bits of idiom you occasionally drop, and from the way you handled those two bows the night we met, I should rather surmise that at some time or other you have been less than a thousand miles from a W.K. roped arena. I've seen a prize fight once, admitted Billy. It was the day before they were due to arrive in Kansas City that Billy earned a handout from a restaurant keeper in a small town by doing some odd jobs for the man. The food he gave Billy was wrapped in an old copy of the Kansas City Star. When Billy reached camp, he tossed the package to Bridge, who, in addition to his honorable post as poet laureate, was also cook. Then Billy walked down to the stream nearby that he might wash away the grime and sweat of honest toil from his hands and face. As Bridge unwrapped the package and the paper unfolded beneath his eyes, an article caught his attention, just casually at first, but presently to the exclusion of all else. As he read, his eyebrows alternated between a position of considerable elevation to that of a deep frown. Occasionally he nodded knowingly. Finally he glanced up at Billy, who was just rising from his ablutions. Hastily, Bridge tore from the paper the article that attracted his interest, folded it, and stuffed it into one of his pockets. He had not had time to finish the reading, and he wanted to save the article for a later opportunity for careful perusal. That evening, Bridge sat for a long time scrutinizing Billy through half-closed lids, and often he found his eyes wandering to the red ring about the other's wrist, but whatever may have been within his thoughts, he kept to himself. It was noon when the two sauntered into Kansas City. Billy had a dollar in his pocket, a whole dollar. He had earned it assisting an automobilist out of a ditch. We'll have a swell feed, he had confided to Bridge and sleep in the bed just to learn how much nicer it is sleeping out under the black sky and the shiny little stars you're a profligate billy said bridge i don't know what that means said billy but if it's something i shouldn't be i probably am the two went to a rooming house of which bridge knew where they can get a clean room with a double bed for fifty cents it was rather a high price to pay of course but bridge was more or less fastidious and he admitted to billy that he'd rather sleep in the clean dirt of a roadside than in the breed of dirt one finds in an unclean bed at the end of the hall was a washroom, and toward this Bridge made his way, after removing his coat and throwing it across the foot of the bed. After he had left the room, Billy chanced to notice a folded bit of newspaper on the floor beneath Bridge's coat. He picked it up to lay it on the table which answered the purpose of a dresser, when a single word caught his attention. It was the name Schneider. Billy unfolded the clipping, and as his eyes took in the heading, a strange expression entered them. A hard, cold gleam such as not touched them since the day he had abandoned the deputy sheriff in the woods midway between Chicago and Joliet. This is what Billy read. Billy Byrne, sentenced to life imprisonment in Joliet Penitentiary for the murder of Schneider, the old West Side saloon keeper, hurled himself from the train that was bearing him to Joliet yesterday, dragging with him the deputy sheriff to whom he was handcuffed. The deputy was found a few hours later bound and gagged, lying in the woods along the Santa Fe, not far from Lamont. He was uninjured. He said that Byrne got a good start and doubtless took advantage of it to return to Chicago, where a man of his stamp could find more numerous and safer retreats than elsewhere. There was much more, 
a detailed account of the crime for the commission of which billy had been sentenced a full and complete description of billy a record of his long years of transgression and at last the mention of a five hundred dollar reward that the authorities had offered for information that would lead to his arrest when billy had concluded the reading he refolded the paper and placed it in a pocket of a coat hanging upon the foot of the bed a moment later bridge entered the room billy caught himself looking often at his companion and always there came to his mind the termination of the article he had found in bridge's pocket the mention of the five hundred dollar reward five hundred dollars thought billy is a lot of coin i just wonder now and he let his eyes wander to his companion as though he might read upon his face the purpose which lay in the man's heart he don't look it but five hundred dollars is a lot of coin for a bow and what nell did he have that article hid on his clothes fur that's what i'd like to know i guess it's up to me to blow all the recently acquired content which had been billy's since he had come upon the poetic bridge and the two had made their carefree leisurely way along shaded country roadsides or paused beside cool brooklets that meandered lazily through sweet-smelling meadows, was dissipated in the instant that he had realized the nature of the article his companion had been carrying and hiding from him. For days no thought of pursuit or capture had arisen to perplex him. He had seen such a tiny thing out there amidst the vastness of rolling hills, of woods, and plain that there had been induced within him an unconscious assurance that no one could find him even though they might seek for him. The idea of meeting a plain clothes man from detective headquarters around the next bend of the peaceful Missouri road was so preposterous and incongruous that Billy had found it impossible to give the matter serious thought. He never before had been in the country districts of this native land. To him the United States was all like Chicago, or New York, or Milwaukee, the three cities with which he was most familiar. His experience of unurban localities had been gained amidst the primeval jungles of faraway Yoka. There had been no detective sergeants there unquestionably there could be none here detective sergeants were indigenous to the soil that grew corner saloons and pool rooms and to none others as well expected to discover one of oda yorimoto samurai hiding behind a fire plug on michigan boulevard as to look for one of those along a farm bordered road but here in kansas city amidst the noises and odors that meant a large city it was different here the next man he met might be looking for him or if not then the very first policeman they encountered could arrest him upon a word from bridge and bridge would get five hundred dollars just then bridge burst forth into poetry in a flannel shirt from earth's clean dirt here pal is my calloused hand oh i love each day as a rover may nor seek to understand to enjoy is good enough for me the gypsy of a god i am but here is a hail to say he interrupted himself what's the matter with going out now and wrapping ourselves around that swell feed you were speaking of billy rose it didn't seem possible that bridge could be doing the double cross to him in a flannel shirt from earth's clean dirt here pals my calloused hand billy repeated the lines half aloud they renewed his confidence in bridge somehow like them asked the latter yes said billy some more of nibs no service come on let's go and dine how about the midland and he grinned at his little joke and he led the way toward the street it was late afternoon the sun had already set but it was still too light for lamps bridge led the way toward a certain eating place of which he knew where a man might dine well and from a clean platter for two bits billy had been keeping his eyes open for detectives they had passed no uniform police that would be the crucial test thought he unless bridge intended tipping off headquarters on the quiet and having the pinch made at night after billy had gone to bed as they reached the little restaurant which was in the basement bridge motioned billy down ahead of him just for an instant he himself paused at the head of the stairs and looked about as he did so a man stepped from the shadow of a doorway upon the opposite side of the Chapter Four of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. On the trail. As they entered the place, Billy, who was ahead, sought a table. But as he was about to hang up his cap and seat himself, Bridge touched his elbow. "Let's go to the washroom and clean up a bit," he said in a voice that might be heard by those nearest. "Why, we just washed before we left our room," expostulated Billy. "'Shut up and follow me,' Bridge whispered into his ear. Immediately Billy was all suspicion. 
His hand flew to the pocket in which the gun of the deputy sheriff still rested. They would never take him alive, of that Billy was positive. He wouldn't go back to life imprisonment, not after he had tasted the sweet freedom of wide spaces, such a freedom as the trammeled city cannot offer. Bridge saw the movement. Cut it, he whispered, and follow me, as I tell you. I just saw a Chicago dick across the street. He might not have seen you, but it looked almighty like it. He'll be down here in about two seconds. Come on, we'll beat it through the rear, and know the way. Billy Byrne heaved a great sigh of relief. Suddenly he was almost reconciled to the thought of capture, for in the instant he had realized that it had not been so much his freedom that he had dreaded to lose as his faith in the companion in whom he had believed. Without sign of haste, the two walked the length of the room and disappeared through the doorway leading into the washroom. Before them was a window opening upon a squalid backyard. The building stood upon a hillside, so that while the entrance to the eating place was below the level of the street in front, its rear was flush with the ground. Bridge motioned Billy to climb through the window while he shot the bolt upon the inside of the door leading back into the restaurant. A moment later he followed the fugitive, then took the lead. Down narrow, dirty alleys and through litter-piled back yards he made his way, while Billy followed at his heels. Dusk was gathering, and before they had gone far, darkness came. They neither paused nor spoke until they had left the business portion of the city behind and were well out of the zone of bright lights. Bridge was the first to break the silence. I suppose you wonder how I knew, he said. No, replied Billy. I seen that clipping you got in your pocket. It fell out of the floor when you took your coat off in the room this afternoon to go and wash. Oh, said Bridge, I see. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's the end of it. You won't mention it again, old man. I don't need to tell you that I'm for you. No, not after tonight, Billy assured him. They went on again for some time without speaking. Then Billy said, I got two things to tell you. The first is that after I seen that newspaper article in your clothes, I thought you was figuring on double-crossing me and claiming the five one. I ought to have known better. The other is that I didn't kill Schneider. I wasn't near his place that night, and that's straight. I'm glad you told me both, said Bridge. I think we'll understand each other better after this. We're each running away from something. We'll run together, eh? And he extended his hand. In flannel shirt from earth's clean dirt, here, pal, is my calloused hand, he quoted, laughing. Billy took the other's hand. He noticed that Bridge hadn't said what he was running away from. Billy wondered, but asked no questions. South they went after they had left the city behind, out into the sweet and silent darkness of the country. During the night they crossed the line into Kansas, and morning found them in a beautiful, hilly country to which all thoughts of cities, crime, and police seemed so utterly foreign that Billy could scarce believe that only a few hours before a Chicago detective had been less than a hundred feet from him. The new sun burst upon them as they topped the grassy hill. The dew-bespangled blades scintillated beneath the gorgeous rays, which would presently sweep them again into the nothingness from which they had sprung. Bridge halted and stretched himself. He threw his head back and let the warm sun beat down upon his bronzed face. There's sunshine in the heart of me. My blood sings in the breeze. The mountains are all a part of me. I'm fellow to the trees. My golden youth I'm squandering. Sun libertine am I. A wandering, a wandering, until the day I die. And then he stood for minutes, drinking in deep breaths of pure, sweet air of the new day. Beside him, a head taller, savagely strong, stood Billy Byrne, his broad shoulders squared, his great chest expanding as he inhaled. It's great, ain't it? he said, at last. I never knew the country was like this, and I don't know that I ever would have known if it hadn't been for those poet guys you're always spouting. I always had an idea they was sissy fellows, he went on, but a guy can't be a sissy and think the thoughts they must have thought to write stuff that sends the blood chasing through a feller like he'd had a drink on an empty stomach. I used to think everyone was a sissy who wasn't a tough guy. I was a tough guy all right, and I was mighty proud of it. I ain't any more, and haven't been for a long time. But before I took a tumble to myself, I'd have hated you, Bridge. I'd have hated your fine talk, and your poetry, and the thing about you that makes you hate to touch a guy for a handout. I'd have hated myself if I'd thought that I could ever talk mushy like I am now. Gee, Bridge, but I was a limit. A girl, a nice girl called me a mucker once, and a coward. I was both, but I had the reputation of being the toughest guy on the west side, and I thought I was a man. I nearly poked her face for it. Think of it, Bridge, I nearly did, but something stopped me. Something held my hand from it, and lately I have liked to think that maybe what stopped me was something in me that had always been there. 
something decent that was really a part of me. I hate to think that I was such a beast at heart as I acted like all my life up to that minute. I began to change then. It was mighty slow, and I'm still a roughneck, but I'm getting on. She helped me most, of course, and now you're helping me a lot, too. You and your poetry stuff. If some dick don't get me, I may be a human being before I die. Bridge laughed. It is odd, he said, how our viewpoints change with change in environment and the passing of the years. Time was, Billy, when I'd have hated you as much as you would have hated me. I don't know that I should have said hate, for that is not exactly the word. It was more contempt that I feel for men whom I consider as not belonging upon the intellectual or social plane to which I considered I was born. I thought of people who moved outside my limited sphere as the great unwashed. I pitied them, and I honestly believe now that in the bottom of my heart I consider them of a different clay than I, and with souls, if they possess such things, about on par with the souls of sheep and cows. I couldn't have seen the man in you, Billy, then, any more than you could have seen the man in me. I have learned much since then. Although I still stick to a part of my original articles of faith, I do believe that all men are not equal, and I know that there are a great many more with whom I would not pal than there are those with whom I would. Because one man speaks better English than another, or has read more and remembers it, only makes him a better man in that particular respect. I think none the less for you because you can't quote Browning or Shakespeare. The thing that counts is that you can appreciate, as I do, service and Kipling and Nibs. Now maybe we are both wrong. Maybe Nibs and Kipling and service didn't write poetry, and some people will say as much. But whatever it is, it gets you and me in the same way. And so in this respect, we are equals. Which being the case, let's see if we can't rustle some grub, and then find the nice soft spot whereupon to pound our respective ears. Billy, deciding that he was too sleepy to work for food, invested half of the capital that was to have furnished the swell feed the night before in what two bits would purchase from a generous housewife on a nearby farm, and then stretching themselves beneath the shade of a tree sufficiently far from the road that they might not attract unnecessary observation, they slept until noon. But their precaution failed to serve their purpose entirely. A little before noon, two filthy, bearded knights of the road clambered laboriously over the fence and headed directly for the very tree under which Billy and Bridge lay sleeping. In the minds of the two was the same thought that had induced Billy Byrne and the Portic Bridge to seek the same secluded spot. There was, in the stiff shuffle of the men, something rather familiar. We have seen them before, just for a few minutes it is true, but under circumstances that impressed some of their characteristics upon us. The very last we saw of them they were shuffling away in the darkness along a railroad track, after promising that eventually they would wreak dire vengeance upon Billy who had just trounced them. Now as they came unexpectedly upon the two sleepers, they did not immediately recognize in them the objects of their recent hate. They just stood looking stupidly down on them, wondering in what way they might turn their discovery to their own advantage. Nothing in the raiment either of Billy or Bridge indicated that here was any particularly rich field for loot, and, too, the athletic figure of Byrne would rather have discouraged any attempt to roll him without first handing him the K.O., as the two would have naively put it. But as they gazed down upon the features of the sleepers, the eyes of one of the tramps narrowed to two ugly slits, while those of his companion went wide in incredulity and surprise. "'Do you use no dem guys?' asked the first, and without waiting for a reply, he went on, "'Dem's the guys that beat us up back there, the other side of K.C. Do you get em? Sure?' asked the other. "'Sure, I know dem in a thousand. Let's hand em a couple and beat it.' And he stooped to pick up a large stone that lay near at hand. "'Cut it,' whispered the second tramp. You don't know them guys at all. They may be the guys that beats us up, but that big stiff there is more than that. He's wanted and shy, and there's half a thou on him. Who put you Jerry to all that? inquired the first tramp, skeptically. I was in distill with him. He croaked some guy. He's a lifer. On the way to the pen, he pushes his dick off from the rattler and makes his getaway. That Peter boy we meets at Quincy slips me an earful about him. Here's where we draws down to five hundred if we're cagey. What do you mean, Cagey? Why, we leaves him alone and goes to the next farm and calls up K.C. and tips off the dicks, see? You don't think we'll get any of that five hundred, do you, with dicks on it? The other scratched his head. No, he said, rather dubiously, after a moment's deep thought. They don't nobody get nothing that the dicks see first. But we'll get even with these blokes, anyway. Maybe they's pass up a couple bucks, said the other, hopefully. They's ought to do that much. Detective Sergeant Flanagan of Headquarters, Chicago, slouched in a chair in the private office of the Chief of Detectives of Kansas City, Missouri. 
Sergeant Flanagan was sore. He would have said as much himself. He had been sent west to identify a suspect whom the Kansas City authorities had arrested, but he had been unable to do so, and had been preparing to return to his home city when the brilliant aureola of an unusual piece of excellent fortune had shone upon him for a moment, and then faded away through the grimy entrance of the basement eating place. He had been walking along the street the previous evening thinking of nothing in particular, but with eyes and ears alert as becomes a successful police officer, when he had espied two men approaching upon the opposite sidewalk. There was something familiar in the swing of the giant frame of one of the men. So true to the years of training, Sergeant Flanagan melted into the shadows of a store entrance and waited until the two should have come closer. They were directly opposite him when the truth flashed upon him. The big fellow was Billy Byrne, and there was a five hundred dollar reward out for him. Then the two turned and disappeared down the stairwell that led to the underground restaurant. Sergeant Flanagan saw Byrne's companion turn and look back, just as Flanagan stepped from the doorway to cross the street after them. That was the last Sergeant Flanagan had seen either of Billy Byrne or his companion. The trail had ceased at the open window of the washroom at the rear of the restaurant, and search as he would, he had been unable to pick it up again. No one in Kansas City had seen two men that night answering the descriptions Flanagan had been able to give, at least no one whom Flanagan could unearth. Finally, he had been forced to take the Kansas City chief into his confidence, and already a dozen men were scouring such sections of Kansas City in which it seemed most likely an escaped murderer would choose to hide. Flanagan had been out himself for a while, but now he was to learn what progress, if any, had been made. He had just learned that three suspects had been arrested and was waiting to have them paraded before him. When the door swung in and the three were escorted into his presence, Sergeant Flanagan gave a snort of disgust, indicative probably not only of despair, but in a manner registering his private opinion of the mental horsepower and efficiency of the Kansas City sleuths. For of the three, one was a pasty-faced, chestless youth, even then under the influence of cocaine, another was an old bowskin hobo, while the third was unquestionably a Chinaman. Even professional courtesy could scarce restrain Sergeant Flanagan's desire toward bitter sarcasm and he was upon the point of launching forth into a vitriolic arraignment of everything west of Chicago, up to and including, specifically, the Kansas City Detective Bureau, when the telephone bell at the chief's desk interrupted him. He had wanted the chief to hear just what he thought, so he waited. The chief listened for a few minutes, asked several questions, and then, placing a fat hand over the transmitter, he wheeled about towards Flanagan. Well, he said, I guess I got something for you at last. There's a bow in the wire that says he's seen your man now near Shawnee. He wants to know if you'll split the reward with him. Flanagan yawned and stretched. I suppose, he said ironically, that if I go down there, I'll find he's corralled a nigger, and he looked sorrowfully at the three specimens before him. I don't know, said the chief. This guy says he knows Byrne well, and that he's got it in for him. Shall I tell him you'll be down and split the reward? Tell him I'll be down, and I'll treat him right, replied Flanagan, and after the chief had transmitted the message and hung up the receiver. Where is this here Shawnee, anyway? I'll send a couple of men along with you. It isn't far across the line, and there won't be no trouble in getting back without nobody knowing anything about it, if you get him. All right, said Flanagan. His visions of five hundred already dwindled to a possible one. It was a little past one o'clock that a touring car rolled south out of Kansas. Chapter Five of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. One turn deserves another. When the two tramps approached the farmhouse at which Billy had purchased food a few hours before, the farmer's wife called the dog that was asleep in the summer kitchen and took a shotgun down from its hook beside the door. From long expertise, the lady was a reader of character, of hobo character at least and she saw nothing in the appearance of either of these two that inspired even a modicum of confidence. Now the young fellow who had been there earlier in the day, and who, wonder of wonders, had actually paid for the food that she gave him, had been of a different stamp. His clothing had proclaimed him a tramp, but, thanks to the razor Bridge had always carried, he was cleanly shaven. His year of total abstinence had given him clear eyes and a healthy skin. There was a freshness and vigor in his appearance and carriage that inspired confidence rather than suspicion. She had not mistrusted him, but these others she did mistrust. When they asked to use the telephone, she refused and ordered them away, thinking it but an excuse to enter the house. But they argued the matter, explained that they had discovered an escaped murderer hiding nearby, in fact, in her own meadow, and that they wished only to call up the Kansas City police. 
Finally she yielded, but kept the dog by her side and the shotgun in her hand, while the two entered the room and crossed to the telephone upon the opposite side. From the conversation which she overheard, the woman concluded that, after all, she had been mistaken, not only about these two, but about the young man who had come earlier in the day and purchased food from her, for the description the tramp gave of the fugitive tallied exactly with that of the young man. It seemed incredible that so honest-looking a man could be a murderer. The good woman was shocked and not a little unstrung by the thought that she had been in the house alone when he had come, and if he had wished to, he could have easily have murdered her. I hope they get him, she said, when the tramp had concluded his talk with Kansas City. It's awful the carryings on they is nowadays. Why, a body can't never tell who to trust, and I thought him such a nice young man, and he paid me for what he got, too. The dog, bored by the inaction, had wandered back into the summer kitchen and resumed his broken slumber. One of the tramps was leaning against the wall, talking with the final woman. The other was busily engaged in scratching his right shin with what remained of the heel of his left shoe. He supported himself with one hand on the small table, upon the top of which was a family Bible. Quite unexpectedly, he lost his balance. The table tipped, and he was thrown still further over toward it, and all in the flash of an eye, tramp, table, and family Bible crashed to the floor. With a little cry of alarm, the woman rushed forward to gather up the holy book in her haste forgetting the shotgun and leaving it behind her leaning against the arm of a chair. Almost simultaneously the two tramps saw the real cause of her perturbation. The large book had fallen upon its back, open, and as several little leaves turned over, before coming to rest their eyes went wild at what was revealed between. United States currency and denominations of five, ten, and twenty-dollar bills lay snugly inserted between the leaves of the Bible. The tramp who lay on the floor, as yet too surprised to attempt to rise, rolled over and seized the book as a football player seizes the pigskin after a fumble, covering it with his body, his arms, and sticking out his elbows as a further protection to the invaluable thing. At the first cry of the woman, the dog rose, growling, and bounded into the room. The tramp leaning against the wall saw the brute coming, a mongrel hound dog, bristling and savage. The shotgun stood almost within the man's reach, a step and it was in his hands. As though sensing the fellow's intentions, the dog wheeled from the tramp upon the floor, toward whom he had leaped, and sprang for the other ragged scoundrel. The muzzle of the gun met him halfway. There was a deafening roar. The dog collapsed on the floor, his chest torn out. Now the woman began to scream for help, but in an instant both tramps were upon her, choking her to silence. One of them ran to the summer kitchen, returned a moment later with a piece of clothesline, while the other sat astride the victim. His fingers closed about her throat. Once he released his hold, she screamed again. Presently she was secured and gagged, then the two commenced to rifle the Bible. Eleven hundred dollars in bills were hidden there, because the woman and her husband didn't believe in banks, the savings of a lifetime. In agony, as she regained consciousness, she saw the last of their little hoard transferred to the pockets of the tramps, and when they had finished, they demanded to know where she kept the rest, loosening her gag that she might reply. She told them that was all the money she had in the world, and begged them not to take it. "'Yous have got more coin than this,' growled one of the men, "'and yous had better pass it over.' or we'll find a way to make use. But still, she insisted that was all. The tramp stepped into the kitchen. A wood fire was burning in the stove. A pair of pliers lay upon the window sill. With these, he lifted one of the hot stove-hole covers and returned to the parlor, grinning. I guess she'll remember she's got more when this begins to woik, he said. Take off her shoes, Dick. The other growled an objection. You poor boob, he said. Dick's will be here in a little while. We'd better be making our getaway with what we got. Gee, exclaimed the companion, I clean forgot all about the dicks, and then after a moment's silence during which his evil face underwent various changes of expression, from fear to final relief, he turned an ugly crooked grimace upon his companion. We got a croaker, he said. They ain't no other way. If they finds her alive, she'll blab sure, and they won't be no trouble about getting us or identifying us neither. The other shrugged. Let's beat it, he whined. We can't more do time for this job if we stop now, but the other'll mean and he made a suggestive circle with a grimy finger close to his neck. "'No, nah, I won't not not the kind,' urged his companion. "'I got it all doped out. We got lots of time before the dicks are due. We'll croak the skirt, and then we'll beat it up to the road, and meet them dicks, see?' The other was aghast. "'When did you go nuts?' he asked. "'I ain't got nuts. Wait till I get true. We meet the dicks, innocent-like, but first we catches the doe in the woods. We tells him we hurry right on to lead them to this burn guy, and then when we gets back here to the farmhouse and finds what's happened here, we'll be as flabbergasted as they be. Oh, nuts, exclaimed the other disgustedly. Yous don't think yous can put that over on any wise guy from shy, do yous? 
Who would they think croaked the old woman and the key eye? Would they think they'd killed themselves? They'll think Byrne and his partner croaked them, you simp, replied Crumb. Dick scratched his head as the possibilities of the scheme filled into his dull brain. A broad grin bared his yellow teeth. You dare, pal, he exclaimed, real admiration in his voice. Well, who's going to do it? I'll do it, said Crumb. There ain't no chance of getting in bad for it, so I'd just as soon do the job. Get me a knife or an axe from the kitchen. The gap makes too much noise. Something awoke Billy Byrne with a start. Faintly, in the back of his consciousness, the dim suggestion of a loud noise still reverberated. He sat up and looked about him. I wonder what that was, he mused. It sounded like the report of a gun. Bridge awoke about the same time and turned lazily over, raising himself upon an elbow. He grinned at Billy. Good morning, he said, and then, says I, then let's be on the float. You certainly have got my goat. You make me hungry in my throat for seeing things as new. Out there someone will ride the range of looking for the new and strange. My feet are tired and need a change. Come on, it's up to you. Come on, then, agreed Billy, come to his feet. As he rose, there came, faintly, but distinct, the unmistakable scream of a frightened woman. From the direction of the farmhouse it came, from the farmhouse at which Billy had purchased their breakfast. Without waiting for a repetition of the cry, Billy wheeled and broke into a rapid run in the direction of the little cluster of buildings. Bridge leapt to his feet and followed behind him, dropping behind, though, for he had not had the road work that Billy had recently had been training through, in his training for the battle in which he had defeated the White Hope, that time in New York when Professor Cassidy had wagered his entire pile upon him, nor in vain. Dink searched about the summer kitchen for an axe or hatchet, but failing to find either, rummaged through a table drawer until he came upon a large carving knife. This would do the job nicely. He thumbed the edge as he carried it back into the parlor to crumb. The poor woman, lying upon the floor, was quite conscious. Her eyes were wide and rolling in horror. She struggled with her bonds and tried to force the gag from her mouth with her tongue, but her every effort was useless. She had heard every word that had passed between the two men. She knew that they would carry out the plan that they had formulated, that there was no chance that they would be interrupted in their gruesome work, for her husband had driven over to a farm beyond holiday, leaving before sunrise, and there was little prospect that he would return before milking time in the evening. The detectives from Kansas City could not possibly reach the farm until far too late to save her. She saw Dink return from the summer kitchen with a long knife. She recalled the day that she had bought that knife in town, and the various uses to which she had put it. That very morning she had sliced some bacon with it. How distinctly such things recurred to her at that frightful moment, and now the hideous creature standing beside her was going to use it to cut her throat. She saw Crum had taken the knife and feel the blade, running his thumb along it. She saw him stoop, his eyes turned upon hers. He grasped her chin and forced it upwards and back, better to expose her throat. Oh, why could she not faint? Why must she suffer all those hideous preliminaries? Why could she not even close her eyes? Crumb raised the knife and held the blade close above her bared neck. A shudder ran through her, and then the door crashed open and a man sprang into the room. It was Billy Byrne. Through the window he had seen what had passed in the interior. His hand fell upon Crumb's collar and jerked him backward from his prey. Dink seized the shotgun and turned it upon the intruder but he was too close. Billy grasped the barrel of the weapon and threw the muzzle up toward the ceiling as the tramp pulled the trigger. Then he wrenched it from the man's hand, swung it once above his head, and crashed a stock down upon Dink's skull. Dink went down and out for the count, for several counts, in fact. Crumb stumbled to his feet and made a break for the door. In the doorway he ran full into bridge, winded but ready. The latter, realizing that the matted one was attempting to escape, seized a handful of his tangled beard and, as he had done upon another occasion, held the tramp's head in rigid position while he planted a series of blows in the fellow's face, blows that left Crumb as completely out of battle as his mildewed comrade. Watch him, says Billy, handing Bridge the shotgun, then he turned his attention to the woman. With the carving knife that was to have ended her life, he cut her bonds. Removing the gag from her mouth, he lifted her in his strong arms and carried her to the little horsehair sofa that stood in one corner of the parlor, laying her upon it very gently. He was thinking of Ma Watson. This woman resembled her just a little, particularly in her comfortable, motherly expansiveness, and she had had a kind word of a cheery good-bye for him that morning, as he departed. The woman lay upon the sofa, breathing hard and moaning just a little. The shock had been almost too much even for her solid nerves. Presently she turned her eyes towards Billy. "'You're a good boy,' she said, "'and you come just in the nick of time. They got all my money. It's in their clothes.' and then a look of terror overspread her face. For the moment she had forgotten that she had heard about this man, that he was an escaped convict, a convicted murderer. Was she any better off now that she had let him know about the money than she was with the others after they discovered it? 
At her words, Bridge kneeled and searched the two tramps. He counted the bills as he removed them from their pockets. Eleven hundred, he asked, and handed the money to Billy. Eleven hundred, yes, breathed the woman, faintly, her eyes horror-filled and fearful as she gazed upon Billy's face. She didn't care for the money any more. They could have it all if they would only let her live. Billy turned toward her and held the rumpled green mass out. Here, he said, but that's an awful lot of coin for a woman to have around the house, and her all alone. You ought not have done it. She took the money in trembling figures. It seemed incredible that a man was returning it to her. But I knew it, she said finally. Knew what? I knew you was a good boy. They said you was a murderer. Billy's brows contracted, and an expression of pain crossed his face. How did they come to that? he asked. I heard them telephone to Kansas City through the police, she replied, and then she sat bolt upright. The detectives are on their way here now, she almost screamed, and even if you are a murderer, I don't care. I won't stand by and see them get you after what you've done for me. I don't believe you're a murderer anyhow. You're a good boy. My boy would be about as old and as big as you are now, if he lives. He ran away a long time ago. Maybe you've met him. His name's Eddie. Eddie Shorter. I ain't heard from him for years. No, she went on. I don't believe what they said. You got too good a face. But if you are a murderer, you get out now before they come, and I'll send them on a wild goose chase in the wrong direction. But these, said Billy, we can't leave these here. Tie them up and give me the shotgun, she said. I'll bet they don't come any more funny business on me. She had regained both her composure and her nerve by this time. Together, Billy and Bridge trussed up the two tramps, and Elfin couldn't have forced the bonds they placed upon them. Then they carried them down cellar, and when they had come up again, Mrs. Shorter barred the cellar door. I reckon they won't get out of there very fast, she said, and now you two boys run along. Got any money? And without waiting for a reply, she counted twenty-five dollars from the roll she had tucked in the front of her waist and handed them to Billy. Nothing doing, said he, but thanks just the same. You gotta take it, she insisted. Let me make believe I'm giving it to my boy, Eddie. Please. And the tears that came to her eyes proved far more effective than her generous words. Oh, all right, said Billy. I'll take it and pass it along to Eddie if I ever meet him, eh? Now please hurry, she urged. I don't want you to be caught. Even if you are a murderer, I wish you weren't, though. I'm not, said Billy. But the law says that I am. What the law says goes. He turned toward the doorway with Bridge, calling a goodbye to the woman. But as he stepped out upon the veranda, the dust of a fast-moving automobile appeared about a bend in the road a half mile from the house. Too late, he said, turning to Bridge. Here they come. The woman brushed by them and peered up the road. Yes, she said. It must be them. Lordy, what'll we do? I'll duck out the back way. That's what I'll do, said Billy. It wouldn't do for a mighty good, said Mrs. Shorter, with a shake of her head. They'll telephone every farmer within twenty miles of here in every direction, and they'll get you sure. Wait, I got a scheme. Come with me. And she turned and busted through the little parlor, out of a doorway into something that was a half-hall, half-storeroom. There was a flight of stairs leading to the upper story, and she waddled up them as fast as her legs could carry her, motioning the two men to follow her. In a rear room was a trap door to the ceiling. Drag that commode under this, she told them, then climb into the attic and close the trap door. They won't never find you there. Billy pulled the ancient article of furniture beneath the opening, and in another moment the two men were in the stuffy atmosphere of the unventilated loft. Beneath them they heard Mrs. Shorter dragging the commode back to its custom place, and then the sound of her footsteps descending the stair. Presently there came to them the rattling of a motor without, followed by the voice of men in the house. For an hour, half asphyxiated by the closeness of the attic, they waited, and then again they heard the sound of the running engine, diminishing as the machine drew away. Shortly after, Mrs. Shorter's voice rose to them from below. You can come down now, she said. They've gone. When they had descended, she led them to the kitchen. I got a bite to eat ready for you while they was here, she explained. When you've done, you can hide in the barn till dark, and after that I'll have my old man take you across the Dotson. That's a junction, and you ought to be able to get away easy enough from there. I told them you started for Olathe. That's where they've gone with the two tramps. My, but I did have a time of it. I ain't much good at storytelling, but I reckon I told more stories this afternoon than I ever told before in my life. I told them they was the two of you, and that the biggest one had red hair, and the little one was pockmarked. Then they said you probably wasn't the man at all, and my, how they did swear at them two tramps for getting them way out here on a wild goose chase. But they're going to look for you just the same in Olathe, only they won't find you there and she laughed a bit nervously, though. It was dusk when Mr. Shorter returned from holiday, but after he heard his wife's story, he said that he'd drive them two boys all the way to Mexico if there wasn't any better plan. Dodson's far enough, Bridge assured him, and late that night the grateful farmer set them down at their destination. An hour later they were speeding south on the Missouri Pacific. Bridge lay back luxuriously on the red plush of the smoker's seat. 
"'From the last to us, eh, Bo?' asked Billy. Bridge stretched. "'The tide-hounds race far up the shore. The hunt is on. The breakers roar. Her spars are tipped with gold, and o'er her deck the spray is flung. Chapter Six of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Baby Bandits. It was twenty-four hours before Detective Sergeant Flanagan awoke to the fact that something had been put over on him, and that a Kansas farmer's wife had done the putting. He managed to piece it out finally from the narratives of the two tramps and when he had returned to the shorter home and listened to the contradictory and wholly sold improvisations of shorter peer and mirror he was convinced whereupon he immediately telegraphed chicago headquarters and obtained the necessary authority to proceed upon the trail of the fugitive burn and so it was that sergeant flanagan landed in el paso a few days later drawn thither by various pieces of intelligence he had gathered en route though with much delay and consequent vexation even after he had quitted the train he was none too sure that he was upon the right trail though he at once repaired to a telegraph office and wired his chief that he was hot on the trail of the fugitive as a matter of fact he was much hotter than he had imagined for billy and bridge were that very minute not two squares from him debating as to the future and the best manner of meeting it before it arrived i think said billy that i'll duck across the border and will never be safe in little old u s and with things hopping in mexico the way they have been for the last few years I ought to be able to lose myself pretty well. Now you're all right, old top. You don't have to duck nothing, for you ain't did nothing. I don't know what you was running away from, but I know it ain't nothing the police is worrying about. I can tell that by the way you act, so I guess we'll split here. You'll be the boob to cross if you don't have to, for if Villa don't get you, the Karenzistas will, unless the Zapatistas nab you first. Come and go and some greasy mugged high binders bound to croak you if you cross, from what little I've heard since we landed in El Paso. We'll feed up together tonight for the last time. Then I'll pull my freight. He was silent for a while and then said, I hate to do it, Bo, for you're the whitest guy I ever struck, which was a great deal for Billy Byrne of Grand Avenue to say. Bridge finished rolling a brown paper cigarette before he spoke. Your words are pure and unadulterated wisdom, my friend, he said. The chances are scarcely even that two gringo hobos would last the week out afoot and broke in Viva Mexico. But it has been many years since I followed the dictates of wisdom. Therefore, I'm going with you. Billy grinned. He could not conceal his pleasure. You're past twenty-one, he said, and dry behind the ears. Let's go and eat. There's still some in that twenty-five left. Together they entered a saloon which Bridges remembered as permitting a very large consumption of free lunch upon the purchase of a single schooner of beer. There were round tables scattered about the floor in front of the bar, and after purchasing their beer they carried it to one of these that stood in the far corner of the room close to a rear door. Here Bridge sat on guard over the foaming open sesame to food, while Billy crossed to the free lunch counter and appropriated all that a zealous attendant would permit him to carry off. When he returned to the table he took a chair with his back to the wall in conformity to a habit of long standing when as now it had stood him in great stead to be in a position to see the other fellow at least as soon as the other fellow saw him the other fellow being more often than not a large gentleman with a bit of shiny metal pinned to the left suspender strap that guy's a tight one said billy jerking his hand in the direction of the guardian of the free lunch i scoop up about a good square meal for a canary bird and he makes me cough up half of it he wants to know if i think i can go into the restaurant business on a five-cent schooner of suds bridge laughed well, you didn't do so badly at that, he said. I know places where they'd indict you for grand larceny if you took more than what you have there. Rotten beer, commented Billy. Always is rotten down here, replied Bridge. I sometimes think that they put mothballs in it so it won't spoil. Billy looked up and smiled. Then he raised his tall glass before him. Here's two, he started, but he got no further. His eyes traveling past his companion fell upon the figure of a large man entering the low doorway. At the same instant, the gentleman's eyes fell upon Billy recognition lit those of each simultaneously the big man started across the room on a run straight towards billy byrne the latter leapt to his feet bridge guessing what had happened rose too flanagan he exclaimed the detective was tucking at his revolver which had stuck in his hip pocket byrne reached for his own weapon bridge laid a hand on his arm not that billy he cried there's a door behind you 
here and he pulled billy backwards toward the doorway in the wall behind them Byrne still clung to the schooner of beer which he had transferred to his left hand as he sought to draw his gun flanagan was close to them bridge opened the door and strove to pull billy through but the latter hesitated just an instant for he saw that it would be impossible to close and bar the door provided they had a bar before flanagan would be against it with his great shoulders the policeman was still struggling to disentangle his revolver from the lining of his pocket he was bellowing like a bull yelling at billy that he was under arrest men at the tables were at their feet those at the bar had turned around as flanagan started to run across the floor now some of them were moving in the direction of the detective and his prey but whether from curiosity or with sinister intentions it was difficult to say one thing however is certain if all the love that was felt for policemen in general by the men in that room could have been combined in a single individual it was scarcely would have constituted a grand passion flanagan felt rather than saw that others were closing in on him and then fortunately for himself he thought he managed to draw his weapon it was just as billy was fading through the doorway into the room beyond he saw the revolver gleam in the policeman's hand and then it became evident why billy had clung so tenaciously to his schooner of beer left-handed and hurriedly he threw it but even flanagan must have been constrained to admit that it was a good shot it struck the detective directly in the midst of his features gave him a nasty cut on the cheek as it broke and filled his eyes full of beer and beer never was intended as an eyewash spluttering and cursing flanagan came to a sudden stop and when he had wiped the beer from his eyes he found that billy burton had passed through the doorway and closed the door after him the room in which billy and bridge found themselves was a small one in the center of which was a large round table at which were gathered a half dozen men at poker above the table swung a single arc lamp casting a garish light upon the players beneath billy looked quickly about for another exit only to find that besides the doorway through which he had entered there was but a single aperture in the four walls a small window heavily barred the place was a veritable trap at their hurried entrance the men had ceased their play and one or two had risen in profane questioning and protest billy ignored them he was standing with his shoulder against the door trying to secure it against the detective without but there was neither bolt nor bar flanagan hurling against the opposite side exerted his noblest efforts to force an entrance into the room but billy burns great weight held firm as gibraltar his mind revolved various wild plans of escape but none bade fair to offer the slightest foothold to hope the men at the table were clamoring for an explanation of the interruption two of them were approaching billy with the vowed intention of turning him out when he turned his head suddenly toward them can the beef you poor boobs he cried there's a bunch of dicks out there the droid's been pinched instantly pandemonium ensued cards chips and money were swept as by magic from the board a dozen dog-eared and filthy magazines and newspapers were snatched from a hiding place beneath the table and in the fraction of a second the room was transformed into a gambling place to an innocent reading room billy grinned broadly flanagan had ceased his efforts to break down the door and was endeavoring to persuade billy that he might as well come out quietly and submit to arrest byrne had drawn his revolver again now he motioned to bridge to come to his side follow me he whispered don't move till i move then move sudden then turning to the door again you big stiff he cried you couldn't take a crip to a hospital let alone taking billy byrne to the still beat it before i come out and spread your beezer across your map if billy had desired to arouse the ire of detective sergeant flanagan by this little speech he succeeded quite as well as he could have hoped flanagan commenced to growl and threaten and presently again hurled himself against the door instantly byrne wheeled and fired a single shot into the arc lamp the shattered carbon rattled to the table with fragments of the globe and burned stepped quickly to one side the door flew open and sergeant flanagan drove headlong into the darkened room a foot shot out from behind the open door and flanagan striking it sprawled upon his face amid the legs of the literary lights who held dog-eared magazines right side up or upside down as they chanced to have picked them up simultaneously billy byrne and bridge dodged through the open doorway banged the door to behind them and sped across the barroom toward the street as flanagan shot into their midst the men at the table leapt to their feet and bolted for the doorway but the detective was up and after them so quickly that only two succeeded in getting out of the room one of these generously slammed the door in the faces of his fellows and there they pulled and hauled at each other until flanagan was among them in the pitch darkness he could recognize no one but to be on the safe side he hid out promiscuously until he had driven them all from the door then he stood with his back toward it the inmates of the room his prisoners thus he remained for a moment threatening to shoot at the first sound of movement in the room and then he opened the door again and stepping just outside ordered the prisoners to file out one at a time 
as each man passed him flannagan scrutinized his face and it was not until they had all emerged and he had re-entered the room with a light that had been discovered that once again his quarry had eluded him detective sergeant flannagan was peeved the sun smote down upon the dusty road a heat haze lay upon the arid land that stretched away upon either hand toward gray-brown hills a little adobe hut backed by a few squat outbuildings stood out a screaming high light in its coat of whitewash against a background that was garish with light two men plodded along the road their coats were off the brims of their tattered hats were pulled down over eyes closed to mere slits against sun and dust one of the men glancing up at the distant hut broke into verse yet then the sun was shining down a blazing on a little town a mile or so way down the track but dancing in the sun but somehow as i waited there there came a shiver in the air the birds are flying south he said the winter has begun his companion looked up at him who quoted there ain't no track he said and that doby shack don't look much like a town but otherwise this nibs got our number all right all right we are the birds of flying south and flanagan with the shiver in the air flanagan's a regular frost gee but i bet you that guy's sore why is it billy asked bridge after a moment's silence that upon occasion when you speak king's english after the manner of the boulevard and again after that of the back alley sometimes you say that and dat in the same sentence your conversational clashes are numerous surely something or someone had cramped your original style i was born and brought up on dat explained billy she taught me the other line of talk sometimes i forget i had about twenty years of the other and only one of hers and twenty to one is a long shot more apt to lose than win she i take it is a penelope mused bridge half to himself she must have been a fine girl fine isn't the right word billy corrected him if it thinks fine there may be something finer and then something else finest she was better than finest she she was why bridge i'd have to be a walking dictionary to tell you what she was bridge made no reply and the two trudged on toward the whitewashed hut in silence for several minutes then bridge broke it and you my sweet penelope out there somewhere you wait for me with buds of roses in your hair and kisses on your mouth billy sighed and shook his head there ain't no such luck for me he said she's married to another gink now they came at last to the hut upon the shady side of which they found a mexican squatting puffing upon a cigarette while upon the doorstep sat a woman evidently his wife busily engaged in preparation of some manner of foodstuff contained in a large shallow vessel about them played a couple of half-naked children a baby sprawled upon a blanket just within the doorway the man looked up suspiciously as the two approached bridge saluted him in fairly understandable spanish asking for food and telling the man that they had money with which they could pay for a little not much but a little the mexican slowly unfolded himself in a rose motioning the strangers to follow him to the interior of the hut the woman at a word from her lord and master followed them and at his further dictation brought them frijoles and tortillas the price he asked was nominal but his eyes never left bridge's hands as the latter brought forth the money and handed it over he appeared just a trifle disappointed when no more money than the stipulated purchase price was revealed to sight where are you going he asked we're looking for work explained bridge we want to get jobs on one of the american ranches or mines you better go back warned the mexican i myself have nothing against the american senor but there are many of my countrymen who do not like you the americans are all even some already have been killed by bandits it is not safe to go further pasita's men are all about here even mexicans are not safe from him no one knows whether it's for villa or carranza if he finds a villa ranchero then pasita cries viva carranza and his men kill and rob if on the other hand a neighbor of the last victim hears of it in time and later pasita comes to him he assures pasita that he is for carranza whereupon pasita cries viva villa and falls upon the poor unfortunate who is lucky if he escapes with his life but americans ah pasita asks them no questions he hates them all and kills them all whenever he can lay his hands upon them he has sworn to rid mexico of the gringos what's the dago talking about asked billy bridge gave his companion a brief synopsis of the mexican's conversation only the gentleman is not an italian billy he's a mexican who said he was an italian demanded Byrne as the two americans and the mexican conversed within the hut there approached across the dusty flat from the direction of the nearest hills a party of five horsemen they rode rapidly coming toward the hut from the side which had neither door nor window so that those within had no warning of their coming 
They were swarthy, ragged ruffians, fully armed, and with an equipment which suggested that they might be part of a quasi-military organization. Close behind the hut, four of them dismounted, while a fifth, remaining in his saddle, held the bridle reins of the horses of his companions. The latter crept stealthily around the outside of the building toward the door, the carbines ready in their hands. It was one of the little children who first discovered the presence of the newcomers. With a piercing scream, she bolted into the interior and ran to cling to her mother's skirts. Billy, Bridge, and the Mexican wheeled toward the doorway simultaneously to learn the cause of the girl's fright, and as they did so found themselves covered by four carbines in the hands of many men. As his eyes fell upon the faces of the intruders, the countenance of the Mexican fell, while his wife dropped to the floor and embraced his knees, weeping. "'What now, ejaculated the Billyburn? What's doing?' "'We seem to have been made prisoners,' suggested Bridge, "'but whether by Villistas or Caranazistas, I do not know.' Their host understood his words and turned toward the two Americans. "'These are Peseta's men,' he said. "'Yes,' spoke one of the bandits. "'We are Peseta's men, and Peseta will be delighted, Miguel, to greet you, "'especially when he sees the sort of company you've been keeping. "'You know how much Peseta loves the gringos. "'But this man does not even know us,' spoke up Bridge. "'We stopped here to get a meal. He never saw us before.' We are on our way to the El Arobo Ranch, in search of work. We have no money and have broken no laws. Let us go our way in peace. You can gain nothing by detaining us, and as for Miguel here, that is what you call him, I believe. I think, from what he said to us, that he loves a gringo about as much as your revered chief seems to. Miguel looked his appreciation of Bridge's defense of him, but it was evident that he did not expect it to bear fruit. Nor did it. The brigand spokesman only grinned sardonically. You may tell all this to Peseta himself, senor, he said. Now come, get a move on. Beat it. The fellow had once worked in El Paso and took a great pride in his higher English education. As he started to herd them from the hut, Billy demurred. He turned toward Bridge. Most of this talk gets by me, he said. I ain't Jerry to all the Dago Jabber yet, though I've copped off a little of it in the past two weeks. Put me wise to the gang's lay. Elementary, Watson, elementary, replied Bridge. We are captured by bandits, and they are going to take us to their delightful chief, who will doubtless have a shot at sunrise. Bandits, snapped Billy, with a sneer. You don't call these little runs bandits? Baby bandits, Billy, baby bandits, replied Bridge. And you're going to stand for letting them pull off this rough stuff without handing them a comeback, demanded Byrne. We seem to be up against just that very thing, said Bridge. There are four carbines quite ready for us. It would mean sudden death to resist now. Later we may find an opportunity. I think we'd better act simple and wait. He spoke in a quick, low whisper, for the spokesman of the brigands evidently understood a little English, and was on the alert for any trickery. Billy shrugged, and when their captains again urged them forward, he went quietly. But the expression on his face might have perturbed the Mexicans had they known Billy Byrne of Grand Avenue better. He was smiling happily. Miguel had two ponies in his corral. These the brigands appropriated, placing Billy upon one and Miguel and Bridge upon the other. Billy's great weight rendered it inadvisable to double him up with another rider. As they were mounting, Billy leaned toward Bridge and whispered. "'I'll get these guys, pal. Watch me,' he said. "'I am with thee, William. Horse, foot, and artillery,' laughed Bridge. "'Which reminds me,' said Billy, "'that I have an ace in the hole. The boobs never frisked me.' "'And I am reminded,' returned Bridge, as the horse started off to the yank of hackamore ropes in the hands of the brigands who were leading them, of a touching little thing of services.' Just think, some night the stars will gleam upon the cold gray stone. Chapter 7 of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey in Peseta's camp. Peseta was a short, stocky man with a large, dark mustache. He attired himself after his own ideas of what should constitute the uniform of a general, ideas more or less influenced and modified by the chance and caprice of fortune. At the moment that Billy, Bridge, and Miguel were dragged into his presence, his torso was enwrapped in a once resplendent coat covered with yards of gold braid. Upon his shoulder were brass epaulets, such as are connected only in one's mind with the ancient chorus ladies of the light operas of fifteen or twenty years ago. Upon his legs were some rusty and ragged overalls. His feet were bare. He scowled ferociously at the prisoners while his lieutenant narrated the thrilling facts of their capture. 
thrilling by embellishment. "'You are Americanos?' he asked of Bridge and Billy. Both agreed that they were. Then Peseta turned toward Miguel. "'Where is Villa?' he asked. "'How should I know, my general?' parried Miguel. "'Who am I, a poor man with a tiny rancho, to know of the movements of the great ones of the earth? I did not even know where was the great General Peseta until now I am brought into his gracious presence, to throw myself at his feet and implore that I may be permitted to serve him in even the meanest of capacities.' Peseta appeared not to hear what Miguel had said. He turned his shoulder toward the man and addressed Billy in broken English. "'You were on your way to El Arobo Ranch, eh? Are you acquainted there?' he asked. Billy replied that they were not, merely looking for employment upon an American-owned ranch or in an American mine. "'Why did you leave your own country?' asked Peseta. "'What do you want here in Mexico?' "'Well, old top,' replied Billy, "'you see the birds was flying south, and winter was in the air, and a fat-head dick from Shy was on me trail. So I ducks.' "'Ducks?' queried Peseta, mystified. Ah, the ducks. They fly south, I see. Nah, you poor simp. It blows, explained Billy. Ah, yes, agreed Peseta, not wishing to admit any ignorance of plain American even before a despised gringo. But the large-faced dick, what might that be? I have spent much time in the States, but I do not know that. I said, fat-head dick. That's a fly cop, Billy elucidated. It is he, then, that is the bird. Peseta beamed at this evidence of his own sagacity. He fly. Flanagan ain't no bird. Flanagan's a dub. Bridge came to the rescue. My erudite friend means, he explained, that the police chased him out of the United States of America. Peseta raised his eyebrows. All was now clear to him. But why did he not say so, he asked. He tried to, said Bridge. He did his best. Quit your kidding, admonished Billy. A bright light suddenly burst upon Peseta. He turned upon Bridge. "'Your friend is not then an American?' he asked. "'I guessed it. That is why I could not understand him. He speaks the language of the gringo less well even than I. From what country is he?' Billy Byrne would have asserted with some show of asperity that he was nothing if not American, but Bridge was quick to see a possible loophole for escape for his friend in Peseta's belief that Billy was no gringo, and warned the latter to silence by a quick motion of his head. "'He's from Grand Avenue,' he said. It's not exactly in Germany, but there are a great many Germans there. My friend is a native, so he don't speak German or English either. They have a language of their own in Grand Avenue. I see, said Peseta, a German colony. I like the Germans. They furnish me with much ammunition and rifles. They are my very good friends. Take Miguel and the gringo away. This to the soldiers who have brought the prisoner to him. I will speak further with this man from Grand Avenue. When the others had passed out of hearing, Peseta addressed Billy. "'I am sorry, senor,' he said, "'that you have been put to so much inconvenience. My men could not know that you were not a gringo, but I can make it all right. I will make it all right. You are a big man. The gringos have chased you from their country as they chased me. I hate them. You hate them. But enough of them. You have no business in Mexico except to seek work. I give you work. You are big. You are strong. You are like a bull.' You stay with me, senor, and I make you captain. I need men that can talk some English and look like a gringo. You do fine. We make much money, you and I. We make it all time while we fight to liberate my poor Mexico. When Mexico liberate, we fight some more to liberate her again. The Germans, they give me much money to liberate Mexico, and there are other ways of getting much money when one is riding around through rich country with soldiers liberating his poor, bleeding country, sabe? Yep, I guess I savvy, said Billy. And it listens all right to me, as far as you've gone. My pal in on it? Eh? You big my friend a captain, too? Peseta held up his hands and rolled his eyes in holy horror. Take a gringo into his band? It was unthinkable. He shot, he cried. I swear to kill all gringo. I become savior of my country. I rid her of all Americanos. Nix on the captain stuff for me, then, said Billy firmly. That guy's a right one. If any big stiff thinks he can croak little old bridge while Billy burns around, he's got another thing coming. Why, me and him's just like brothers. You like this, Gringo? asked Peseta. You bet, cried Billy. Peseta thought for several minutes. In his mind was a scheme which required the help of just such an individual as this stranger. Someone who was utterly unknown in the surrounding country, and whose presence in town could not by any stretch of the imagination be connected in any way with the bandit Peseta. I tell you, he said, I let your friend go. 
I send him under safe escort to El Robo Ranch. Maybe he help us there after a while. If you stay, I let him go. Otherwise, I shoot you both with Miguel. What you got it in for Mig fur? asked Billy. He's a harmless sort of guy. He's Velista. Velista with gringos run Mexico. Gringos and the church. Just like Huerta would have done if they'd have given him a chance. Only Huerta more for church than for gringos. I'll let the poor boob go, urged Billy, and I'll come along with you. Why, he's got a wife and kids. You wouldn't want to leave them without no one to look after them in this godforsaken country. Peseta grinned indulgently. Very well, senor captain, he said, bowing low. I let Miguel and your honorable friend go. I send safe escort with them. Bully for you, old pot, exclaimed Billy, and Peseta smiled delightedly in the belief that some complimentary title had been applied to him in the language of Grand Avenue. I'll go and tell them, said Billy. Yes, said Peseta, and say to them that they will start early in the morning. As Billy turned and walked in the direction that the soldiers had led Bridge and Miguel, Peseta beckoned to a soldier who leaned upon his gun at a short distance from his general, a barefooted, slovenly attempt at a headquarters orderly. Send Captain Rosales to me, directed Peseta. The soldier shuffled away to where a little circle of men in wide-brimmed, metal-encrusted hats squatted in the shade of a tree, chatting, laughing, and rolling cigarettes. He saluted one of these and delivered his message, whereupon the tall, gaunt Captain Rosales arose and came over to Peseta. The big one who you brought in today is not a gringo, said Peseta, by way of opening the conversation. He is from Grand Avenue. He can be of great service to us, for he is very friendly with the Germans. Yet he looks like a gringo and could pass for one. We can utilize him. Also, he is very large and appears to be equally strong. He should make a good fighter, and we have none too many. I have named him captain. Rosales grinned. Already among Peseta's following of a hundred men, there were fifteen captains. Where is Grand Avenue? asked Rosales. You mean to say, my dear captain, exclaimed Peseta, that a man of your education does not know where Grand Avenue is? I am surprised. Why, it is a German colony. Yes, of course. I recall it well now. For the moment it had slipped my mind. My grandfather, who was a great traveler, was there many times. I have heard him speak of it often. But I did not summon you that we might discuss European geography, interrupted Peseta. I sent for you to tell you that the stranger will not consent to serve me unless I liberated his friend, the gringo, and that sneaky spy of a Miguel. I was forced to yield, for we can use the stranger. So I have promised, my dear captain, that I shall send them upon their road with a safe escort in the morning, and you shall command the guard. Upon your life, respect my promise, Rosales. But if some of these cutthroats should fall upon you, and in the battle while you were trying to defend the gringo and Miguel, both should be slain by the bullets of the Valistas. Ah, but it would be deplorable, Rosales. But it would not be your fault. Who, indeed, could blame you who had fought well and risked your men and yourself in the performance of your sacred duty? Rosales, should such a thing occur, what could I do in token of my great pleasure other than make you colonel? I shall defend them with my life, my general, cried Rosales, bowing low. Good, cried Peseta. That is all. Rosales started back toward the rain of smokers. Ah, Captain, cried Peseta, another thing. Will you make it known to the other officers that the stranger from Grand Avenue is a captain, and that it is my wish that he be well treated, but not told so much as might injure him, or his usefulness, about our sacred work of liberating poor, bleeding, unhappy Mexico? Again Rosales bowed and departed. This time he was not recalled. Billy found Bridge and Miguel squatting on the ground, with two dirty-faced peons standing guard over them. The latter were some little distance away. They made no objection when Billy approached the prisoners, though they had looked in mild surprise when they saw him crossing toward them without a guard. Billy sat down beside Bridge and broke into a laugh. "'What's the joke?' asked Bridge. "'Are we going to be hanged instead of being shot?' "'We ain't going to be either,' said Billy. "'And I'm a captain. What do you know about that?' He explained all that had taken place between himself and Peseta, while Bridge and Miguel listened attentively to his every word. "'I thought it was about the only way for us,' said Billy. "'We were in worse than I thought. "'Can the Bowery stuff, Billy,' cried Bridge, "'and talk like a white man. "'You can, you know.' "'All right, bro,' cried Billy, good-naturedly. "'You see, I forget when there is anything pressing like this to chew about. "'Then I fall back into the old lingo. "'Well, as I was saying, I didn't want to do it unless you would stay, too.' But he wouldn't have you. He has it in for all gringos. And that bull you passed him about me being from a foreign country called Grand Avenue, 
He fell for it like a rube from the tapped wire stuff. He said if I wouldn't stay and help him, he'd croak the bunch of us. How about that ace in the hole you were telling me about? asked Bridge. I still got it, and Billy fondled something hard that swung under his left arm beneath his shirt. But lord now, what could I do against the whole bunch? I might get a few of them, but they get us all in the end. The other way is better, though I hate to have to split with you, old man. He was silent for a moment, looking hard at the ground. Bridge whistled and cleared his throat. I've always wanted to spend a year in Rio, he said. We'll meet there, when you can make your getaway. You said it, agreed Byrne. It's Rio as soon as we can make it. Poseidon's promised to send you both loose in the morning and send you under safe escort. Miguel to his happy home, and you to El Robo Ranch. I guess the old stiff ain't so bad after all. Miguel had pricked up his ears at the sound of the word escort. He leaned far forward, closer to the two Americans, and whispered. Who is to command the escort, he asked. I don't know, said Billy. What difference does it make? It makes all the difference between life and death for your friend and for me, said Miguel. There's no reason why I should need an escort. I know I would throughout all Chihuahua, as well as Peseta or any of his cutthroats. I have come and gone all my life without an escort. Of course, your friend is different. It might be well for him to have company to El Robo. Maybe it is all right, but wait until we learn who commands the escort. I know Peseta well. I know his methods. If Rosales rides out with us tomorrow morning, you may say goodbye to your friend forever, and you will never see him in Rio, or elsewhere. He and I will be dead before ten o'clock. What makes you think that, Bo? demanded Billy. I do not think, senor, replied Miguel. I know. Well, said Billy, we'll wait and see. If it is Rosales, say nothing, said Miguel. It would do no good, but we may then be on the watch and if possible you might find the means to obtain a couple of revolvers for us in which case he shrugged and permitted a faint smile to flex his lips as they talked a soldier came and announced that they were no longer prisoners that they were to have the freedom of the camp but he concluded the general request that you do not pass beyond the limits of the camp there are many desperados in the hills and he fears for your safety now that you are his guests the man spoke spanish so that it was necessary that bridge interpret his words for the benefit of billy who had understood only part of what he said. "'Ask him,' said Byrne, "'if that stuff goes for me, too.' "'He said no,' replied Bridge, after questioning the soldier. "'That the captain is now one of them, and may go and come and do as the other officers. Such are Pesetta's orders.' Billy arose. The messenger had returned to his post at headquarters. The guard had withdrawn, leaving the three men alone. "'So long, old man,' said Billy. "'If I'm going to be any help to you and Big, the less I'm seen with you, the better.' I'll blow over and mix with the Dago bunch, and practice sitting on my heels. It seems to be the right dope down here, and I gotta learn all I can about being a greaser, seeing that I've turned one. Goodbye, Billy. Remember Rio, said Bridge. And the revolvers, senor, added Miguel. You bet, replied Billy, and strolled off in the direction of the little circle of cigarette smokers. As he approached them, Rosales looked up and smiled, then rising, extended his hand. Senor Captain, he said, we welcome you. I am Captain Rosales. He hesitated, waiting for Billy to give his name. My moniker's Byrne, said Billy. Pleased to meet you, Cap. Ah, Captain Byrne, said Rosales, proceeding to introduce the newcomer to his fellow officers. Several, like Rosales, were educated men who had been officers in the army under former regimes, but had turned bandit as the safer alternative to suffering immediate death at the hands of the faction then in power. The others, for the most part, were pure-blooded Indians, whose adult lives had been spent in outlawry and brigandage. All were small of stature beside the giant, Byrne. Rosales and two others spoke English. With those, Billy conversed. He tried to learn from them the name of the officer who was to command the escort that was to accompany Bridge and Miguel into the valley on the morrow, but Rosales and the others assured him that they did not know. When he had asked the question, Billy had been looking straight at Rosales, and he had seen the man's pupils contract and noticed the slight backward movement of the body, which also denotes determination. Billy knew, therefore, that Rosales was lying. He did not know who was to command the escort, and there was something sinister in that knowledge, but the fellow would not have denied it. The American began to consider plans for saving his friend from the fate which Peseta had outlined for him. Rosales, too, was thinking rapidly. He was no fool. Why had the stranger desired to know who was to command the escort? He knew none of the officers personally. What difference, then, did it make to him who rode out on the morrow with his friend? Ah, 
but miguel knew that it would make a difference miguel had spoken to the new captain and aroused his suspicions rosales excused himself and rose a moment later he was in conversation with Pesita, unburdening himself of his suspicions and outlining a plan. Do not send me in charge of the escort, he advised. Send Captain Byrne himself. Pesita pooh-poohed the idea. But wait, urged Rosales. Let the stranger ride in command with a half-dozen picked men who will see that nothing goes wrong. An hour before dawn I will send two men. They will be our best shots on ahead. They will stop at a place we both know and about noon the captain burning his escort will ride back to the camp and tell us that they were attacked by a troop of villa's men and that both our guests were killed it will be sad but it will not be our fault we will swear vengeance against villa and the captain burn will hate him as good as a pesatista should you have the cunning of the coyote my captain cried peseta it shall be done as you suggest go now i will send for captain burn and give him his orders for the morning Chapter Eight of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Billy's first command. And so it was that, having breakfast in the morning, Bridge and Miguel started downward toward the valley, protected by an escort under Captain Billy Byrne. An old service jacket and a wide-brimmed hat, both donated by brother officers, constituted Captain Byrne's uniform. His mount was the largest that the picket line of Pesita's forces could produce. Billy loomed large amongst his men. For an hour they rode along the trail, Billy and Bridge conversing upon various subjects, none of which touched upon the one uppermost in the mind of each. Miguel rode, silent and preoccupied. The evening before he had whispered something to Bridge as he had crawled out of the darkness to lie close to the American, and during a brief moment that morning, Bridge had found an opportunity to relay the Mexican's message to Billy Byrne. The latter had but raised his eyebrows a trifle at the time, but later he smiled more than was usual with him. Something seemed to please him immensely. Beside him at the head of the column rode Bridge and Miguel. Behind them trailed the six swarthy little troopers, the picked men upon whom Pesada could depend. They had reached a point where the trail passes through a narrow, dry arroyo, which the waters of the rainy season had cut deep into the soft, powdery soil upon either bank grew cacti and mesquite forming a sheltered screen behind which a regiment might have hidden the place was ideal for an ambuscade here senor captain whispered miguel as they neared the entrance to the trap a low hill shut off from their view all but led the head of the cut and it also hid them from the sight of any possible enemy which might have been lurking in wait for them further down the arroyo at miguel's words byrne wheeled his horse to the right away from the trail which led through the bottom of the waterway and around the base of the hill or rather in that direction for it scarce deviated from the direct way before one of the troopers spurred to his side calling out in spanish that he was on the wrong trail what's this guy chewing about asked billy turning to miguel he says you must keep to the arroyo senor captain explained the mexican tell him to go back into the stall was byrne's laconic rejoinder and he pushed his mount forward to pass the brigand. The soldier was voluble in his objections. Again he reined in front of Billy, and by the time his five fellows had spurred forward to block his way. Again he reined in front of Billy, and by this time his five fellows had spurred forward to block the way. This is the wrong trail, they cried. Come this other way, Captain. Peseta has so ordered. Catching the drift of their remarks, Billy waved them to one side. I'm bossing this picnic, he announced. Get out of the way and be quick about it if you don't want to be herded. Again he rode forward. Again the troopers interposed their mounts, and this time their leader cocked his carbine. His attitude was menacing. Billy was close to him. The ponies were shoulder to shoulder, that of the bandit almost broadside of the trail. Now Billy Byrne was more than passing well acquainted with many of the fundamental principles of sudden brawls. It is safe to say that he had never heard of Van Biver, but he knew as well as Van Biver knew that it was well to hit first. Without a word, and without warning, he struck, leaping forward with all the weight of his body behind his blow, and catching the man full beneath the chin, he lifted him as neatly from his saddle as though a battering ram had struck him. Simultaneously, Bridge and Miguel drew revolvers from their shirts, and as Billy wheeled his pony toward the remaining five, they opened fire upon them. The battle was short and sweet. 
One almost escaped, but Miguel, who proved to be an excellent revolver shot, brought him down at a hundred yards. He then, with utter disregard for the rules of civilized warfare, dispatched those who were not already dead. We must let none return to carry false tales to Peseta, he explained. Even Billy Byrne winced at the ruthlessness of the cold-blooded murders, but he realized the necessity which confronted them, though he could not have brought himself to do the things which the Mexican did with such sang and even evident enjoyment. Now for the others, cried Miguel, when he assured himself that each of the six were really quite dead. Spurring after him, Billy and Bridge ran their horses over the rough ground at the base of the little hill, and then parallel to the arroyo for a matter of a hundred yards, where they espied two Indians, carbines in hand, standing in evident consternation because of the unexpected fusillade of shots which they had just heard and which they were unable to account for. At the sight of the three, the sharpshooters dropped behind cover and fired. Billy's horse stumbled at the first report, caught himself, reared high upon its hind legs, and then toppled over, dead. His rider, throwing himself to one side, scrambled to his feet and fired twice at the partially concealed men. Miguel and Bridge rode in rapidly to close quarters, firing as they came. One of the two men Peseta had sent to assassinate his guests dropped his gun, clutched at his breast, screamed, and sank back behind a clump of mesquite. The other turned and leapt over the edge of the bank into the arroyo, rolling and tumbling to the bottom in a cloud of dry dust. As he rose to his feet and started on a run up the bed of the dry stream, dodging a zigzag course from one bit of scant cover to another, Billy Byrne stepped to the edge of the washout and threw his carbine to his shoulder. His face was flushed. His eye sparkled. A smile lighted his regular features. This is the life, he cried, and pulled the trigger. The man beneath him, running for his life like a frightened jackrabbit, sprawled forward upon his face, made a single effort to rise, and then slumped limply down, forever. Miguel and Bridge, dismounted now, came to Byrne's side. The Mexican was grinning broadly. The captain is one grand fighter, he said. How my dear general would admire such a man as the captain. Doubtless he would make him a colonel. Come with me, senor captain, and your fortune is made. Come where? asked Billy Byrne. To the camp of the liberator of poor bleeding Mexico. To General Francisco Villa. Nothing doing, said Byrne. I'm hooked up with this Peseta person now, and I guess I'll stick. He's given me more of a run for my money in the last twenty-four hours than I've had since I parted from my dear old friend the lord of yoga but senor captain cried miguel you didn't help me to say that you were going back to peseta he will shoot you down with his own hand when he has learned what has happened here i guess not said billy you'd better go with miguel billy urged bridge peseta will not forgive you this you've cost him eight men today and he hasn't any more men than he needs at best besides you've made a monkey of him and unless i miss my guests you'll have to pay for it no said billy i kind of like this peseta gent I think I'll stick around with him for a while yet. Anyhow, until I've had a chance to see his face after I've made my report to him. You guys run along now and make your getaway good, and I'll beat it back to camp. He crossed to where the two horses of the slain marksmen were hidden, turned one of them loose, and mounted the other. So long, bows, he cried, and with a wave of his hand, wheeled about and spurred back along the trail over which they had just come. Miguel and Bridge watched him for a moment. Then they, too, mounted and turned away in the opposite direction. Bridge recited no verse for the balance of the day. His heart lay heavy in his bosom, for he missed Billy Byrne, and he was fearful of the fate which awaited him in the camp of a bandit. Billy, blithe as a lark, rode gaily back along the trail to camp. He looked forward with unmixed delight to his coming interview with Peseta, and to the wild, half-savage life which association with the bandit promised. All his life had Billy Byrne fed upon excitement and adventure. As a gangster, thug, hold-up man, and second-story artist, Billy had found food for his appetite within the dismal, sooty streets of Chicago's Great West Side, and then fate had flung him upon the savage shore of Yoka to find other forms of adventure, where the best that is in a strong man may be brought out in the stern battle for existence against primeval men and conditions. The West Side had developed only Billy's basest characteristics. He might have slipped back easily into the old ways had it not been for her and the recollection of that which he had read in her eyes. Love had been there, but greater than that to hold a man into the straight and narrow path of decency and honor had been respect and admiration. It had seemed incredible to Billy that a goddess should fear such things for him, for the same man her scornful lips once had branded as coward and mucker. 
that he had read the truth all right and since then billy byrne had done his best according to the light that had been given him to deserve the belief she had in him so far there had crept into his consciousness no disquieting doubts as to the consistency of his recent action in joining the force of a depredating mexican outlaw billy knew nothing of the political conditions of the republic had peseta told him that he was president of mexico billy could not have disputed the statement from any knowledge of facts that he possessed as a matter of fact about all billy had ever known of mexico was that it had some connection with an important place called juarez where running meets were held to billy byrne then peseta was a real general and billy himself a bona fide captain he had entered an army which was at war with some other army what they were warring about billy did not know nor did he care there should be fighting and he loved that that much he knew the ethics of Perseus' warfare troubled him not he had heard that some great american general had said war is hell billy was willing to take his word for it and accept anything which came in the guise of war as entirely proper as it should be the afternoon was far gone when billy drew rein in the camp of the outlaw band peseta with the bulk of his raiders was out upon some excursion to the north only half a dozen men lolled about smoking or sleeping away the hot day they looked at billy in evident surprise when they saw him riding in alone but they asked no questions and billy offered no explanation his report was for the ears of peseta only the balance of the day billy spent in acquiring further knowledge of spanish by conversing with those of the men who remained awake and asking innumerable questions it was almost sundown when peseta rode in two riderless horses were led by troopers in the rear of the little column and three men swayed painfully in their saddles and the clothing was stained with blood evidently peseta had met with resistance there was much voluble chattering on the part of those who had remained behind in their endeavors to extract from their returning comrades the details of the day's enterprises by piecing together the various scraps of conversation he could understand billy discovered that peseta had ridden far to demand tribute from a wealthy ranchero only to find that word of his coming had preceded him and brought a large detachment of villa's regulars who concealed themselves about the house and outbuildings until peseta and his entire force were well within close range we were lucky to get off as well as we did said an officer billy grinned inwardly as he thought of the pleasant frame of mind in which peseta might now be expecting to receive the news that eight of his troopers had been killed and his two guests safely removed from the sphere of his hospitality and even as his mind dwelt delightedly upon the subject a ragged indian carrying a carbine and with heavy silver spurs strapped to his bare feet approached and saluted him general peseta wishes senior captain byrne to report to him at once said the man sure mike replied billy and made his way through the pandemonium of the camp toward the headquarters tent as he went he slipped his hand inside his shirt and loosened something which hung beneath his left arm little old ace in the hole he murmured affectionately he found peseta pacing back and forth before his tent an energetic bundle of nerves which no amount of hard riding and fighting could tire or discourage as billy approached peseta shot a glance at his face that he might read perhaps in his new officer's expression whether anger or suspicion had been aroused by the killing of his american friend for peseta never dreamed but that bridge had been dead since mid forenoon well said peseta smiling you left senor bridge and miguel safely at their destination i couldn't take em all the way replied billy cause i didn't have no more men to guard em with but i seen em past the danger i guess and well on their way you had no men questioned peseta we had six troopers oh they was all croaked before we had been gone two hours you see it happened like this we got as far as that dry arroyo just before the trail drops down into the valley went up jumps a bunch of this here villa's guys and commenced taking pot shots at em seeing as how i was sent to guard bridge and mig i make them dismount and hunt cover and then me and my men wades in and cleans up the bunch there were only a few of them but they croaked the whole bloomin six of mine i tell you it was some scrap all it lasted but i saved your guest from getting hurted and i know that's what you sent me to do it's too bad about the six men we lost but leave it to me we'll get even with the via guy yet just leave me to him as he spoke billy commenced scratching himself beneath the left arm and then as though to better reach the point of irritation he slipped his hand inside his shirt if peseta noticed the apparent innocent little act or interpreted correctly may or may not have been the fact he stood looking straight into burns eyes for a full minute his face denoted neither baffled rage nor contemplated revenge presently a slow smile raised his heavy mustache and revealed his strong white teeth you have done well captain byrne he said you are a man after my own heart 
and he extended his hand. A half hour later Billy walked slowly back to his own blankets, and to say that he was puzzled would scarce have described his mental state. I can't quite make this gink out, he mused. Either he's a mighty good loser, or else he's a deep one who'll wait a year to get me the way he wants to get me. And Peseda, a few moments later, was saying to Captain Rosales, I should have shot him if I could spare such a man, but it is seldom I find one with the courage and effrontery he possesses. I think of it, Rosales, he kills eight of my men, lets my prisoners escape, and then dares to come back and tell me about it when he might easily have gotten away. Villa would have made him an officer for this thing, and Miguel must have told him so. He found out in some way about your little plan, and he turned the tables on us. We can use him, Rosales, but we must watch him. Also, my dear captain, watch his right hand, and when he slips it into his shirt, be careful that you do not draw on him, unless you happen to be behind him. Rosales was not inclined to take his chief's view of Byrne's value to them. He argued that the man was guilty of disloyalty and therefore a menace. What he thought, but did not advance as an argument, was a different nature. Rosales was filled with rage to think that the newcomer had outwitted him and beaten him at his own game, and he was jealous, too, of the man's ascendancy in the esteem of Peseta. But he hid his personal feelings beneath the cloak of seeming acquiescence to his chief's views, knowing that some day his time would come when he might rid himself of the danger of this obnoxious rival. And tomorrow, continued Peseta, I am sending him to Cuivaca. Villa has considerable funds in a Chapter 9 of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Barbara in Mexico. The manager of El Robo Rancho was an American named Grayson. He was a tall, wiry man whose education had been acquired principally in the cow camps of Texas, where, among other things, one does not learn to love nor trust a greaser. As a result of this early training, Grayson was peculiarly unfitted in some respects to manage an American ranch in Mexico. But he was just a man, and so if his vaqueros did not love him, they at least respected him, and everyone who was or possessed the latent characteristics of wrongdoer feared him. Perhaps it is not fair to say that Grayson was in any way unfitted for the position he held, since, as a matter of fact, he was an ideal ranch foreman, and, if the truth be known, the simple fact that he was a gringo would have been sufficient to have won him the hatred of the Mexicans who worked under him, not in the course of their everyday relations, but when the fires of racial animosity were fanned to flame by some untoward incident upon either side of the border. Today Grayson was particularly rabid, the more so because he could not vent his anger upon the cause of it, who was no less a person than his boss. It seemed incredible to Grayson that any man of intelligence could have conceived and then carried out the full thing which the boss had just done which was to have come from the safety of New York City to the hazards of warring Mexico, bringing, and this was the worst feature of it, his daughter with him. And at such a time, scarce a day had passed without his rumors or reports of new affronts and even atrocities being perpetuated by American residents of Mexico. Each day, too, the gravity of these acts increased. From mere insult they had run of late to assault and even to murder. Nor was the end in sight. Peseta had openly sworn to rid Mexico of the gringo, to kill on sight every American who fell into his hands, and what could Grayson do in case of a determined attack upon the rancho? It is true he had a hundred men, laborers and vaqueros, but scarce a dozen of these were Americans, and the rest would, almost without exception, follow the inclinations of consanguinity in case of trouble. To add to Grayson's irritability, he had just lost his bookkeeper, and if there was one thing more than any other that Grayson hated, it was pen and ink. The youth had been a lunger from Iowa, a fairly nice little chap, and entirely suited to his duties under any other circumstances than those which prevailed in Mexico at the time. He was in moral terror of his life every moment that he was awake, and at last had given in to the urge of cowardice and resigned. The day previous he had been bundled into the buckboard and driven over to the Mexican Central, which, at the time, still was operating trains, occasionally, between Chihuahua and Juarez. His mind filled with these unpleasant thoughts, Grayson sat at his desk in the office of the ranch, trying to unravel the riddle of a balance sheet, which would not balance. Mixed with the blue smoke from his briar was the deeper azure of a spirited monologue in which Grayson was engaged. 
A girl was passing the building at the moment. At her side walked a gray-haired man, one of those men whom you just naturally fit into a mental picture of a director's meeting somewhere along Wall Street. Such language, cried the girl, with a laugh, covering her ears with her palms. The man at her side smiled. I can't say that I blame him much, Barbara, he replied. It was a foolish thing for me to bring you down here at this time. I can't understand whatever possessed me to do it. Don't blame yourself, dear, remonstrated the girl, when it was all my fault. I begged and begged and begged until you had to consent. And I'm not sorry, either. If nothing happens to you because of our coming, I couldn't stay in New York another minute. Everyone was so stupid, and I could just tell that they were dying to ask questions about Billy and me. I can't get it through my head yet, Barbara, said the man. Why in the world you broke with Billy Mallory? He's one of the finest young men in New York City today. Just my ideal of the sort of man I'd like my only daughter to marry. I tried, Papa, said the girl in a low voice, but I couldn't. I just couldn't. Was it because... The man stopped abruptly. Well, never mind, dear. I shan't be snoopy, too. Here, now, you run along and do some snooping yourself about the ranch. I want to stop in and have a talk with Grayson. Down by one of the corrals where three men were busily engaged in attempting to persuade an unbroken pony that a spade bit is a pleasant thing to wear in one's mouth, Barbara found a seat upon a wagon box which commanded an excellent view of the entertainment going on within the corral. As she sat there experiencing a combination of admiration for the agility and courage of the men and pity for the horse, the tones of a pleasant masculine voice broke in upon her thoughts. Out there somewhere, says I to me, by gosh, I guess that's poetry out there somewhere penelope with kisses on her mouth and then thinks i o oh, college guy your talk gets me in the eye the north is creeping in the air the birds are flying south barbara swung around to view the poet she saw a slender man astride a fagged mexican pony a ragged coat and ragged trousers covered the man's nakedness indian moccasins protected his feet while a torn and shapeless felt hat sat upon his well-shaped head American was written all over him. No one could have imagined him anything else. Apparently he was a tramp as well. His apparel proclaimed him that, but there were two discordant notes in the otherwise harmonious ensemble of your typical bow. He was clean-shaven, and he rode a pony. He rode erect, too, with the easy seat of an army officer. At sight of the girl he raised his battered hat and swept it low to his pony's shoulder as he bent in a profound bow. I seek the major domo, senorita, he said. Mr. Grayson is up at the office, that little building to the left of the ranch house, replied the girl, pointing. The newcomer had addressed her in Spanish, and he heard her reply in pure and liquid English. His eyes widened a trifle, but the familiar smile with which he had greeted her left his face, and his parting bow was much more dignified, though no less profound than his predecessor. And you, my sweet Penelope, out there somewhere you wait for me, with buds of roses in your hair and kisses on your mouth. Grayson and his employer both looked up as the words of Nib's poem floated into them through the open window. "'I wonder where that blew in from,' remarked Grayson, as his eyes discovered Bridge astride the tired pony, looking at him through the window. A polite smile touched the stranger's lips as his eyes met Grayson's, and then wandered past him to the imposing figure of the Easterner. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' said Bridge. "'Evening,' snapped Grayson. "'Go over to the cookhouse, and the chink will get you something to eat. Turn your pony in the lower pasture.' Smith will show you where to bunk tonight, and you can have your breakfast in the morning. So long, the ranch superintendent turned back to the paper in his hand, which he had been discussing with his employer at the moment of the interruption. He had volleyed his instructions at bridge, as though pouring a rain of lead from a machine gun. Now that he had said what he had to say, the incident was closed, in so far as he was concerned. The hospitality of the southwest permitted no stranger to be turned away without food and a nice lodging. Grayson, having arranged for these, felt that he had done all that might be expected of a host, especially when the uninvited guest was so obviously a hobo, and doubtless a horse thief as well, for whoever knew a hobo to own a horse. Bridge continued to sit where he had reined in his pony. He was looking at Grayson with what the discerning boss judged to be politely concealed enjoyment. Possibly, suggested the boss in a whisper to his aide, the man has business with you. You did not ask him, and I'm sure he said nothing about the wishing of a meal or a place to sleep. Huh? grunted Grayson, and then to Bridge, well, what the devil do you want? A job, replied Bridge, or to be more explicit, I need a job. Far be it for me to wish one. The Easterner smiled. Grayson looked a bit mystified and irritated. Well, I ain't got none, he snapped. We don't need nobody now unless it might be a good puncher, one who can rope and ride. I can ride, replied Bridge, 
as an evidence by the fact that you now see me astride a horse. I said ride, said Grayson. Any fool can sit on a horse. No, I ain't got nothing, and I'm busy now. Hold on, he exclaimed as though seized by a sudden inspiration. He looked sharply at Bridge for a moment, and then shook his head sadly. No, I'm afraid you couldn't do it. The guy's got to be educated for the job I got in mind. Washing dishes, suggested Bridge. Grayson ignored the playfulness of the other's question. Keeping books, he explained. There was a finality in his tone which said, as of course you cannot keep books, the interview is now over, get out. I could try, said Bridge. I can read and write, you know. Let me try. Bridge wanted money for the trip to Rio, and, too, he wanted to stay in the country until Billy was ready to leave. Savvy Spanish? asked Grayson. I read and write it better than I speak it, said Bridge, though I do the latter well enough to get along anywhere that it is spoken. Grayson wanted the bookkeeper worse than he can ever recall having wanted anything before in his life. His better judgment told him that it was the height of idiocy to employ a ragged bum as a bookkeeper, but the bum was at least as much of a hope to him as is a straw to a drowning man, and so Grayson clutched at him. Go and turn your cayuse in, and then come back here, he directed, and I'll give you a tryout. Thanks, said Bridge, and rode off in the direction of the pasture gate. Freddy won't never do, said Grayson ruefully, after Bridge had passed out of the earshot. I'd rather imagine that he will, said the boss. He's an educated man, Grayson. You can tell that from his English, which is excellent. He's probably one of the great army of down-and-outers. This world is full of them, poor devils. Give him a chance, Grayson. And anyway, he adds another American to our force, and each one counts. Yes, that's right. But I hope you won't need him before you and Miss Barbara go, said Grayson. I hope not, Grayson, but one can never tell with conditions here such as they are. Have you any hope that you will be able to obtain a safe conduct for us from General Villa? Oh, Villa will give us the paper, all right, said Grayson, but it won't do us no good unless we don't meet nobody but Villa man on the way out. This here Peseta is the critter I'm leery of. He's got it in for all Americans, and especially for El Robo Ranch. You know, we beat off a raid of his about six months ago, killed about half a dozen of his men, and he won't never forgive that. Villa can't spare a big enough force to give a safe escort to the border, and he can't assure the safety of our train service. It looks mighty bad, sir. I don't see what in hell you came for. Neither do I, Grayson, agreed the boss, but I'm here and we've got to make the best of this. All this may blow over. It has before, and we'll laugh at our fears in a few weeks. This thing that's happening now won't never blow over till the stars and stripes blow over Chihuahua, said Grayson with finality. A few moments later, Bridge returned to the office, having unsaddled his pony, and turned it to the pasture. "'What's your name?' asked Grayson, preparing to enter it in the time book. "'Bridge,' replied the new bookkeeper. "'Initials?' snapped Grayson. Bridge hesitated. "'Oh, put me down as L. Bridge,' he said. "'Where from?' asked the ranch foreman. "'L. Orobo Ranch,' answered Bridge. Grayson shot a quick look at the man. The answer confirmed his suspicions that the stranger was probably a horse thief which, in Grayson's estimation, was the worst thing a man can be. "'Where did you get that pony you came in on?' he demanded. "'I ain't saying nothing, of course, but I just want to tell you that we ain't got no use for horse thieves here.' The Easterner, who had been listening, was shocked by the brutality of Grayson's speech, but Bridge only laughed. "'If you must know, I never bought that horse, and the man he belonged to didn't give it to me. I just took it.' "'You got your nerve,' growled Grayson. "'I guess you'd better get out. We don't want no horse thieves here.' wait interposed the boss this man doesn't act like a horse thief a horse thief i should imagine was scarcely admit his guilt let's have his story before we judge him all right said grayson but he just admitted he stole the horse bridge turned to the boss thanks he said but really i did steal the horse grayson made a gesture which said see i told you so it was like this went on bridge the gentleman who owned the horse together with some of his friends had been shooting at me and my friends when it was all over, there was no one left to inform us who were the legal heirs of the late owners of this and several other horses, which were left upon our hands. So I borrowed this one. The law would say, doubtless, that I had stolen it, but I am perfectly willing to return it to the rightful owners if someone will find them for me. You been in the scrap? asked Grayson. Who with? A party of Pesada's men, replied Bridge. When? Yesterday. You see, they are working pretty close, said Grayson to his employer, and then to Bridge. Well, if you took the cayuse from one of Peseta's bunch, you can't call that stealing. Your room's in there, back of the office, and you'll find some clothes there that the last man forgot to take with him. You can have them, and from the looks of yours, you need them. Thank you, replied Bridge. My clothes are a bit rusty. I shall have to speak to James about them, and he passed through into the little bedroom off the office, 
and closed the door behind them. James, cried Grayson. Who the devil does he mean by James? I ain't seen but one of them. The boss was laughing quietly. The man's a character, he said. He'll be worth all you pay him, if you can appreciate him, which I doubt, Grayson. I can appreciate him if he can keep books, replied Grayson. That's all I ask of him. When Bridge emerged from the bedroom, he was clothed in white duck trousers, a soft shirt, and a pair of tennis shoes. And such a change had they wrought in his appearance that neither Grayson nor his employer would have known him had they not seen him come from the room into which he had just sent him to make an exchange of clothing. Feel better? asked the boss, smiling. Clothes are but an incident with me, replied Bridge. I wear them because it is easier to do so than it would be to dodge the weather and the police. Whatever I may have upon my back affects in no way what I have within my head. No, I cannot say that I feel any better, since these clothes are not as comfortable as my old ones. However, if it pleases Mr. Grayson that I should wear a pink kimono while working for him, I shall gladly wear a pink kimono. What shall I do first? The question was directed toward Grayson. Sit down here and see what you can make of this bunch of trouble, replied the foreman. I'll talk with you again this evening. As Grayson and his employer quitted the office and walked together toward the corrals, the latter's brow was corrugated by thought, and his facial expression that of one who labors to fasten upon a baffling and elusive recollection. It beats all, Grayson, he said presently, but I am sure that I have known this new bookkeeper of yours before. The moment he came out of that room dressed like a human being, I knew that I had known him. But for the life of me, I can't place him. I should be willing to wager considerable, however, that his name is not Bridge. Speck, you're right, assented Grayson. He's probably one of them eastern dude bank clerks that's gone wrong and come down here to hide. Mighty fine place to hide just now, too. And speaking of banks, he went on, what'll I do about sending over to Kovaka for the pay tomorrow? Next day's payday. I don't like to send this here bum. I can't trust the greaser no better, and I can't spare none of my white men that I can trust. Send him with a couple of the most trustworthy Mexicans you have, suggested the boss. There ain't no such critter, replied Grayson, but I guess it's the best I can do. I'll send him along with Tony and Benito. They hate each other too much to frame up anything together, and they both hate a gringo. Chapter 10 of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Billy Cracks a Safe. Billy Byrne, Captain, rode into Quovaca from the south. He had made a wide detour in order to accomplish this, but under the circumstances he had thought it wise to do so. In his pocket was a safe conduct from one of Villa's generals farther south, a safe conduct taken by Peseta from the body of one of the recent victims. It would explain Billy's presence in Quivaca, since it had been intended to carry its rightful possessor to Juarez and across the border into the United States. He found the military establishment at Quivaca small and ill-commanded. There were soldiers upon the streets, but the only regularly detailed guard was stationed in front of the bank. No one questioned Billy. He did not have to show his safe conduct. This looks easy, thought Billy. A regular skinch. He first attended to his horse, turning him into a public corral, and then sauntered up the street to the bank, which he entered, still unquestioned. Inside he had changed a bill of large denomination which Peseta had given him for the purpose of an excuse to examine the lay of the bank from the inside. Billy took a long time to count the change. All the time his eyes wandered about the interior, while he made mental notes of such salient features as might prove of moment to him later. The money counted, Billy slowly rolled a cigarette. He saw that the bank was roughly divided into two sections by a wire and wood partition. On one side were the customers, on the other the clerks and the teller. The latter sat behind a small wicket through which he received deposits and cash checks. Back of him, against the wall, stood a large safe of American manufacture. Billy had had business before with similar safes. A doorway in the rear wall led into the yard behind the building. It was closed by a heavy door, covered with sheet iron, and fastened by several bolts and a thick, strong bar. There were no windows in the rear wall. From that side the bank appeared almost impregnable to silent assault. Inside everything was primitive, and Billy found himself wondering how a week passed without seeing a bank robbery in the town. Possibly the strong rear defenses and the armed guard in front accounted for it. Satisfied with what he had learned, he passed out into the sidewalk and crossed the street to the saloon. 
Some soldiers and citizens were drinking at little tables in front of the bar. A couple of card games were in progress, and through the open rear doorway Billy saw a little gathering encircling a cockfight. In none of these things was Billy interested. What he had wished in entering the saloon was merely an excuse to place himself upon the opposite side of the street from the bank that he might inspect the front from the outside without arousing suspicion. Having purchased and drunk a bottle of poor beer, the temperature of which had probably never been below eighty since it left the bottling department of the Texas brewery which inflicted it upon the ignorant, he sauntered to the front window and looked out. There he saw that the bank building was a two-story affair, the entrance to the second story being at the left side of the first floor, opening directly onto the sidewalk in full view of the sentry who paced to and fro before the structure. Billy wondered what the second floor was utilized for. He saw soiled hangings at the window which aroused a hope and a sudden inspiration. There was a sign above the entrance to the second floor, but Billy's knowledge of the language had not progressed sufficiently to permit him to translate it, although he had his suspicions as to its meaning. He would learn if his guess was correct. Returning to the bar, he ordered another bottle of beer. As he drank it, he practiced upon the bartender some of his recently acquired Spanish, and learned, though not without considerable difficulty, that he might find lodgings for the night upon the second floor of the bank building. Much elated, Billy left the saloon and walked along the street until he came to the one general store of the town. After another heart-rending scrimmage with the language of Ferdinand and Isabella, he succeeded in making several purchases. Two heavy sacks, a brace, two bits, and a keyhole saw. Placing the tools in one of the sacks, he wrapped the hole in the second sack and made his way back to the bank building. Upon the second floor he found the proprietor of the rooming house and engaged a room in the rear of the building overlooking the yard. The layout was eminently satisfactory to Captain Byrne, and it was with a feeling of great satisfaction that he descended and sought a restaurant. He had been sent by Pesetta merely to look over the ground and the defenses of the town, that the outlaw might later ride in with his entire force and loot the bank. But Billy Byrne, out of his past experience in such matters, had evolved a much simpler plan for separating the enemy from his wealth. Having eaten, Billy returned to his room. It was now dark, and the bank, closed and unlighted, showed all that had left it. Only the sentry paced up and down the sidewalk in front. Going at once to his room, Billy withdrew his tools from their hiding place beneath the mattress, and a moment later was busily engaged in boring holes through the floor at the foot of the bed. For an hour he worked, cautiously and quietly, until he had a rough circle of holes enclosing a space of about two feet in diameter. Then he laid aside the brace and bit, and took the keyhole saw, which he patiently sawed through the wood between contiguous holes, until the circle completed. He lifted out a section of the floor, leaving an aperture large enough to permit him to squeeze his body through when the time arrived for him to pass into the bank beneath. While Billy had worked, three men had ridden into Quivaca. They were Tony, Benito, and the new bookkeeper of El Robo Rancho. The Mexicans, after eating, repaired at once to the joys of the cantina while Bridge sought a room in the building to which his escort directed him. As chance would have it, it was the same building in which Billy labored, and a room lay upon the rear side of it overlooking the same yard. But Bridge did not lie awake to inspect his surroundings. For years he had not ridden as many miles as he had during the past two days, so that long, unused muscles cried out for rest and relaxation. As a result, Bridge was asleep almost as soon as his head touched the pillow, and so profound was his slumber that it seemed that nothing short of convulsion of nature would arouse him. As Bridge lay down upon his bed, Billy Byrne left his room and descended to the street. The sentry before the bank paid no attention to him, and Billy passed along, unhindered, to the corral where he had left his horse. Here, as he was saddling the animal, he was accosted, much to his disgust, by the proprietor. In broken English, the man expressed surprise that Billy rode out so late at night, and the American thought that he detected something more than curiosity in the other's manner and tone, suspicion of the strange gringo. It would never do to leave the fellow in that state of mind, and so Billy, leaned close to the other's ear with a broad grin and a wink, whispered, Senorita, and jerked his thumb toward the south. I'll be back by morning, he said. The Mexican's manner altered at once. He laughed and nodded, knowingly, and poked Billy in the ribs. Then he watched him mount and ride out of the corral toward the south, which was also in the direction of the bank, to the rear of which Billy rode without effort to conceal his movements. There he dismounted and left his horse standing with the bridle reins dragging upon the ground, while he removed the lariat from the pommel of the saddle, and, stuffing it inside his shirt, walked back to the street on which the building stood, and so made his way past the sentry to his room. 
Here he pushed back the bed which he had drawn over the hole in the floor, dropped his two sacks through into the bank, and tying the brace to one end of the lariat, lowered it through after the sacks. Looping the middle of the lariat over a bedpost, Billy grasped both strands firmly and lowered himself through the aperture into the room beneath. He had made no more noise in his descent than he had made upon other similar occasions in his past life, when he had practiced the gentle art of porch climbing along Ashland Avenue and Washington Boulevard. Having gained the floor, he pulled upon one end of the lariat until he had drawn it free of the bedpost above, when it fell into his waiting hands. Coiling it carefully, Billy placed it around his neck and under one arm. Billy, acting as a professional, was a careful and methodical man. He always saw that every little detail was properly attended to before he went to the next phase of his endeavors. Because of this ingrained caution, Billy had long since secured the tops of the two sacks together, leaving only a sufficient opening to permit of their each being filled without delay or inconvenience. Now he turned his attention to the rear door. The bar and bolts were easily shot from their seats from inside and Billy saw to it that this was attended to before he went further with his labors. It were well to have one's retreat assured at the earliest possible moment. A single bolt Billy left in place that he might not be surprised by an intruder, but first he had tested it and discovered it to be drawn with ease. These matters satisfactorily attended to, Billy assaulted the combination knob of the safe with a metal bit which he had inserted in the brace before lowering it into the bank. The work was hard and progressed slowly. It was necessary to withdraw the bit often and lubricate it with a piece of soap which Billy had brought along in his pocket for the purpose, but eventually a hole was bored through into the tumblers of the combination lock. From without, Billy could hear the footsteps of the sentry passing back and forth within fifty feet of him. All unconscious that the bank he was guarding was being looted almost beneath his eyes. Once a corporal came with another soldier and relieved the sentry. After that, Billy heard the footfalls no longer, for the new sentry was barefoot. The boring finished, Billy drew a piece of wire from an inside pocket and inserted it into the hole. Then, working the wire with accustomed fingers, he turned the combination knob this way and that, feeling with a bit of wire until the tumblers should all be in line. This, too, was slow work, but it was infinitely less liable to attract attention than any other method of safe-cracking with which Billy was familiar. It was long past midnight when Captain Byrne was rewarded with success. The tumblers clicked into position. The handle of the safe door turned, and the bolts slipped back. To swing open the door and transfer the contents of the safe to the two sacks was the work of but a few minutes. As Billy rose and threw the heavy burden across his shoulder, he heard a challenge from without, and then a parley. Immediately after the sound of footsteps ascending the stairway to the rooming house came plainly to his ears, and then he had slipped the last bolt upon the rear door and was out into the yard beyond. Now Bridge, sleeping the sleep of utter exhaustion that the boom of a cannon might not have disturbed, did that inexplicable thing which every one of us has done a hundred times in our lives. He awakened, with a start, out of a sound sleep, though no disturbing noise had reached his ears. Something impelled him to sit up in bed, and as he did so he could see through the window beside him into the yard and into the rear of the building. There in the moonlight he saw a man throwing a sack across a horn of a saddle. He saw the man mount and he saw him wheel his horse around about and ride away toward the north. There seemed to Bridge nothing unusual about the man's act, nor had there been any indication either of stealth or haste to arouse the American suspicions. Bridge lay back again upon his pillows and sought to woo the slumber which this sudden awakening seemed to have banished for the remainder of the night. And up the stairway to the second floor staggered Tony and Benito. Their money was gone, but they had acquired something else which appeared much more difficult to carry and not so easily gotten rid of. Tony held the key to the room. It was the second room upon the right of the hall. Tony remembered that very distinctly. He had impressed it upon his mind before leaving the room earlier in the evening, for Tony had feared some such contingency as that which had befallen. Tony fumbled with the handle of the door, and stabbed vainly at the elusive keyhole. Wait, mumbled Benito. This is not the room. It was the second door from the stairway, and this is the third. Tony lurched about and staggered back. Tony reasoned, if that was the third door, the next behind me must be the second, and on the right. But Tony took not into consideration that he had reversed the direction of his erratic wobbling. He lunged across the hall, not because he wished to, but because the spirits moved him. He came in contact with the door. This, then, must be the second door, he soliloquized. And it is upon my right. Ah, Benito, this is the room. Benito was skeptical. He said as much, but Tony was obdurate. Did he not know a second door when he saw one? 
was he furthermore not a grown man and therefore entirely capable of distinguishing between his left hand and his right yes tony was all of that and more so tony inserted the key in the lock it would have turned any lock upon the second floor and lo the door swung inward upon its hinges ah benito cried tony did i not tell you see this is our room for the key opens the door the room was dark tony carried forward by the weight of his head which had long since grown unaccountably heavy rushed his feet rapidly forward that he might keep them within a few inches of his center of equilibrium the distance which it took his feet to catch up to his head was equal to the distance between the doorway and the foot of the bed and when tony reached that spot with benito meandering after him the latter much to his astonishment saw in the diffused moonlight which pervaded the room the miraculous disappearance of his former enemy and erstwhile friend then from the depths below came a wild scream and a heavy thud the sentry upon the beat before the bank heard both for an instant he stood motionless then he called aloud for a guard and turned toward the bank door but this was locked and he could but peer into the windows seeing a dark form within and being a mexican he raised his rifle and fired through the glass of the doors tony who had dropped through the hole which billy had used so quietly heard the zing of the bullet pass his head and the impact of it splashed into the adobe wall behind him with a second yell tony dodged behind the safe and besought mary to protect him from above the needle peered through the hole into the blackness below down the hall came the barefoot landlord awakened by the screams and the shot behind him came bridge buckling his revolver belt around his hips as he ran not having been furnished with pajamas bridge had not thought it necessary to remove his clothing and so he had lost no time in dressing when the two now joined by benito reached the street they found the guard there battering in the bank doors benito fearing for the life of tony which if anyone took should be taken by him rushed upon the sergeant of the guards explaining with both his lips and hands the remarkable accident which had precipitated tony into the bank the sergeant listened though he did not believe and when the doors had fallen in he commanded tony to come out with his hands above his head then followed an investigation which disclosed the looting of the safe and the great hole in the ceiling which through tony had tumbled the bank president came while the sergeant and the landlord were in billy's room investigating bridge had followed them it was the gringo cried the excited boniface this is his room he has cut a hole in my floor which i shall have to pay to have repaired the captain came next sleepy-eyed and profane when he heard what had happened and that the wealth with which he had been detailed to guard had been taken while he slept he tore his hair and promised that the sentry should be shot at dawn by the time they had returned to the street all the male population of corvaca was there and most of the female one thousand dollars cried the bank president to the man who stops the thief and returns to me what the villain has stolen a detachment of soldiers was in the saddle and passing the bank as the offer was made which way did he go asked the captain did no one see him leave bridge was upon the point of saying that he had seen him and that he had ridden north when it occurred to him that a thousand dollars even a thousand dollars max was a great deal of money and that it would carry both himself and billy to rio and leave something for pleasure beside then up spoke a tall thin man with the skin of a coffee bean i saw him senior captain he cried he kept his horse in my corral and at night he came and took it out saying he was riding to visit the senorita he fooled me the scoundrel but i'll tell you he rode south i saw him ride south with my own eyes then we shall have him before morning cried the captain for there is one place to the south where a robber would ride and he has not had sufficient start of us that he can reach safely before we overhaul him forward march and the detachment moved down the narrow street trot march and as they passed the store gallop march bridge almost ran the length of the street to the corral his pony must be rested by now and a few miles to the north the gringo whose capture meant a thousand dollars to bridge was on the road to liberty i hate to do it thought bridge because even if he is a bank robber he's an american but i need the money and in all probability the fellow is a scoundrel who should have been hanged long ago over the trail to the north rode captain billy byrne secured in the belief that no pursuit would develop until after the opening hour of the bank in the morning by which time he would be halfway to his return journey to Pesita's camp old man Pesita would be surprised when i show him what i got for him mused billy say he exclaimed suddenly and aloud why the devil should i take all this swag back to the yellow-faced yegg who pulled the thing off anyway why me of course and does anybody think billy burns boob enough to split with the guy that didn't have a hand in it at all split why didn't muddle take it all 
Nix, me for the border. I couldn't do a thing with all this coin down in Rio, and Bridge'll be along there most of the time. We can hit it up some in little old Rio on this bunch of dough. Why, say, kid, there must be a million here for the weight of it. A frown suddenly clouded his face. Why did I take it? he asked himself. Was I cracking a safe, or was I pulling off something for poor old bleeding Mexico? If I was a doing that, they ain't nothing criminal in what I'd done, except the guy that owned the coin. If I was just plain cracking a safe on my own hook, why then I'm a crook again, and I can't be that. No, nah, not with the face of yours standing out there so plain right in front of me, just as though as you were there yourself, asking me to remember and be decent. God! Barbara, why wasn't I born for the likes of you, and not just a measly ordinary mucker like I am? Ah, oh, hell, what is that that Bridge sings of nibs? There ain't no sweet Penelope somewhere that's longin' much for me, but I can smell the blundering sea and hear in the riggin' hum, and I can hear the whispering lips that fly before the outbound ships, and I can hear the breakers of the sand a-callin' come. Billy took off his hat and scratched his head. Funny, he thought how a girl and poetry can get out a tough nut like me. I wonder what the guys that used to hang out in back of Kelly's would say if they seen what was going through my bean just now. They'd call me Lizzie, eh? Though no, they wouldn't call me Liz me more than once. I may be getting soft in the head, but I'm all to the good with my dukes. Speed is not conductive to sentimental thoughts, and so Billy had unconsciously permitted his pony to drop into a lazy walk. There was no need for haste anyway. No one knew yet that the bank had been robbed, or at least so Billy argued. He might, however, have thought differently upon the subject of haste, if he had had a glimpse of the horseman in his rear, two miles behind him now, but rapidly closing up the distance at a keen gallop, while he strained his eyes across the moonlit flat ahead in eager search for his quarry. So absorbed was Billy Byrne in his reflections that his ears were deaf to the pounding of the hoofs of the pursuer's horse upon the soft dust of the dry road until Bridge was little more than a hundred yards from him. For the last half-mile, Bridge had had the figure of the fugitive in full view, and his mind had been playing rapidly with seductive visions of one thousand dollars reward. One thousand dollars max, perhaps, but still quite enough to excite pleasant thoughts. At the first glimpse of the horseman ahead, Bridge had reined his mount down to a trot, that the noise of his approach might thereby be lessened. He had drawn his revolver from its holster, and was upon the point of putting spurs to his horse for the sudden dash upon the fugitive, when the man ahead, finally attracted to the noise of the other's approach, turned in his saddle, and saw him. Neither recognized the other, and at Bridge's command of, Hands up! Billy, lightning-like in his quickness, drew and fired. The bullet raked Bridge's hat from his head, but left him unscathed. Billy had wheeled his pony around until he stood broadside toward Bridge. The latter had fired scarce a second after Billy shot at pinged so perilously close, fired at a perfect target, but fifty yards away. At the sound of the report, the robber's horse reared and plunged, then, wheeling and tottering high upon its hind feet, fell backwards. Billy, realizing that his mount had been hit, tried to throw himself from the saddle, but until the very moment that the beast toppled over, the man was held by his cartridge belt, which, as the animal first lunged, had caught over the high horn of the Mexican saddle. The belt slipped from the horn as the horse was falling, and Billy succeeded in throwing himself a little to one side. One leg, however, was pinned beneath the animal's body and the force of the fall jarred the revolver from Billy's hand to drop just beyond his reach. His carbine was in his boot at the horse's side, and the animal was lying upon it. Instantly Bridge rode to his side and covered him with his revolver. Don't move, he commanded, or I'll be under the painful necessity of terminating your earthly endeavors right here and now. Well, for the love of Mike, cried the fallen bandit, you! Bridge was off his horse the instant that a familiar voice sounded in his ears. Billy, he exclaimed. Why, Billy, was it you that robbed the bank? Even as he spoke, Bridge was busy easing the weight of the dead pony from Billy's leg. Anything broken, he asked, as the bandit struggled to free himself. Not so as you can notice it, replied Billy, and a moment later he was on his feet. Say, Bo, he added, it's a mighty good thing you dropped the little pinto here, for I'd have sure got you the next shot. Gee, it makes me sweat to think of it. But about this bank robbing business, you can't exactly say that I robbed a bank. That money was the enemy's resources, and I just nicked their resources. That's war. That ain't robbery. I ain't taking it for myself. It's for the cause. The cause of poor bleeding Mexico. And Billy grinned a large grin. You took it for Peseda? asked Bridge. Of course, replied Billy. And we'll get a jitney of it. I won't take none of it, Bridge. Honest. I'm on the square now. 
I know you are, Billy, replied the other, but if you're caught you might find it difficult to convince the authorities of your high-mindedness and your disinterestedness. Authorities, scoffed Billy, there ain't no authorities in Mexico. One bandit is just as good as the other, and from Peseda to Carranza they're all bandits at heart. There ain't a one of them that gives two whoops in hell for poor bleeding Mexico, unless they can do the bleeding themselves. It's doggy dog here, and if they caught me they'd shoot me whether I'd rob the bank or not. What's that? Billy was suddenly alert, straining his eyes back in the direction of Covaca. They're coming, Billy, said Bridge. Take my horse. Quick. You must get out of here in a hurry. The whole post is searching for you. I thought that they went toward the south. Some of them must have circled. What do you do if I take your horse? asked Billy. I can walk back, said Bridge. It isn't far to town. I'll tell them I have come only a short distance when my horse threw me and ran away. They'll believe it, for they think I'm a rotten horseman. The two vaqueros who escorted me to town, I mean. Billy hesitated. I hate to do it, Bridge, he said. You must, Billy, urged the other. If they find us here together, it'll merely mean that the two of us will get it. For I'll stick with you, Billy, and we can't fight off a whole troop of cavalry out here in the open. If you take my horse, we can both get out of it, and later I'll see you in Rio. Goodbye, Billy. I'm off for town. And Bridge turned and started back along the road on foot. Billy watched him in silence for the moment. The truth of Bridge's statement of fact was so apparent that Billy was forced to accept the plan. A moment later he transferred the bags of loot to Bridge's pony, swung onto the saddle, and took a last backward look at the diminishing figure of the man swinging along in the direction of Covaca. Say, he muttered to himself. Chapter 11 of Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Barbara Releases a Conspirator. It was a week later, yet Grayson was still growling about the loss of that there Brazos pony. Grayson, the boss, and the boss's daughter were sitting upon the veranda of the ranch house when the foreman reverted to the subject. I knew I didn't have no business hiring a man that can't ride, he said. Why, that there Brazos pony never did stumble, and if he'd have stumbled, he'd have stood around a year waiting to be caught up again. I just can't figure it out no ways of that there tender for bookkeeper lost him. He must have shooed him away with a stick, and saddle and bridle and all gone too. Doggone it! I'm the one who should be peeved, spoke up the girl with a wry smile. Brazos was my pony. He's the one you picked out for me to ride while I am here. But I'm sure poor Mr. Bridge feels as badly about it as anyone and I know that he couldn't help it. We shouldn't be too hard on him. We might just as well attempt to hold him responsible for the looting of the bank and the loss of the payroll money. Well, said Grayson, I gave him that horse, cause I knew he couldn't ride it, and that was the safest in the cavy. I wished I'd give him Santa Anna instead. I wouldn't mind losing him. They won't know and ride him anyhow. He's that ornery. The thing that surprises me the most, remarked the boss, is that Brazos doesn't come back. He was foaled on this range. He's never been ridden anywhere else, has he? He was foaled right here in this ranch, Grayson corrected him, and he ain't never been more than a hundred miles from it. If he ain't dead or stolen, he'd have been back before bookkeeper was. It's almighty queer. What sort of bookkeeper is Mr. Bridge? asked the girl. Oh, he's all right, I guess, replied Grayson grudgingly. A fellow's got to be some good at something. He's probably one of these here paper-collar, cracker-fed college dudes that don't know nothing except writing in books. The girl rose, smiled, and moved away. I like Mr. Bridge anyhow, she called back over her shoulder, for whatever he may not be, he is certainly a well-bred gentleman, which speech did not tend to raise Mr. Bridge in the estimation of the hard-fisted ranch foreman. Funny them greasers don't come in from the north range with that bunch of steers. They've been gone all day now, he said to the boss, ignoring the girl's parting sally. Bridge sat tip-tilted against the front of the office building, reading an ancient magazine which he had found within. His day's work was done, and he was but waiting for the gang that would call him into the evening meal with the other employees of the ranch. The magazine failed to rouse his interest. He let it drop idly to his knees, and with eyes closed reverted to his never-failing source of entertainment. And that there slim, poetic guy, he turned and looked me in the eye. It's overland and overland and overseas to where? Most anywhere that isn't here, I says. His face went kind of queer. This place we're in is always here. The other place is there. 
Bridge stretched luxuriously. There, he repeated. I've been searching for there for many years, but for some reason I can never get away from here. I've got two weeks of any place on earth, and that place is just plain here to me, and I'm longing once again for there. His musings were interrupted by a sweet feminine voice close by. Bridge did not open his eyes at once. He just sat there listening. As I was hiking past the woods, the cool and sleepy summer woods, I saw a guy talking to the sunshine in the air. Thinks I, he's going to have a fit. I'll stick around and watch a bit. But he paid no attention, hardly knowing I was there. Then the girl broke into a merry laugh, and Bridge opened his eyes and came to his feet. I didn't know you cared for that sort of stuff, he said. Nibs writes man verse. I shouldn't have imagined that it would appeal to a young lady. But it does, though, she replied, at least to me. There's a swing to it, and a freedom that gets me in the eye. Again she laughed, and when this girl laughed, hard-headed and much older men like Mr. L. Bridge felt strange emotions move within their breasts. For a week Barbara had seen a great deal of the new bookkeeper. Aside from her father, he was the only man of culture and refinement of which the rancho could boast, or, as the rancho would have put it, be ashamed of. She had often sought the veranda of the little office and lured the bookkeeper from his work and on several occasions had had him at the ranch house. Not only was he an interesting talker, but there was an element of mystery about him which appealed to the girl's sense of romance. She knew that he was a gentleman born and reared, and she had often found herself wondering what tragic train of circumstances had set him adrift among the flotsam of humanity's wreckage. Two, the same persistent conviction that she had known him somewhere in the past that possessed her father clung to her mind, and she could not place him. I overheard your dissertation of here and there, said the girl. I cannot very well help it. It would have been rude to interrupt the conversation. Her eyes sparkled mischievously, and her cheeks dimpled. You wouldn't have been interrupting a conversation, objected Bridge, smiling. You would have been turning a monologue into a conversation. But it was a conversation, insisted the girl. The wanderer was conversing with the bookkeeper. You are a victim of wanderlust, Mr. L. Bridge. Don't deny it. You hate bookkeeping, or any other such prosaic vocation as requires permanent residence in one place. Come now, expostulated the man. That is hardly fair. Haven't I been here a whole week? They both laughed. What in the world could have induced you to remain so long? cried Barbara. How very much like an old-timer you must feel, one of the oldest inhabitants. I'm a regular aborigine, declared Bridge, but his heart would have chosen another reply. It would have been glad to tell the girl that there was a real reason and a very growing inducement to remain in El Robo Rancho. The man was too self-controlled, however, to give way to the impulses of his heart. At first he had just liked the girl, and been immensely glad of her companionship because there was so much that was common to them both, a love for good music, good pictures, and good literature. Things Bridge hadn't had an opportunity to discuss with another for a long, long time and slowly he had found delight in just sitting and looking at her. He was experienced enough to realize that this was a dangerous symptom, and so from the moment that he had been forced to acknowledge it to himself, he had been very careful to guard his speech and his manner in the girl's presence. He found pleasure in dreaming of what might have been, as he sat watching the girl's changing expression as different moods possessed her, but as for permitting a hope, even, of realization of his dreams, ah, he was far too practical for that, dreamer though he was. As the two talked, Grayson passed, his rather stern face clouded as he saw the girl and the new bookkeeper laughing there together. "'Ain't you got nothing to do?' he asked Bridge. "'Yes, indeed,' replied the latter. "'Then why don't you do it?' snapped Grayson. "'I am,' said Bridge. "'Mr. Bridge is entertaining me,' interrupted the girl, before Grayson could make any rejoinder. "'It is my fault. I took him from his work. "'You don't mind, do you, Mr. Grayson?' Grayson mumbled an inarticulate reply and went his way. Mr. Grayson does not seem particularly enthusiastic about me, laughed Bridge. No, replied the girl candidly, but I think it's just because you can't ride. Can't ride, ejaculated Bridge. Why, haven't I been riding ever since I came here? Mr. Grayson doesn't consider anything in the way of equestrianism riding, unless the ridden is perpetually seeking the life of the rider, explained Barbara. Just at present he is terribly put out because you lost Brazos. He said Brazos never stumbled in his life, and even if you had fallen from his back, he would have stood beside you, waiting for you to remount him. You see, he was the kindest horse on the ranch, especially picked for me to ride. However in the world did you lose him, Mr. Bridge? The girl was looking full at the man as she propounded her query. Bridge was silent. 
a faint flush overspread his face he had not before known that the horse was hers he couldn't very well tell her the truth and he wouldn't lie to her so he made no reply barbara saw the flush and noted the man's silence for the first time her suspicions were aroused yet she would not believe that this gentle amiable drifter could be guilty of any crime greater than negligence or carelessness but why is evident embarrassment now the girl was mystified for a moment or two they sat in silence then barbara rose i must run along back now she explained papa will be wondering what has become of me yes said bridge and let her go he would have been glad to tell her the truth but he couldn't do that without betraying billy he had heard enough to know that francisco villa had been so angered over the bold looting of the bank in the face of the company of his own soldiers that he would stop at nothing to secure the person of the thief once his identity was known bridge was perfectly satisfied with the ethics of his own act on the night of the bank robbery he knew that the girl would have applauded him and that grayson himself would have done what bridge did had a like emergency confronted the ranch foreman but to have admitted complicity in the escape of the fugitive would have been to have exposed himself to the wrath of villa and at the same time revealed the identity of the thief nor thought bridge would he get brazos back for barbara it was after dark when the vaqueros grayson had sent in the north range returned to the ranch they came empty-handed and slowly for one of them supported a wounded comrade on the saddle before him they rode directly to the office where grayson and bridge were going over some of the business of the day and when the former saw them his brow clouded for he knew before he had heard their story what had happened who done it he asked as the men filed into the office half carrying the wounded man some of peseta's followers replied benito did they give the steers too inquired grayson part of them we drove off most and scattered them we saw the brazos pony too and benito looked from beneath heavy lashes in the direction of the bookkeeper where asked grayson one of peseta's officers rode him an americano tony and i saw the same man in cuivaca the night the bank was robbed and today he was riding the brazos pony again the dark eyes turned toward bridge grayson was quick to catch the significance of the mexican's meaning the more so as it was directly in line with the suspicions which he himself had been nursing since the robbery during the colloquy the boss entered the office he had heard the return of vaqueros ride into the ranch and noted that they brought no steers with him had come to the office to hear their story barbara spurred by curiosity accompanied her father you heard what benito says asked grayson turning toward his employer the latter nodded all eyes were upon bridge well snapped grayson what you to say for yourself i've been suspecting you right along i knew durned well that that there brazos pony never run off by itself you and that other crook from the states framed this whole thing up pretty slick didn't you well we'll wait a minute wait a minute grayson interrupted the boss give mr bridge a chance to explain you're making a rather serious charge against him without any particular strong proof to back your accusation oh that's all right exclaimed bridge with a smile i have known that mr grayson suspected me of implication in the robbery but who can blame him a man who can't ride may be guilty of almost anything grayson sniffed barbara took a step nearer bridge she had been ready to doubt him himself only an hour or so ago but that was before he had been accused now that she found others arrayed against him her impulses were to come to his defense you didn't do it did you mr bridge her tone was almost pleading if you mean robbing the bank he replied i did not miss barbara I knew no more about it until after it was over than Benito or Tony. In fact, they were the ones who discovered it while I was still asleep in my room above the bank. Well, how did the robber get that there Brazos pony, then? demanded Grayson savagely. That's what I want to know. You'll have to ask him, Mr. Grayson, replied Bridge. Via'd ask him when he gets hold of him, snapped Grayson. But I reckon he'll get all the information out of you that he wants first. He'll be in Cuivaca tomorrow, and so will you. You mean that you're going to turn me over to General Villa? asked Bridge. You're going to turn an American over to that butcher, knowing that he'll be shot inside of twenty-four hours? Shooting's too damn good for a horse thief, replied Grayson. Barbara turned impulsively toward her father. You won't let Mr. Grayson do that? she asked. Mr. Grayson knows best how to handle such affairs as this, Barbara, replied her father. He is my superintendent, and I've made it a point never to interfere with him you will let mr bridge be shot without making an effort to save him she demanded we do not know that he will be shot replied the ranch owner if he is innocent there is no reason why he should be punished if he is guilty of implication in the Covaca bank robbery he deserves according to the rules of war to die for general villa i am told considers that a treasonable act 
Some of the funds upon which his government depends for the munitions of war were there. They were stolen and turned over to the enemies of Mexico. If we interfere, we'll turn Villa against us, interposed Grayson. He ain't any too keen for Americans as it is. Well, if this fellow was my brother, I'd have to turn him over to the authorities. Well, I thank God, exclaimed Bridge fervently, that in addition to being shot by Villa, I don't have to endure the added disgrace of being related to you, and I'm not so sure that I should be hanged by Villa. And with that he wiped the oil lamp from the table against which he had been leaning, and leapt across the room for the doorway. Barbara and her father had been standing nearest the exit, and as the girl realized the bold break for liberty the man was making, she pushed her father to one side and threw open the door. Bridge was through it in an instant with a parting, God bless you, little girl, as he passed her. Then the door was closed with a bang. Barbara turned the key, withdrew it from the lock, and threw it across the darkened room. Grayson and the unwounded Mexicans leapt after the fugitive only to find it their way barred by the locked door. Outside, Bridge ran to the horses standing patiently with lowered heads awaiting the return of their masters. In an instant he was astride one of them, and lashing the others ahead of him with a quirt he spurred away into the night. By the time Grayson and the Mexicans had wormed their way through one of the small windows of the office, the new bookkeeper was beyond sight and earshot. As the ranch foreman was saddling up with several of his men in the corral to give chase to the fugitive, the boss strolled in and touched him on the arm. Mr. Grayson, he said, I have made it the point never to interfere with you, but I am going to ask you now not to pursue Mr. Bridge. I shall be glad if he makes good his escape. Barbara was right. He is a fellow American. We cannot turn him over to Villa, or any other Mexican to be murdered. Grumblingly, Grayson unsaddled. If you've seen what I've seen around here, he said, I guess you wouldn't be so keen to save this feller's hide. What do you mean? asked the boss. I mean he's been trying to make love to your daughter. The older man laughed. Don't be a fool, Grayson, he said, and walked away. An hour later, Barbara was strolling up and down before the ranch house in the cool and refreshing air of the Chihuahua night. Her mind was occupied with disquieting reflections of the past few hours. Her pride was immeasurably hurt by the part impulse had forced her to take in the affair at the office. Not that she regretted that she had connived in the escape of Bridge, but it was humiliating that a girl of her position should have been compelled to play so melodramatic a part before Grayson and his Mexican vaqueros. Then, too, was she disappointed in Bridge. She had looked upon him as a gentleman whose misfortune and wanderlust had reduced to the low stratum of society. Now she feared that he belonged to that substratum which lies below the lowest which society recognizes as a part of itself, and which is composed solely of the criminal class. It was hard for Barbara to realize that she had associated with a thief. Just for a moment it was hard, until recollection forced her upon the unwelcome fact of the status of another whom she had known, to whom she had given her love. The girl did not wince at the thought. Instead, she squared her shoulders and raised her chin. I am proud of him, whatever he may have been, she murmured, but she was not thinking of the new bookkeeper. When she did think again of Bridge, it was to be glad that he had escaped, for he is an American, like myself. Well, exclaimed a voice behind her, you played us a pretty trick, Miss Barbara. The girl turned to see Grayson approaching. To her surprise, he seemed to hold no resentment whatsoever. She greeted him courteously. I couldn't let you turn an American over to General Villa, she said, no matter what he had done. I like your spirit, said the man. You're the kind of girl I've been looking for all my life. One with nerve and grit. You got em both. You liked that bookkeeper critter, and he wasn't half a man. I like you, and I am a man, if I do say so myself. The girl drew back in astonishment. Mr. Grayson, she exclaimed, you are forgetting yourself. No, I ain't, he cried hoarsely. I love you, and I'm going to have you. You'd love me, too, if you knew me better. He took a step forward and grasped her arm, trying to draw her to him. The girl pushed him away with one hand, and with the other struck him across the face. Grayson dropped her arm, and as he did so, she drew herself to her full height and looked him straight in the eyes. You may go now, she said, her voice like ice. I shall never speak of this to anyone, provided you never attempt to repeat it. He made no reply. The blow in the face had cooled his ardor temporarily, but had it not also served another purpose? Chapter 12 of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Billy to the Rescue. It was nearly ten o'clock the following morning when Barbara, 
sitting upon the veranda of the ranch house saw her father approaching from the direction of the office his face wore a troubled expression which the girl could not but note what's the matter papa she asked as he sank into a chair at her side your self-sacrifice of last evening was all to no avail he replied bridge has been captured by villistas what cried the girl you can't mean it how did you learn grayson just had a phone message from corbaca he explained they only repaired the line yesterday since Pesita's men cut it last month. This was our first message, and do you know, Barbara, I can't help feeling sorry. I had hoped that he would get away. So had I, said the girl. Her father was eyeing her closely to note the effect of the announcement upon her, but he could see no greater concern reflected than that which he himself felt for a fellow man and an American who was doomed to death in the hands of an alien race, far from his own land and his own people. Can nothing be done? she asked absolutely he replied with finality i have talked him over with grayson and he assures me that an attempt at intervention upon our part might tend to antagonize villa in which case we are all as good as lost he is none too fond of us as it is and grayson believes and not without reason that he would welcome the slightest pretext for withdrawing the protection of his favor instantly he did that we should become the prey of every marauding band that infests the mountains not only would Peseta swoop down upon us but those companies of freebooters which acknowledge nominal loyalty to villa would be about our ears in no time no dear we may do nothing the young man has made his bed and now i am afraid they will have to lie in it alone for a while the girl sat in silence and presently her father arose and entered the house shortly after she followed him reappearing soon in riding togs and walking rapidly to the corrals here she found an american cowboy busily engaged in whittling a stick as he sat upon an upturned cracker box and shot accurate streams of tobacco juice at a couple of industrious tumble bugs that had had the great impudence to roll their little balls of provender within the whittler's range oh eddie she cried the man looked up and was at once electrified into action he sprang to his feet and whipped off his sombrero a broad smile illuminated his freckled face yes miss he answered what can i do for you saddle a pony for me eddie she explained i want to take a little ride sure he assured her cheerily have it ready in a jiffy and away he went uncoiling his riata toward a little group of saddle ponies which stood in the corral against necessity for instant use in a couple of minutes he came back leading one which he tied to the corral bars but i can't ride that horse exclaimed the girl he bucks sure said eddie i'm a-goin to ride him oh are you going somewhere she asked i'm a-goin with you miss announced eddie sheepishly but i didn't ask you eddie and i don't want you to-day she urged sorry miss he threw back over his shoulder and he walked back to rope his second pony but them's orders you're not allowed to ride no place without an escort twouldn't be safe neither miss he almost pleaded and i won't hinder you none i'll ride behind far enough to be there if you need directly he came back with another pony a sad-eyed gentle appearing little beast and commenced saddling and bridling the two will you promise she asked after watching him in silence for a time that you will tell no one where i go or whom i see Cross my heart, hope to die, he assured her. All right, Eddie, then I'll let you come with me, and you can ride beside me instead of behind. Across the flat they rode, following the windings of the river road, one mile, two, five, ten. Eddie had long since been wondering what the purpose of so steady a pace could be. This was no pleasure ride in which took the boss's daughter. Heifer, Eddie would have called her. Ten miles up river at a hard trot. Eddie was worried, too. They had passed the danger line and were well within the stamping grounds of Peseta and his retainers. Here each little adobe dwelling, and they were scattered at intervals of a mile or more along the river, contained a rabid partisan of Peseta, or it contained no one. Peseta had seen to this latter condition personally. At last the young lady drew rein before a squalid and dilapidated hut. Eddie gasped. It was Jose's, and Jose was a notorious scoundrel whom old age alone kept from the active pursuit of the only calling he had ever known brigandage why should the boss's daughter come to jose jose was hand in glove with every cutthroat in chihuahua or at least within a radius of two hundred miles of his abode barbara swung herself from the saddle and handed her bridle reins to eddie hold him please she said i'll be gone but a moment you're not going in there to see old jose alone gasped eddie why not she asked if you're afraid you can leave my horse and ride along home eddie colored to the roots of his sandy hair and kept silent the girl approached the doorway of the mean hovel and peered within at one end sat a bent old man smoking he looked up as barbara's figure darkened the doorway 
Jose, said the girl. The old man rose to his feet and came toward her. Eh, senorita, eh? he cackled. You are Jose? she asked. Si, sí, senora, replied the old Indian. What can poor old Jose do to serve the beautiful senorita? You can carry a message to one of Pesita's officers, replied the girl. I have heard much about you since I came to Mexico. I know that there is not another man in this part of Chihuahua who may so easily reach Peseta as you. She raised her hand for silence, as the Indian would have protested. Then she reached into the pocket of her riding breeches and withdrew a handful of silver which she permitted to trickle tinklingly from one palm to the other. I wish you to go to the camp of Peseta, she continued, and carry word to a man who robbed the bank at Cuevaca. He is an American that his friend, Senor Bridge, has been captured by Villa and is being held for execution in Cuevaca. You must go at once. You must get word to Senor Bridge's friend so that help may reach Senor Bridge before dawn. Do you understand? The Indian nodded assent. Here, said the girl, is a payment on account. When I know that you have delivered the message in time, you shall have as much more. Will you do it? I will try, said the Indian, and stretched forth a claw-like hand for the money. Good, exclaimed Barbara. Now start at once, and she dropped the silver coins in the old man's palm. It was dusk when Captain Billy Byrne was summoned to the tent of Peseta. There he found the weazened old Indian squatting at the side of the outlaw. Jose, said Peseta, has word for you. Billy Byrne turned questioningly toward the Indian. I have been sent, senor captain, explained Jose, by the beautiful senorita of El Robo Rancho to tell you that your friend, senor Bridge, has been captured by General Villa and is being held at Cuevaca where he will doubtless be shot, if help does not reach him before tomorrow morning. Peseta was looking questioningly at Byrne. Since the gringo had returned from Cuevaca with the loot of the bank and turned the last penny of it over to him, the outlaw had looked upon his new captain as something just short of superhuman, to have robbed the bank thus easily, while Villa's soldiers paced back and forth before the doorway, seemed little short of an indication of miraculous powers, while to have turned the loot over intact to his chief, not asking for so much as a peso of it, was absolutely incredible. Peseta could not understand this man, but he admired him greatly and feared him, too. Such a man was worth a hundred of the ordinary run of humanity that enlisted beneath Peseta's banners. Byrne had but to ask a favor to have it granted, and now, when he called upon Peseta to furnish him with a suitable force for the rescue of Bridge, the brigand enthusiastically acceded to his demands. "'I will come,' he exclaimed, "'and all my men shall ride with me. We will take Quivaca by storm.' We may even capture Villa himself. Wait a minute, Bo, interrupted Billy Byrne. Don't get excited. I'm looking to get my pal out in Quivaca. After that, I don't care who you capture, but I'm going to get Bridgie out first. I can do it with twenty-five men, if it ain't too late. Then if you want to, you can shoot up the town. Let me have the twenty-five, and you hang around the edges with the rest of them till I'm done. What do you say? Peseta was willing to agree to anything and so it came that half an hour later Billy Byrne was leading a choice selection of some two dozen cutthroats down through the hills toward Cuevaca, while a couple of miles in the rear followed Peseta with the balance of his band. Billy rode until the few remaining lights of Cuevaca shone but a short distance ahead, and they could hear plainly the strains of a grating graphophone from beyond the open windows of a dance hall, and the voices of the sentries as they called the hour. "'Stay here,' said Billy to his sergeant at his side, "'until you hear the—' Stay here, said Billy to the sergeant at his side, until you hear the hoot owl cry three times from the direction of the barracks and the guardhouse. Then charge the opposite end of the town, firing off your carbines like hell and yelling your heads off. Make all the racket you can, and keep it up until you get em coming in your direction, see? Then turn and drop back slowly, egging em on, but holding em to it as long as you can. Do you get me, Bo? From the mixture of Spanish and English and Grand Avenueish. The sergeant gleaned enough of the intent of his commander to permit him to salute and admit that he understood what was required of him. Having given his instructions, Billy Byrne rode off to the west, circled Cuevaca, and came close up to the southern edge of the little village. Here he dismounted and left his horse hidden among the outbuilding, while he crept cautiously forward to reconnoiter. He knew that the force within the village had no reason to fear attack. Villa knew where the main bodies of his enemies lay, and that no force could approach Cuevaca without a word of its coming reaching the garrison many hours in advance of the foe. That Peseta, or another of the several bandit chiefs in the neighborhood, would dare descend upon the garrison town, never for a moment entered the calculations of the rebel leader. For these reasons, Billy argued that Cuevaca would be poorly guarded. On the night he had spent there, he had seen sentries before the bank, 
the guardhouse, and the barracks, in addition to one who paced to and fro in front of the house in which the commander of the garrison maintained his headquarters. Aside from these, the town was unguarded. Nor were conditions different tonight. Billy came within a hundred yards of the guardhouse before he discovered a sentinel. The fellow lolled upon his gun in front of the building, an adobe structure in the rear of the barracks. The other three sides of the guardhouse appeared to be unwatched. Billy threw himself upon his stomach and crawled slowly forward, stopping often. The sentry seemed asleep. He did not move. Billy reached the shadow at the side of the structure and some fifty feet from the soldier without detection. Then he rose to his feet directly beneath the barred window. Within, Bridge paced back and forth the length of the little building. He could not sleep. Tomorrow he was to be shot. Bridge did not wish to die. That very morning, General Villa in person had examined him. The general had been exceedingly wroth. The sting of the theft of his funds still irritated him, but he had given Bridge no inkling as to his fate. It had remained for a fellow prisoner to do that. This man, a deserter, was to be shot, so he said, with Bridge, a fact which gave him an additional twenty-four hours of life, since, he asserted, General Villa wished to be elsewhere than in Quivaca when an American was executed. Thus he could disclaim responsibility for the act. The general was to depart in the morning. Shortly after, Bridge and the deserter would be led out and blindfolded before a stone wall, if there was such a thing, or a brick wall, or an adobe wall. It made little difference to the deserter, or to Bridge either. The wall was but a trivial factor. It might go far to add romance to whomever should read of the affair later, but in so far as Bridge and the deserter were concerned, it meant nothing. A billboard, thought Bridge, bearing the slogan. Eventually, why not now? would have been equally as efficacious and far more appropriate. The room in which he was confined was stuffy with the odor of accumulated filth. Two small barred windows alone gave means of ventilation. He and the deserter were the only prisoners. The latter slept as soundly as though the morrow held nothing more momentous in his destiny than any of the days which had preceded it. Bridge was moved to kick the fellow into consciousness of his impending fate. Instead, he walked to the south window to fill his lungs with the free air beyond the prison pen and gaze sorrowfully in the starlit sky, which she should never again behold. In a low tone, Bridge crooned a snatch of the poem that he and Billy liked best. And you, my sweet Penelope, out there somewhere you wait for me, with buds of roses in your hair and kisses on your mouth. Bridge's mental vision was concentrated upon the veranda of a white-walled ranch house to the east. He shook his head angrily. It's just as well, he thought. She's not for me. Something moved upon the ground beyond the window. Bridge became suddenly intent upon the thing. He saw it rise and resolve itself into the figure of a man, and then, in a low whisper, came a familiar voice. There ain't no roses in my hair, but there's a barker in my shirt, and another at me side. Here's one of them. They got kisses beat a city block. How's the door of this thing fastened? The speaker was put close to the window now, his face but a few inches from Bridge's. Billy! ejaculated the condemned man. Surest thing you know. But about the door? Just a heavy bar on the outside, replied Bridge. Easy, commented Billy, relieved. Get ready to beat it when I open the door. I've got a pony south of town that'll have to carry double for a little way tonight. God bless you, Billy, whispered Bridge fervently. Lay low a few minutes, said Billy, and moved away toward the rear of the guardhouse. A few minutes later there broke upon the night air the dismal hoot of an owl. At intervals of a few seconds it was repeated twice. The sentry before the guardhouse shifted his position and looked about. Then he settled back, transferring his weight to the other foot, and resumed his bovine meditations. The man at the rear of the guardhouse moved silently along the side of the structure until he stood within a few feet of the unsuspecting sentinel, hidden from him by the corner of the building. A heavy revolver dangled from his right hand. He held it loosely by the barrel and waited. For five minutes the silence of the night was unbroken. Then from the east came a single shot followed immediately by the scattering fusillade and a chorus of hoarse cries. Billy Byrne smiled. The sentry resumed indications of quickness. From the barracks beyond the guardhouse came sharp commands and the sound of men running. From the opposite end of the town the noise of battle welled up to ominous proportions. Billy heard the soldiers stream from their quarters, and a moment later saw them trot up the street at the double. Everyone was moving toward the opposite end of the town except the lone sentinel before the guardhouse. The moment seemed propitious for his attempt. Billy peered around the corner of the guardhouse. Conditions were just as he had pictured they would be. The sentry stood gazing in the direction of the firing, his back toward the guardhouse door, and Billy. With a bound, the American cleared the space between himself and the unsuspecting and unfortunate soldier. 
the butt of the heavy revolver fell almost noiselessly upon the back of the sentry's head and the man sank to the ground without even a moan turning to the door billy knocked the bar from its place the door swung in and bridge slipped through to liberty quick said billy follow me and turned at a rapid run toward the south edge of the town he made no effort now to conceal his movements speed was the only essential and the two covered the ground swiftly and openly without any attempt to take advantage of cover they reached billy's horse unnoticed and a moment later they were trotting toward the west to circle the town and regain the trail to the north and safety to the east they heard the diminishing rifle fire of the combatants as Pesada's men fell steadily back before the defenders and drew them away from Cuivaca in accordance with Billy's plan. Like taking candy from a baby, said Billy, when the flickering lights of Cuivaca shone to the south of them, and the road ahead lay clear to the rendezvous of the brigands. Yes, agreed Bridge. But what I'd like to know, Billy, is how you found out I was there. Penelope, said Byrne, laughing. Penelope, queried Bridge. I'm not at all sure that I follow you, Billy. Well, seeing as you're sitting on behind, you can't be leading me, returned Billy. But cutting the kid, it was a skirt tipped it off to me where you was. The beautiful senorita of El Robo Rancho, I think it was they called her. Now are you hep? Bridge gave an exclamation of astonishment. God bless her, he said. She did that for me? She sure did, Billy assured him. And I bet an iron case she's waiting for you with those buds of roses in her hair and kisses on her mouth, you old son of a gun, you. Billy laughed happily. He was happy, anyway, at having rescued Bridge, and the knowledge that his friend was in love, and that the girl reciprocated his affection, all of which Billy assumed as the only explanation of her interest in Bridge, only added to his joy. "'She ain't a greaser, is she?' he asked presently. "'I should say not,' replied Bridge. "'She's a perfect queen from New York City, but, Billy, she's not for me. What she did was prompted by a generous heart. She couldn't care for me, Billy. Her father is a wealthy man.' He could have the pick of the land, of many lands, if she cared to marry. You don't think for a minute she'd want a hobo, do you? You can't most always tell, replied Billy, a trifle sadly. I knew such a queen once, who would have chosen a mucker, if he'd a let her. You're stuck on her, old man? I'm afraid I am, Billy, Bridge admitted. But what's the use? Let's forget it. Oh, say, is this the horse I'd let you take the night you robbed the bank? Yes, said Billy, same little pony, and a mighty well-behaved one, too. Why? It's her, said Bridge. And she wants it back? She didn't say so, but I'd like to get it to her some way, said Bridge. You can ride it back when you go, suggested Billy. But I can't go back, said Bridge. It was Grayson, the foreman, who made it so hot for me I had to leave. He tried to arrest me and send me to Villa. What for? asked Billy. He didn't like me and wanted to get rid of me. Bridge wouldn't say that his relations with Billy had brought him into trouble. Oh, well, I'll take it back myself, then. At the same time, I'll tell Penelope what a regular fellow you are, and a punch in the foreman's face for good luck. No, you mustn't go there. They know you now. It was some of El Robo's men you shot up day before yesterday when you took their steers from them. They recognized the pony, and one of them had seen you in Quivaca the night of the robbery. They would be sure to get you, Billy. Shortly, the two came in touch with the retreating pesitistas who were riding slowly toward the mountain camp. The pursuers had long since given up the chase, fearing that they might be being lured into the midst of a greater superior force, and had returned to Corvaca. It was nearly morning when Bridge and Billy threw themselves down. Chapter 13 of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Barbara again. Captain Billy Byrne rode out of the hills the following afternoon, upon a pinto pony that showed the whites of its eyes and a wicked rim around the iris, and kept its ears perpetually flattened backwards. At the end of a lariat trailed the Brazos pony, for Billy, laughing aside Bridges' pleas, was on his way to El Arobo Rancho to return the stolen horse to its fair owner. At the moment of departure, Pesita had asked Billy to ride by way of Jose's to instruct the old Indian that he should bear word to one Esteban that Pesita required his presence. It is a long ride from the retreat of the Pesitistas to Jose's squalid hut, especially if one be leading an extra horse, and so it was that darkness had fallen long before Billy arrived in sight of Jose's. Dismounting some distance from the hut, Billy approached cautiously, since the world is filled with dangers for those who are beyond the law and one may not be too careful. 
Billy could see a light showing through a small window, and toward this he made his way. A short distance from Jose's is another, larger structure, from which the former inhabitants had fled the wrath of Pesita. It was dark and apparently tenantless, but as a matter of fact a pair of eyes chanced at the very moment of Billy's coming to be looking out through the open doorway. The owner turned and spoke to someone behind him. Jose has another visitor, he said. Possibly this one is less harmless than the other. He comes with great caution. Let us investigate. Three other men rose from their blankets upon the floor and joined the speaker. They were all armed and clothed in the nondescript uniforms of the Eastas. Billy's back was toward them as they sneaked from the hut in which they were intending to spend the night and crept quietly toward him. Billy was busily engaged in peering through the little window into the interior of the old Indian's hovel. He saw an American in earnest conversation with Jose. Who could the man be? Billy did not recognize him, but presently Jose answered the question. It shall be done as you wish, Senor Grayson, he said. Ah, thought Billy, the foreman of El Robo. I wonder what business he has with the old scoundrel, and at night. What other thoughts Billy might have had upon the subject were rudely interrupted by four energetic gentlemen in their rear, who leaped upon him simultaneously and dragged him to the ground. Billy made no outcry but he fought none the less strenuously for his freedom, and he fought after the manner of Grand Avenue, which is not a pretty, however effective, way it may be. But four against one, when all the advantages lie with the four, are heavy odds, and when Grayson and Jose ran out to investigate, and the ranch foreman added his weight to that of the others, Billy was finally subdued. That each of his antagonists would carry mementos of the battle for many days was slight compensation for the loss of liberty. However, it was some. After disarming their captive and tying his hands at his back, they jerked him to his feet and examined him. "'Who are you?' asked Grayson. "'What are you doing sneaking around, spying on me, eh?' "'If you want to know who I am, Bo,' replied Billy, "'go ask the Harlem Hurricane. And as for spying on yous, I wasn't. But from the looks I guess yous need spying, the tin horn. A pony we need a short distance from the hut. That must be his horse at one of the vistas and walked away to investigate, returning shortly after with the pinto pony and Brazos. The moment Grayson saw the latter, he gave an exclamation of understanding. I know him now, he said. You've made a good catch, Sergeant. This is a fellow who robbed the bank at Corvaca. I recognize him from the descriptions I've had of him, and the fact that he's got the Brazos pony makes it a cinch. Villa ought to promote you for this. Yep, interjected Billy. He ought to make use an admiral at least. But you ain't got me home yet, and they'll take more than four dagoes and a tin horn to do it. They'll get you there all right, my friend, Grayson assured him. Now come along. They bundled Billy into his own saddle, and shortly after the little party was winding southward along the river in the direction of El Orobo Rancho, with the intention of putting up there for the balance of the night where their prisoner could be properly secured and guarded. As they rode away from the dilapidated hut of the Indian, the old man stood silhouetted against the rectangle of dim light which marked the open doorway, and shook his fist at the back of the departing ranch foreman. El Cochino, he cackled, and turned back into the hut. At El Robo Rancho, Barbara walked to and fro outside the ranch house. Within, her father sat reading beneath the rays of an oil lamp. From the quarters of the men came the strains of guitar music, and an occasional loud laugh indicated the climax of some of Eddie Shorter's famous Kansas farmer stories. Barbara was upon the point of returning indoors when her attention was attracted by the approach of a half a dozen horsemen. They reined into the ranch yard and dismounted before the office building. Wondering a little who came so late, Barbara entered the house, mentioning casually to her father that which she had seen. The ranch owner, now always fearful of attack, was upon the point of investigating when Grayson rode up to the veranda and dismounted. Barbara and her father were at the door as he ascended the steps. "'Good news!' exclaimed the foreman. I've got the bank robber, and Brazos, too. Caught the sneaking coyote up to, up the river a bit. He had almost said Jose's, but caught himself in time. Someone's been cutting the wire at the north side of the north pasture, and I was riding up to see if I can catch him at it, he explained. He's an American, asked the boss. Looks like it, but he's at the heart of a greaser, replied Grayson. Some of these men are with me, and they're going to take him to Corvaca tomorrow. Neither Barbara nor her father seemed to enthuse much. To them, an American was an American here in Mexico, where every hand was against the race. That at home they might have looked with disgust upon the same man did not alter their attitude here. 
that no American should take sides against his own people. Barbara said as much to Grayson. "'Why, this fellow's one of Pesetta's officers,' exclaimed Grayson. "'He don't deserve no sympathy from us, nor from no other Americans. Pesetta has sworn to kill every American that falls into his hands, and this fellow's with him to help him do it. He's a batter. "'I can't help what he may do,' insisted Barbara. "'He's an American, and I for one would never be a party to his death at the hands of a Mexican.' and it will mean death to him to be taken to Cuivaca. "'Well, miss,' said Grayson, "'you won't have to be responsible. I'll take all the responsibility there is, and welcome. I just thought you'd like to know we had him.' He was addressing his employer. The latter nodded, and Grayson turned and left the room. Outside he cast a sneering laugh back over his shoulder and swung it to his saddle. In front of the men's quarters he drew rein again and shouted Eddie's name. Shorter came to the door. Get your six-shooter and a rifle, and come over to the office. I want to see you a minute. Eddie did as he was bid, and when he entered the little room he saw four Mexicans lolling about, smoking cigarettes, while Grayson stood before a chair in which sat a man with his arms tied behind his back. Grayson turned to Eddie. This party here is the slick on that robbed the bank, and got away on that there Brazos pony that miserable bookkeeping dude give him. The sergeant here and his men are going to take him to Covaca in the morning. You stand guard over him till midnight. Then they'll relieve you. They gotta get some sleep first, though, and I gotta get some supper. Don't stand for no funny business now, Eddie. Grayson admonished him and was on the point of leaving the office when a thought occurred to him. Say, Shorter, he said, there ain't no way of getting out of the little bedroom and back there except through this room. The windows are too small for a big man to get through. I tell you what, we'll lock him up in there, and then you won't have to worry none, and neither will we. We can just spread out them Navajos there and go to sleep plump again a door, and there won't nobody have to relieve you all night. Sure, said Eddie. Leave it to me. I'll watch the slicker. Satisfied that the prisoner was safe the night, the Vistas and Grayson departed, after seeing him safely locked in the back room. At the mention by the foreman of his guard's names, Eddie and Shorter, Billy had studied the face of the young American cowpuncher for the two names had aroused within his memory a tantalizing suggestion that they should be very familiar. Yet he could connect them in no way with anyone he had known in the past, and he was quite sure he was never before had set eyes upon this man. Sitting in the dark, with nothing to occupy him, Billy let his mind dwell upon the identity of his jailer, until, as may have happened to you, nothing in the whole world seemed equally as important as the solution to the mystery. Even his impending fate faded into nothingness by comparison with the momentous question as to where he had heard the name Eddie Shorter before. As he sat puzzling his brain over the inconsequential matter, something stirred upon the floor close to his feet, and presently he jerked back a booted foot that a rat had commenced to gnaw upon. Hell of a place to stick a guy, mused Billy, and with a bunch of men-eating rats. Hey! And he turned his face toward the door. You, Eddie, come here. Eddie approached the door and listened. "'What do you want?' he asked. "'None of your funny business, you know. "'I'm from Shawnee, Kansas, I am, "'and they don't come no slicker from nowhere on earth. "'You can't fool me. "'Shawnee, Kansas. "'Eddie Shorter.' "'The whole puzzle cleared in Billy's mind in an instant. "'So you're Eddie Shorter of Shawnee, Kansas, are you?' called Billy. "'Well, I know your ma, Eddie, "'and if I had such a ma as you got, "'I wouldn't be down here wasting my time "'working alongside a lot of dagos. "'But that ain't what I started to say.' which was that I want a light in here. The goddamn rats are trying to chaw off me kicks, and when they're done with them, they'll climb up after me, and old man Villa would be sore as a pup. You know my ma? asked Eddie, and there was a wistful note in his voice. Aw, oh, shucks, you don't know her. That's just some of your funny slicker business. You want to get me in there, they're going to try to get around me some sort of way to let you escape, but I'm too slick for that. On the level, Eddie, I know your ma, persisted Billy. I've been in your ma's house just a few weeks ago. Remember the horsehair sofa between the windows? Remember the Bible on a little marble top table? Eh? And Tiege? Well, Tiege is croaked, but your ma and your pa ain't, and they want you back, Eddie. I don't care if you believe me, son, or not, but your ma was mighty good to me, and you promise me that you'll write her, and then go back home as fast as you can. It ain't everybody's got a swell ma like that, and then that is ought to be good to em. Beyond the closed door, Eddie's jaw was commencing to tremble. Memory was flooding his heart and his eyes with sweet recollections of an ample breast where he used to pillow his head, of a big, capable hand that was wont to smooth his brow and stroke back his red hair. Eddie gulped. "'You ain't joshing me?' he asked. Billy Byrne caught the tremor in his voice. "'I ain't kidding you, son,' he said. 
what in hell do you take me for one of those greasy dagoes you and i are americans i wouldn't string a home guy down here in this godforsaken neck of the woods billy heard the lock turn and a moment later the door was cautiously opened revealing eddie safely ensconced between two six-shooters that's right eddie said billy with a laugh don't you take no chances no matter how much sob stuff i hand you fur i'll give it to you straight if i get the chance i'll make my getaway but i can't do it with my flippers trust and you with a brace of gas sitting on me let's have a light eddie that won't do nobody any harm and it might discourage the rats eddie backed across the office to a table where stood a small lamp keeping an eye through the door on his prisoner he lighted the lamp and carried it into the back room setting it upon a commode which stood in one corner you really seen ma he asked is she well looks well when i seen her said billy but she wants her boy back a whole lot i guess she'd look better if he walked in there some day i'll do it cried eddie the minute they get money for the pay i'll hike tell me your name i'll ask her if she remembers you when i get home gee but i wish i was walking in that front door now she never knew my name said billy but you tell her you seen the bow that must up the two yeggmen who rolled on her and they were trying to croak her with a butcher's knife i guess she ain't forgot me and my pal were beating it he was on the square but the dicks was after me and she let us have money to make our getaway she's all right kid there came a knock on the outer office door eddie sprang back into the front room closing and locking the door behind him just as barbara entered eddie she asked may i see the prisoner i want to talk to him you want to talk with a bank robber exclaimed eddie why you ain't crazy are you miss barbara no i'm not crazy but i want to speak with him alone for a minute eddie please eddie hesitated he knew that grayson would be angry if he let the boss's daughter into that back room alone with an outlaw and a robber and the boss himself would probably be inclined to have eddie drawn and quartered but it was hard to refuse miss barbara anything where is he she asked eddie jerked her thumb in the direction of the door the key was still in the lock go to the window and look at the moon eddie suggested the girl it's perfectly gorgeous tonight please eddie as he still hesitated eddie shook his head and moved slowly toward the window there can't be nobody refusing you nothing miss he said especially when you got your heart set on it that's a dear eddie purred the girl and moved swiftly across the room to the locked door as she turned the key in the lock she felt a little shiver of nervous excitement run through her what sort of man would he be this hardened outlaw and robber this renegade american who had cast his lot with the avowed enemies of his own people she wondered only her desire to learn of bridge's fate urged her to attempt so distasteful an interview but she dared not ask another to put the question for her since should her complicity in bridge's escape provided of course that he had escaped become known to villa the fate of the americans at el robo would be definitely sealed she turned the knob and pushed the door open slowly a man was sitting in a chair in the center of the room his back was toward her he was a big man his broad shoulders loomed immense about the back of the rude chair a shock of black hair rumpled and tussled covered a well-shaped head at the sound of the door creaking upon its hinges he turned his face in her direction and as his eyes met hers all four went wide in surprise and incredulity billy she cried barbara you and billy rose to his feet his bound hand struggling to be free the girl closed the door behind her and crossed to him you robbed the bank billy she asked it was you after the promises you made me to live straight always for my sake her voice trembled with emotion the man could see that she suffered and yet he felt his own anguish too but you were married he said i saw it in the papers what do you care now barbara i'm nothing to you i'm not married billy she cried i couldn't marry mr mallory i tried to make myself believe that i could but at last i knew that i did not love him and never could and i wouldn't marry a man i didn't love i never dreamed that it was you here billy she went on i came to ask you about mr bridge i wanted to know if he escaped or if if oh this awful country they think no more of human life here than a butcher thinks of the life of the animal he dresses a sudden light illuminated billy's mind why had it not occurred to him before this was bridge's penelope the woman he loved was loved by his best friend and she had sent a messenger to him to billy to save her lover she had come here to the office tonight to question a stranger a man she thought an outlaw and a robber because she could not rest without word from the man she loved billy stiffened he was hurt to the bottom of his heart but he did not blame bridge it was fate nor did he blame barbara because she loved bridge bridge was more her kind anyway he was a college guy billy was only a mucker 
Bridge got away all right, he said, and say, he didn't have nothing to do with pulling off that safe cracking. I done it myself. He didn't know I was in town, and I didn't know he was there. He's the squarest guy in the world, Bridge is. He followed me that night and took a shot at me, thinking I was the robber all right, but not knowing it was me. He got my horse, and when he found it was me, he made me take your pony and make my getaway, for he knew Villa's men would croak me sure if they caught me. You can't blame him for that, can you? Him and I are good pals. He couldn't do nothing else. It was him that made me bring your pony back to you. It's in the crowd now, I reckon. I was just a-bringing it back when they got me. Now you better go. This ain't no place for you, and I ain't had no sleep for so long I'm almost dead. His tones were cool. He appeared bored by her company, though as a matter of fact his heart was breaking with love for her. Love that he believed unrequited, and he yearned to tear loose his bonds and crush her in his arms. It was Barbara's turn now to be heard. She drew herself up. I am sorry I have disturbed your rest, she said, and walked away, her head in the air. But all the way back to the... Chapter 14 of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Twixt Love and Duty For an hour, Barbara Harding paced the veranda of the ranch house, pride and love battling for ascendancy within her breast. She could not let him die, that she knew. But how might she save him? The strains of music and the laughter from the bunkhouse had ceased. The ranch slept. Over the brow on the low bluff, upon the opposite side of the river, a little party of silent horsemen filed downward to the ford. At the bluff's foot, a barbed wire fence marked the eastern boundary of the ranch's enclosed fields. The foremost horsemen dismounted and cut the strands of wire, carrying them to one side from the path of the feet of the horses which now passed through the opening he had made. Down into the river they rode, following the ford even in the darkness with an assurance which indicated long familiarity. Then, through a fringe of willows out across a meadow toward the ranch buildings, the riders made their way. The manner of their approach, their utter silence, the hour, all contributed toward the sinister. Upon the veranda of the ranch house, Barbara Harding came to a sudden halt. Her entire manner indicated final decision and determination. A moment she stood in thought, and then ran quickly down the steps in the direction of the office. Here she found Eddie dozing at his post. She did not disturb him. A glance through the window satisfied her that he was alone with the prisoner. From the office building, Barbara passed on to the corral. A few horses stood within the enclosure, their heads drooping dejectedly. As she entered, they raised their muzzles and sniffed suspiciously, ears a cock. And as the girl approached closer to them, they moved warily away, snorting and passing around her to the opposite side of the corral. As they moved by her, she scrutinized them and her heart dropped, for Brazos was not among them. He must have been turned out into the pasture. She passed over to the bars that closed the opening from the corral into the pasture and wormed her way between two of them. A hackamore with a piece of halter rope attached to it hung across the upper bar. Taking it down, she moved off across the pasture in the direction the saddle horses most often took when liberated from the corral. If they had not crossed the river, she felt that she might find and catch Brazos for lumps of sugar and bits of bread had inspired in his equine soul a wondrous attachment for his temporary mistress. Down the beaten trail the animals had made to the river, the girl hurried, her eyes penetrating the darkness ahead, into either hand for the looming bulks that would be the horses she sought, and among which she might hope to discover the gentle little Brazos. The nearer she came to the river, the lower dropped her spirits, for as yet no sign of the animals was to be seen. To have attempted to place a hackamore upon any of the wild creatures in the corral would have been the height of foolishness. Only a well-sped riata in the hands of a strong man could have captured one of those. Closer and closer to the fringe of willows along the river she came, until, at their very edge, there broke upon her already taut nerves the hideous and uncanny scream of a wildcat. The girl stopped short in her tracks. She felt the chill of fear creep through her skin, and the twitching at the roots of her hair evidence to her the extremity of her terror. Should she turn back? The horses might be between her and the river, but judgment told her that they had crossed. Should she brave the nervous fright of a passage through that dark, forbidding labyrinth of gloom when she knew that she would not find the horses within reach beyond? She turned to retrace her steps. She must find another way. But was there another way? And tomorrow they will shoot him. 
She shuddered, bit her lower lip in an effort to command her courage, and then, wheeling, plunged into the thicket. Again the cat screamed, close by, but the girl never hesitated in her advance, and a few moments later she broke through the willows a dozen paces from the river bank. Her eyes strained through the night, but no horses were to be seen. The trail, cut by the hoofs of many animals, ran deep and straight down into the swirling water. Upon the opposite side, Brazos must be feeding or resting, just beyond reach. Barbara dug her nails into her palms in the bitterness of her disappointment. She followed down to the very edge of the water. It was black and forbidding. Even in the daytime, she would not have been confident of following the ford. By night, it would be madness to attempt it. She choked down a sob. Her shoulders drooped. Her head bent forward. She was the picture of disappointment and despair. What can I do? she moaned. Tomorrow they will shoot him. The thought seemed to electrify her. They shall not shoot him, she cried aloud. They shall not shoot him while I live to prevent it. Again her head was up and her shoulders squared. Tying the hackamore about her waist, she took a single deep breath of reassurance and stepped out into the river. For a dozen paces she found no difficulty in following the ford. It was broad and straight, but toward the center of the river, as she felt her way along a step at a time, she came to a place where directly before her the ledge upon which she crossed shelved off into deep water. She turned upward, trying to locate the direction of the new turn, but here, too, there was no footing. Down river she felt solid rock beneath her feet. Ah, this was the way, and boldly she stepped out, the water already above her knees. Two, three steps she took, and with each one her confidence and hope arose, and then the fourth step, and there was no footing. She felt herself lunging into the stream, and tried to draw back and regain the ledge, but the force of the current was too much for her, and so suddenly it seemed that she had thrown herself in, she was in the channel swimming for her life. The trend of the current there was back in the direction of the bank she had but just quitted, yet so strong was her determination to succeed for Billy Byrne's sake that she turned her face toward the opposite shore and fought to reach the seemingly impossible goal which love had set for her. Again and again she was swept under by the force of the current. Again and again she rose in battle, not for her own life, but for the life of the man she once had loathed and whom she had later come to love. Inch by inch she won toward the shore of her desire, and inch by inch of her progress she felt her strength failing. Could she win? Ah, if she were but a man, and with the thought came another. Thank God that I am a woman, with a woman's love, which gives strength to drive me in the clutches of death for his sake. Her heart thundered in tumultuous protest against the strain of her panting lungs. Her limbs felt cold and numb, but she could not give up, even though she was now convinced that she had thrown her life away uselessly. They would find her body, but no one would ever guess what had driven her to her death. Not even he would know that it was for his sake. And then she felt the tugging of the channel current suddenly lessen, and Eddie carried her gently inshore. Her feet touched the sand and gravel of the bottom. Gasping for breath, staggering, stumbling, she reeled on a few paces and then slipped down, clutching at the river's bank. Here the water was shallow, and here she lay until her strength returned. Then she urged herself up and onward, climbed to the top of the bank with success at last within reach. To find the horses now required but a few minutes' search. They stood huddled in a black mass close to the barbed wire fence at the extremity of the pasture. As she approached them, they commenced to separate slowly, edging away while they faced her in curiosity. Softly she called, Brazos, come Brazos until a unit of the moving mass detached itself and came toward her, nickering. Good Brazos, she cooed. That's a good pony, and walked forward to meet him. The animal let her reach up and stroke his forehead, while he muzzled about her for the expected tidbit. Gently she worked the hackamore over his nose and above his ears, and when it was safely in place, she breathed a deep sigh of relief, and throwing her arms about his neck, pressed her cheek into his. You dear old Brazos, she whispered. The horse stood quietly while the girl wriggled herself to his back, and then at a word and a touch from her heels moved off at a walk in the direction of the ford. The crossing this time was one of infinite ease, for Barbara let the rope lie loose and Brazos take his own way. Through the willows upon the opposite bank he shouldered his path across the meadow still at a walk, lest they arouse attention, and through a gate which led directly from the meadow into the ranch yard. Here she tied him to the outside of the corral while she went in search of saddle and bridle. Whose she took she did not know, nor care, but that the saddle was enormously heavy she was perfectly aware long before she had dragged it halfway to where Brazos stood. 
Three times she essayed to lift it to his back before she succeeded in accomplishing the Herculean task, and had it been any other horse upon the ranch than Brazos, the thing could never have been done. But the kindly little pony stood in statuesque resignation while the heavy Mexican tree was banged and thumping against his legs and ribs, until the lucky swing carried it to his withers. Saddled and bridled, Barbara led him to the rear of the building, and thus, by a roundabout way, to the back of the office building. Here she could see a light in the room in which Billy was confined, and after dropping the bridle reins to the ground, she made her way to the front of the structure. Peeping stealthily to the porch, she peered in at the window. Eddie was stretched out in cramped, loose-seeming luxury in an office chair. His feet were cocked up on a desk before him. In his lap lay his six-shooter, ready for an emergency. Another reposed in his holster at his belt. Barbara tiptoed to the door, holding her breath. She turned the knob gently. The door swung open without a sound, and an instant later she stood within the room. Again her eyes were fixed upon Eddie Shorter. She saw his nerveless fingers relax their hold upon the grip of his revolver. She saw the weapon slip further down into his lap. He did not move, other than to the deep and regular breathing of profound slumber. Barbara crossed to his side. Behind the ranch house, three figures crept forward in the shadows. Behind them, a matter of a hundred yards, stood a little clump of horses, and with them were the figures of more men. These waited in silence. The other three crept toward the house. It was such a ranch house as you might find by the scores of hundreds throughout Texas. Grayson, evidently, or some other Texan, had designed it. There was nothing Mexican about it, nor anything beautiful. It stood two-storied, verandahed, and hideous, a blot upon the soil of picturesque Mexico. To the roof of the veranda clambered the three prowlers, and across it to an open window. The window belonged to the bedroom of Miss Barbara Harding. Here they paused and listened, and two of them entered the room. They were gone for but a few minutes. When they emerged, they showed evidences by their gestures to the third man who had waited outside of disgust and disappointment. Cautiously they descended as they had come and made their way back to those other men who had remained with the horses. Here they ensued a low-toned conference, and while it progressed, Barbara Harding reached forth a steady hand which belied the terror in her soul and plucked the revolver from Eddie Shorter's lap. Eddie slept on. Again on tiptoe the girl recrossed the office to the locked door leading to the back room. The key was in the lock. Gingerly she turned it, keeping a furtive eye upon the sleeping guard, and the muzzle of his own revolver leveled menacingly upon him. Eddie Shorter stirred in his sleep and raised a hand to his face. The heart of Barbara Harding ceased to beat while she stood waiting for the man to open his eyes and discover her, but he did nothing of the kind. Instead his hand dropped limply to his side and resumed his regular breathing. The key turned in the lock beneath the gentle pressure of her fingers. The bolt slipped quietly back, and she pushed the door ajar. Within, Billy Burden turned, inquiring eyes in the direction of the opening door, and as he saw who it was who entered, surprise showed upon his face. But he spoke no word, for the girl held a silencing finger to her lips. Quickly she came to his side, and motioned to him to rise while she tugged the knots which held the bonds in place about his arms. Once she stopped long enough to recross the room and close the door which she had left open when she entered. It required fully five minutes, the longest five minutes of Barbara Harding's life, she thought, before the knots gave to her efforts. But at last the rope fell to the floor, and Billy Byrne was free. He started to speak, to thank her, and perhaps to scold her for the rash thing she had undertaken for him. But she silenced him again with a whispered, Come, turned toward the door. As she opened it a crack to written order, she kept the revolver pointed straight ahead of her into the adjoining room. Eddie, however, still slept on in peaceful ignorance of the trick which had been played upon him. Now the two started forward for the door which opened from the office upon the porch, and as they did so, Barbara turned again toward Billy to caution him to silence, for his spurs had tinkled as he moved. For a moment their eyes were not upon Eddie Shorter, and fate had it that at the very moment Eddie awoke and opened his eyes. The sight that had met them was so astonishing that for a second the Kansan could not move. He saw Barbara Harding, a revolver in her hand, aiding the outlaw to escape, and in the instant that surprise kept him motionless, Eddie saw, too, another picture, the picture of a motherly woman in a little farmhouse back in Kansas, and Eddie realized that this man, this outlaw, had been the means of arousing within him a desire and a determination to return again to those loving arms. Two, the man had saved his mother from injury and possible death. Eddie shut his eyes quickly and thought hard and fast. Miss Barbara had always been kind to him, and his boyish heart he had loved her, hopelessly, of course, in a boyish way. 
She wanted the outlaw to escape. Eddie realized that he would do anything that Miss Barbara wanted, even if he had risked his life at it. The girl and the man were at the door. She pushed him through ahead of her while she kept the revolver leveled upon Eddie. Then she passed out after him and closed the door, while Eddie Shorter kept his eyes tightly closed and prayed to his God that Billy Byrne might get safely away. Outside and in the rear of the office building, Barbara pressed the revolver upon Billy. You will need it, she said. There is Brazos. Take him. God bless and guard you, Billy, and she was gone. Billy swallowed hard. He wanted to run after her and take her in his arms, but he recalled Bridge, and with a sigh turned toward the patient Brazos. Languidly he gathered up the reins and mounted, and then, unconcernedly as though he were an honored guest departing by daylight, he rode out of the ranch yard and turned Brazos' head north up the river road. And as Billy disappeared in the darkness toward the north, Barbara Harding walked slowly toward the ranch house, while from a little group of men and horses a hundred yards away, three men detached themselves and crept toward her, for they had seen her in the moonlight as she left Billy outside the office and strolled slowly in the direction of the house. They hid in the shadow at the side of the house until the girl had turned the corner and was approaching the veranda. Then they ran quickly forward, and as she mounted the steps she was seized from behind and dragged backwards. A hand was clapped over her mouth, and a whispering threat warned her to silence. Half dragging and half carrying her, the three men bore her back to where their confederates waited them. A huge fellow mounted his pony, and Barbara was lifted to the horn of the saddle before him. Then the others mounted, and as silently as they had come, they rode away, following the same path. Barbara Harding had not cried out, nor attempted to, for she had seen very shortly after her capture that she was in the hands of Indians, and she judged from what she had heard of the little band of Pimans who held forth in the mountains to the east that they would as gladly knife her as not. Jose was a Pimon, and she immediately connected Jose with the perpetration, or at least the planning, of her abduction. Thus she felt assured that no harm would come to her, since Jose had been famous in his time for the number and size of the ransoms he collected. Her father would pay what was demanded. She would be returned, and, aside from a few days of discomfort and hardship, she would be none the worse off for her experience. Reasoning thus, it was not difficult to maintain her composure and presence of mind. As Barbara was borne toward the east, Billy Byrne rode steadily northward. It was his intention to stop at Jose's hut and deliver the message which Pesita had given him for the old Canadian. Then he would disappear into the mountains to the west, join Pesita and urge a new raid upon some favored friend of General Francisco Villa, for Billy had no love for Villa. He should have been glad to pay his respects to El Robo Rancho and its foreman, but the fact that Anthony Harding owned it and that he and Barbara were there was sufficient effectually to banish all thoughts of revenge along that line. Maybe I can get his goat later, he thought, when he's away from the ranch. I don't like that stiff anyhow. He ought to have been a harness bull. It was four o'clock in the morning when Billy dismounted in front of Jose's hut. He pounded on the door until the man came and opened it. Hey! exclaimed Jose as he saw who his early morning visitor was. You got away from them. Fine! And the old man chuckled. I sent word to Peseta too. Four hours ago that Villist has captured Captain Byrne and taken him to Corvaca. Thanks, said Billy. Peseta wants you to send Esteban to him. I didn't have no chance to tell you last night when them pikers were sticking around, so I stopped now on my way back to the hills. I will send Esteban tonight if I can get him, but I do not know. Esteban is working for the pig, Grayson. What's he doing for Grayson? asked Billy. And what was that Grayson guy doing up here with you, Jose? Ain't you getting pretty thick with Peseta's enemies? Jose had good friends everybody, said the old man, grinning. Grayson have a job he want good men for. Jose furnish men. Grayson pay well. Job got nothing to do Peseta, Villa, Carranza, Revolution. Just private job. Grayson wants Senorita. He pay to get her, that all. Oh, said Billy, and yawned. He was not interested in Mr. Grayson's amours. Why didn't the poor boob go get her himself? He inquired disinterestedly. He must be a yap to hire a bunch of guys to go cop off a swish girl for him. It is not a swish girl, senor captain, said Jose. It is one beautiful senorita, the daughter of the owner of El Arroyo Rancho. What? cried Billy. What did you say? Yes, senor captain. What of it? inquired Jose. Grayson, he pay me furnish the men. Esteban, he go with his warriors. I get Esteban. They go tonight, take away the senorita, but not for Grayson. And the old fellow laughed. I can no help, can I? Grayson pay me money, get men. I get them. I no help if they keep girl. Then he shrugged. They're coming for her tonight, cried Billy. Si, senor, replied Jose. Doubtless they already take her. Hell, muttered Billy Byrne. It's
Chapter Fifteen of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. An Indian's Treachery. The Brazos pony had traveled far that day, but for only a trifle over ten miles had he carried a rider upon his back. He was, consequently, far from fagged as he leapt forward to the lifted reins and tore along the dusty river trail back in the direction of Arobo. Never before had Brazos covered ten miles in so short a time, for it was not yet five o'clock when, reeling with fatigue, he stopped, staggered, and fell in front of the office building at El Arobo. Eddie Shorter had sat in the chair as Barbara and Billy had last seen him, waiting until Byrne should have an ample start before arousing Grayson and reporting the prisoner's escape. Eddie had determined that he would give Billy an hour. He grinned as he anticipated the rage of Grayson and the Villistas when they learned that their bird had flown, and as he mused and waited, he fell asleep. It was broad daylight when Eddie awoke, and as he looked up at the little clock ticking against the wall and saw the time, he gave an exclamation of surprise and leapt to his feet. Just as he opened the outer door of the office, he saw a horseman leap from a winded pony in front of the building. He saw the animal collapse and sink to the ground, and then he recognized the pony as Brazos, and another glance at the man brought recognition of him, too. You, cried Eddie, what are you doing back here? I gotta take you now. And he started to draw his revolver, but Billy Byrne had him covered before ever his hand reached the grip of the gun. Put him up, admonished Billy, and listen to me. This ain't no time for gunplay and no such foolishness. I ain't back here to be took. Get that out of your nut. I'm tipped off that a bunch of swishes is down here last night to swipe Miss Harding. Come, we gotta go see if she's here or not. And don't try any funny business on me, Eddie. I ain't a going to be taken again and whoever tries it gets his see eddie was down off the porch in an instant and making for the ranch house i'm with you he said who told you and who done it never mind who told me but a swish named esteban was to pull the thing off for grayson grayson wanted miss harding and he was going to have her stolen for him the hound muttered eddie the two men dashed up onto the veranda of the ranch house and pounded at the door until a chinaman opened it and stuck his head out inquiringly is miss harding here demanded billy blissy hardy cleep snapped the servant wally wanny here flow breakfast and would have shut the door in their faces had not billy intruded the heavy boot the next instant he placed a large palm over the celestial's face and pushed the man back into the house once inside he called mr harding's name aloud what is it asked the gentleman a moment later as he appeared in the bedroom doorway off the living room clad in his pajamas what's the matter why gad man is that really you is this really billy byrne sure replied billy shortly but we can't waste any time chinning i heard that miss barbara was going to be swiped last night i heard that she had been now hurry and see if she's here anthony harding turned and leapt up the narrow stairwell to the second floor four steps at a time he hadn't gone upstairs in that fashion in forty years without even pausing to rap he burst into his daughter's bedroom it was empty the bed was unruffled it had not been slept in. With a moan, the man turned back and ran hastily to the other rooms upon the second floor. Barbara was nowhere to be found. Then he hastened downstairs to the two men awaiting him. As he entered the room from one end, Grayson entered it from the other through the doorway leading up upon the veranda. Billy Byrne had heard footsteps upon the boards without, and he was ready. So that as Grayson entered, he found himself looking straight at the business end of a six-shooter. The foreman halted, and stood looking in surprise first at Billy Byrne, and then at Eddie Shorter and Mr. Harding. "'What does this mean?' he demanded, addressing Eddie. "'What you doing here with your prisoner? Who told you to let him out, eh?' "'Can the chatter,' growled Billy Byrne. "'Shorter didn't let me out. I skipped hours ago, and I've just come back from Jose's to ask you where Miss Harding is. You low-lived cur, you. Where is she?' "'What has Mr. Grayson to do with it?' asked Mr. Harding. How should he know anything about it? It's all a mystery to me. You here, of all the men in the world, and Grayson talking about you as a prisoner. I can't make it out. Quick, though, Byrne, tell me what you know about Barbara. Billy kept Grayson covered as he replied to the request of Harding. This guy hires a bunch of Piedmonts to steal Miss Barbara, he said. I got a straight from the fellow he paid the money to for getting him the right men to pull off the job. He wants her, it seems, and Billy shot a look at the ranch foreman that would have killed if it looks good. She can't have been gone long. I seen her after midnight just before I made my getaway, so they can't have taken her very far. This thing here can't help us none neither, for he don't know where she is any more than we do. 
He thinks he does, but he don't. The switch is framed it on him, and they've double-crossed him. I got that straight, too. But, God, I don't know where they've taken her and what they're going to do to her. As he spoke, he turned his face for the first time away from Grayson and looked full in Anthony Harding's face. The latter saw beneath the strong character lines of the man's countenance the agony of fear and doubt that lay heavily upon his heart. In the brief instance that Billy watchful gaze left the figure of the ranch foreman, the latter saw the opportunity he craved. He was standing directly in the doorway. A single step would carry him out of range of Byrne's gun, placing a wall between it and him, and Grayson was not slow in taking that step. When Billy turned his eyes back, the Texan had disappeared, and by the time the former reached the doorway, Grayson was halfway to the office building on the veranda, of which stood the four soldiers of Villa, grumbling and muttering over the absence of their prisoner of the previous evening. Billy Byrne stepped out into the open. The ranch foreman called aloud to the four Mexicans that their prisoner was at the ranch house, and they looked in that direction they saw him, revolver in hand, coming slowly toward them. There was a smile upon his lips which they could not see because of the distance, and which, not knowing Billy Byrne, they would not have interpreted correctly. But the revolver they did understand. And at the sight of it, one of them threw his carbine to his shoulder. His finger, however, never closed upon the trigger, for there came the sound of a shot from beyond Billy Byrne, and the Mexican staggered forward, pitching over the edge of the porch to the ground. Billy turned his head in the direction from which the shot had come and saw Eddie Shorter running toward him, a smoking six-shooter in his right hand. "'Go back,' commanded Byrne. "'This is my funeral.' "'Not in your life,' replied Eddie Shorter. "'Those greasers don't take no white man off an El Robo while I'm here. Get busy. They're coming.' And sure enough, they were coming, and as they came, their carbines popped and the bolts whizzed about the heads of the two Americans. Grayson, too, had taken a hand upon the side of the Vistas. From the bunkhouse, other men were running rapidly in the direction of the fight, attracted by the first shots. Billy and Eddie stood their ground a few paces apart. Two more of Villa's men went down. Grayson ran for cover. Then Billy Byrne dropped the last of the Mexicans, just as the men from the bunkhouse came panting upon the scene. They were both Americans and Mexicans among them. All were armed and weapons were ready in their hands. They paused a short distance from the two men. Eddie's presence upon the side of the stranger saved Billy from instant death for Eddie was well liked by both his Mexican and American fellow workers. "'What's the fuss?' asked an American. Eddie told them, and when they learned that their boss's daughter had been spirited away, that the ranch foreman was at the bottom of it, the anger of the Americans rose to a dangerous pitch. "'Where is he?' someone asked. They were gathered in a little cluster now about Billy Byrne and Shorter. "'I saw him duck behind the office building,' said Eddie. "'Come on,' said another. "'We'll get him.' "'Someone get a rope,' the men spoke in low, ordinary tones. They appeared unexcited. Determination was the most apparent characteristic of the group. One of them ran back toward the bunkhouse for his rope. The others walked slowly in the direction of the rear of the office building. Grayson was not there. The search proceeded. The Americans were in advance. The Mexicans kept in a group by themselves, a little in the rear of the others. It was not their trouble. If the gringos wanted to lynch another gringo, well and good. That was the gringos' business. They would keep out of it, and they did. Down past the bunkhouse and the cookhouse to the stables, the searchers made their way. Grayson could not be found. In the stables, one of the men made a discovery. The foreman's saddle had vanished. Out in the corrals they went. One of the men laughed. The bars were down and the saddle horses gone. Eddie Shorter presently pointed out across the pasture and the river to the skyline of the low bluffs beyond. The others looked. A horseman was just visible, urging his mount upward to the crest. The two stood in silhouette against the morning sky, pink with the new sun. "'That's him,' said Eddie. "'Let him go,' said Billy Byrne. "'He won't never come back, and he ain't worth chasing. Not while we got Miss Barber to look after. My horse is down there with yours. I'm going down to get him. Will you come, Shorter? I may need help. I ain't much with a rope yet.' He started off without waiting for a reply, and all the Americans followed. Together they circled the horses and drove them back to the corral. When Billy had saddled and mounted, he saw that the others had done likewise. "'We're going with you,' said one of them. "'Miss Barber belongs to us.' Billy nodded and moved off in the direction of the ranch house. Here he dismounted, and with Eddie Shorter and Mr. Harding, commenced circling the house in search of some manner of clue to the direction taken by the abductors. It was not long before they came upon the spot where the Indians' horses had stood the night before. From there the trail led plainly down toward the river. In a moment, ten Americans were following after it. Mr. Harding had supplied Billy Byrne with a carbine, another six-shooter, and ammunition. 
through the river and the cut in the barbed wire fence then up the face of the bluff and out across the low mesa beyond the trail led for a mile it was distinct and then disappeared as though the riders had separated well said billy as the others drew around him for consolation they'd be going to the hills there they were peons esteban's tribe they got her up there in the hills somewheres let's split up and search the hills for her whoever comes on em first will have to do some shootin' and the rest of us can close in and help we can go in pairs then if one's killed the other can ride out and lead the way back to where it happened the men seemed satisfied with the plan and broke up into parties of two eddie shorter paired off with billy byrne spread out said the latter to his companions eddie and i'll ride straight ahead the rest of you can fan out a few miles on either side of us so long and good luck and he started off toward the hills eddie shorter at his side back at the ranch the mexican vaqueros lounged about grumbling with no foreman there was nothing to do except talk about their troubles they had not been paid since the looting of the bank at Provaca, for mr harding had been unable to get any silver from anywhere else until a few days since he now had assurances that it was on the way to him but whether or not it would reach el Robo was a question why should we stay here when we are not paid asked one of them yes why chorused several others there's nothing to do here said another we will go to Corvaca. i for one am tired of working for the gringos this met with unqualified approval of all and a few moments later the men had saddled their ponies and were galloping away in the direction of sun-baked Corvaca. they sang now and were happy for they were as little boys playing hooky from school not bad men but rather irresponsible children once in Corvaca, they swooped down upon the drinking place where with what little money a few of them had left they proceeded to get drunk later in the day an old dried-up indian entered he was hot and dusty from a long ride hey jose cried one of the vaqueros from el arobo rancho you old rascal what are you doing here jose looked around upon them he knew them all they represented the mexican contingent of the riders of el arobo jose wondered what they were all doing here in Corvaca at one time even upon a payday it never had been a rule of the el arobo to allow more than four men at a time to come to town oh jose come to buy coffee and tobacco he replied he looked about searchingly where are the others he asked the gringos they have ridden after esteban explained one of the vaqueros he has run off with senorita harding jose raised his eyebrows as though this was all news and senor grayson has gone with them he asked he was very fond of the senorita senor grayson has run away went on the other speaker the other gringos wished to hang him for it is said that he has bribed esteban to do this thing again jose raised his eyebrows impossible he ejaculated and who then guards the ranch he asked presently senor harding two mexican house servants and a chinaman and the vaquero laughed i must be going jose announced after a moment it is a long ride for an old man from my poor home to Bovaca and back again the vaqueros were paying no further attention to him and the indian passed out and sought his pony but when he had mounted and ridden from town he took a strange direction for one whose path lies to the east since he turned the pony's head toward the northwest jose had ridden far that day since billy had left his humble hut he had gone to the west to the little rancher of one of peseta's adherents who had dispatched a boy to carry word to the bandit that his captain byrne had escaped the vistas and then jose had ridden into Corvaca by a circuitous route which brought him up from the east side of the town now he was riding once again for peseta but this time he would bear the information himself he found the chief in camp and after baking tobacco and cigarette paper the indian finally reached the purpose of the visit jose has just come from Guavaca, he said and there he drank with all the mexican vaqueros in el arobo rancho all a general you understand it seems that esteban has carried off the beautiful senorito of el arobo rancho and the vaqueros tell jose that all the american vaqueros have ridden in search of her all my general you understand in such times of danger it is odd that the gringos should leave el arobo thus unguarded only the rich senor harding two house servants and a chinaman remained a man lay stretched upon his blankets in a tent next to that occupied by peseta at the sound of the speaker's voice low though it was he raised his head and listened he heard every word and a scowl settled upon his brow barbara stolen mr harding practically alone upon the ranch and peseta in possession of this information bridge rose to his feet he buckled his cartridge belt upon his waist and picked up his carbine they crawled under the rear wall of the tent and walked slowly off in the direction of the picket line where the horses were tethered ah senor bridge said a pleasant voice in his ear where to 
Bridge turned quickly to look into the smiling, evil face of Rosales. Oh, he replied, I'm going out to see if I can't find some shooting. It's awfully dull sitting around here doing nothing. Si, sí, senor, agreed Rosales. I, too, find it so. Let us go together. I know where the shooting is best. I don't doubt it, thought Bridge. Probably in the back. But aloud, he said, certainly that will be fine. For he guessed that Rosales had been set to watch his movements and prevent his escape, and, perchance, to be the sole witness of some unhappy event which should carry Senor Bridge to the arms of his father. Rosales called a soldier to saddle and bridled their horses, and shortly after the two were riding abreast down the trail out of the hills. Where it was necessary that they ride in single file, Bridge was careful to see that Rosales rode ahead, and the Mexican graciously permitted the American to fall behind. If he was inspired by any other motive than simply espionage, he was evidently content to bide his time until chance gave him the opening he desired, and it was equally evident that he felt as safe in front of the American as behind him. At a point where a ravine down which they had ridden debauched upon a mesa, Rosales suggested that they ride to the north, which was not at all in the direction in which Bridge intended them going. The American demurred. There is no shooting down in the valley, urged Rosales. I think there will be, was Bridge's enigmatic reply, and then, with a sudden exclamation of surprise, he pointed over Rosales's shoulder. What's that? he cried, in a voice tense with excitement. The Mexican turned his head quickly in the direction Bridge's index finger indicated. I see nothing, said Rosales, after a moment. You do now, though, replied Bridge, and as the Mexican's eyes were turned in the direction of his companion, he was forced to admit that he did see something, the dismal hollow eye of a six-shooter looking at him straight in the face. Senor Bridge, exclaimed Rosales, what are you doing? What do you mean? I mean, said Bridge, that if you are all solicitous to your health, you'll climb down off that pony, not forgetting to keep your hands above your head when you reach the ground. Now climb. Rosales dismounted. Turn your back toward me, commanded the American. When the other had obeyed him, Bridge dismounted and removed the man's weapons from his belt. Now you may go, Rosales, he said, and should you ever have an American in your power again, Remember that I spared your life when I might easily have taken it, when it would have been infinitely safer for me to have done it. The Mexican made no reply, but the black scowl that clouded his face boded ill for the next gringo who should be so unfortunate as to fall into his hands. Slowly he wheeled about and started back up the trail in the direction of Pesada's camp. I'll be halfway to El Orobo, thought Bridge, before he gets a chance to tell Pesada what happened to him, and then he remounted and rode on down into the valley leading Rosales's horse behind him. It would never do, he knew, to turn the animal loose too soon, since he would doubtless make his way back to camp, and in doing so would have to pass Rosales, who would then catch him. Time was what Bridge wanted, to be well on his way to Orobo before Peseta should learn of his escape. Bridge knew nothing of what had happened to Billy, for Peseta had seen to it that the information was kept from the American. The latter had, nevertheless, been worrying not a little at the absence of his friend, for he knew that he had taken his liberty and his life in his hands in riding down to El Arobo among avowed enemies. Far to his rear, Rosales plodded sullenly up the steep trail through the mountains. Chapter Sixteen of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Eddie makes good. Billy Byrne and Eddie Shorter rode steadily in the direction of the hills. Upon either side, at intervals of a mile or more, stretched the others of their party, occasionally visible, but for the most part not. Once in the hills, the two could no longer see their friends, or be seen by them. Both Byrne and Eddie felt that chance had placed them upon the right trail, for a well-marked and long-used path wound upward through the canyon along which they rode. It was an excellent location for an ambush, and both men breathed more freely when they had passed out of it into more open country, upon a narrow tableland between the first foothills and the main range of mountains. Here again was the trail well-marked and when Eddie, looking ahead, saw that it appeared to lead in the direction of a vivid green spot close to the base of the gray-brown hills, he gave an exclamation of assurance. "'We're on the right trail, all right, old man,' he said. "'There's water there,' and he pointed ahead at the green splotch upon the gray. "'That's where they be having their village. I ain't never been up here, so I ain't familiar with the country.' 
You see, we don't run no cattle this side of the river. The Pimans won't let us. They don't care to have no white men poking around in their country, and I'll bet a hat we find a camp there. Onward they rode toward the little spot of green. Sometimes it was in sight, and again as they approached higher ground, or wound through gullies and ravines, it was lost to their sight. But always they kept it as their goal. The trail they were upon led to it. Of that there was no longer the slightest doubt, and as they rode with their destination in view, black, beady eyes looked down upon them from the very green oasis toward which they urged their ponies, tiring now from the climb. A lithe brown body lay stretched comfortably upon a bed of grasses at the edge of a little rise of ground beneath which the riders must pass before they came to the cluster of huts which squatted in a tiny natural park at the foot of the main peak. Far above the watcher a spring of clear, pure water bubbled out of the mountainside, and running downward formed little pools among the rocks which held it. And with this water the Pimans irrigated their small fields, for it sank from sight again to the earth just below the village. Beside the brown body lay a long rifle. The man's eyes watched, unblinking, the two specks far below him whom he knew he had known for an hour were gringos. Another brown body wormed itself forward to his side and peered over the edge of the declivity down upon the white men. He spoke a few words in a whisper to him who watched with the rifle, and then crawled back again and disappeared. And all the while, onward and upward came Billy Byrne and Eddie Shorter, each knowing in his heart that if not already, then at any moment a watcher would discover them, and a little later a bullet would fly that would find one of them and they took the chance for the sake of the American girl who lay hidden somewhere in these hills, for in no other way could they locate her hiding place more quickly. Any one of the other eight Americans who rode in pairs into the hills at other points to the left and right of Billy Byrne and his companion would have, and was even then cheerfully taking the same chances that Eddie and Billy took, only the latter were now assured that one of them would fall to sacrifice, for as they came closer, Eddie had seen a thin wreath of smoke rising from among the trees of the oasis. Now, indeed, were they sure that they had chanced upon the trail to the Pimountain village. "'We've got to keep our eyes peeled,' said Eddie, as they wound into a ravine, which from its location evidently led directly up to the village. "'We ain't far from them now, and if they get us, they'll get us about here.' As though to punctuate his speech with the final period, a rifle cracked above them. Eddie jumped spasmodically and clutched his breast. "'I'm hit,' he said, quite unemotionally. Billy Byrne's revolver had answered the shot from above him, the bullet striking where Billy had seen a puff of smoke following the rifle shot. Then Billy turned toward Eddie. Hit bad, he asked. Yep, I guess so, said Eddie. What'll we do? Hide up here, or ride back after the others? Another shot rang out above them, although Billy had been watching for a target I wished to shoot again, a target which he had been positive he would get when the man rose to fire again. And Billy did see the fellow at last a few paces from where he had last fired, but not until the other had dropped at his horse beneath him. Byrne fired again, and this time he had the satisfaction of seeing a brown body rise, struggle a moment, and then roll over once upon the grass before it came to rest. "'I reckon we'll stay here,' said Billy, looking ruefully at Eddie's horse. Eddie rose, and as he did so he staggered and grew very white. Billy dismounted and ran forward, putting an arm about him. Another shot came from above, and Billy Byrne's pony grunted and collapsed. Hell, exclaimed Billy, we gotta get out of this, and lifting his wounded comrade in his arms, he ran for the shelter of the bluff from the summit of which the snipers had fired upon them. Close in, hugging the face of the perpendicular wall of the tumbled rock and earth, they were out of range of the Indians. But Billy did not stop when he had reached temporary safety. Further up toward the direction in which lay the village, and halfway up the side of the bluff, Billy saw what he took to be an excellent shelter. Here the face of the bluff was less steep, and upon it lay a number of large boulders, while others protruded from the ground about them. Toward these Billy made his way. The wounded man across his shoulder was suffering indescribable agonies, but he bit his lip and stifled the cries that each step his comrade took seemed to wrench from him, lest he attract the enemy to their position. Above them all was silence, yet Billy knew that alert, red foemen were creeping to the edge of the bluff in search of their prey. If he could but reach the shelter of the boulders before the Pimas discovered them, the minutes that were consumed in covering the hundred yards seemed as many hours to Billy Byrne, but at last he dragged the fainting cowboy between two large boulders close under the edge of the bluff, and found himself in a little natural fortress, 
well adapted to defense. From above they were protected from the fire of the Indians upon the bluff by the height of the boulder at the foot of which they lay, while another just in front hid them from possible marksmen across the canyon. Smaller rocks scattered about gave promise of shelter from flank fire, and as soon as he had deposited Eddie in the comparative safety of their retreat, Byrne commenced forming a low breastwork upon the side facing the village, the direction from which they might naturally expect attack. This done, he turned his attention to the opening upon the opposite side, and soon had a similar defense constructed there. Then he turned his attention to Eddie, though keeping a watchful eye upon both approaches to their stronghold. The Kansan lay upon his side, moaning. Blood stained his lips and nostrils, and when Billy Byrne opened his shirt and found a gaping wound in his right breast, he knew how serious was his companion's injury. As he felt Billy working over him, the boy opened his eyes. "'You think I'm done for?' he asked in a tortured whisper. "'Nothing doing,' lied Billy, cheerfully. "'Just a scratch. You'll be all right in a day or two. Eddie shook his head wearily. "'I wish I could believe you,' he said. "'I've been figuring on going back to see Ma. I ain't thought of nothing else since you told me about how she missed me. I can see her right now, just like I was there. I bet she's scrubbing the kitchen floor. Ma was always a scrubbing something. Gee, but it's tough to cash in like this just when I was figuring on going home.' Billy couldn't think of anything to say. He turned to look up and down the canyon in search of the enemy. "'Home, Mr. Eddy. Home.' "'Aw, oh, shucks,' said Billy kindly. "'You'll get home all right, kid. The boys must have heard the shooting, and they'll be along in no time now. Then we'll clean up this bunch of coons and have you back at El Robo and nurse into shape in no time.' Eddie tried to smile as he looked into the other's face. He reached a hand out and laid it on Billy's arms. "'You're all right, old man,' he whispered. I know you're lying, and so do you, but it makes me feel better anyway to have you say them things. Billy felt as one who had been caught stealing from a blind man. The only adequate reply of which he could think was, Aw, oh, shucks. Say, said Eddie, after a moment's silence, if you get out of here and ever go back to the States, promise me you'll look up Ma and Paul and tell them I was coming home, to stay. Tell them I died decent, too, will you? Died like Paul was always a-telling me when Granddad died fighting the Injuns, round Fort Dodge somewheres. Sure, said Billy, I'll tell him. Gee, look who's coming here, and as he spoke he flattened himself to the ground just as a bullet pinged against a rock above his head, and the report of a rifle sounded from up the canyon. That guy almost got me. I'll have to be tended to business better than this. He drew himself slowly up on his elbows, his carbine ready in his hand, and peered through a small aperture between two of the rocks, which composed his breastwork. Then he stuck the muzzle of the weapon through, took aim, and pulled the trigger. "'Did you get him?' asked Eddie. "'Yep,' said Billy, and fired again. "'Got that one, too. "'Say, they're tough-looking guys, but I guess they won't be coming so fast next time. "'These two are right in the open, working up to us on their bellies. "'They must have thought we was sleeping.' For an hour Billy neither saw nor heard any sign of the enemy, though several times he raised his hat above the breastwork upon the muzzle of the carbine to draw their fire. It was mid-afternoon when the sound of distant rifle fire came faintly to the ears of the two men from somewhere far below them. "'The boys must be coming,' whispered Eddie Shorter, hopefully. For half an hour the firing continued, and then silence again fell upon the mountains. Eddie began to wander mentally. He talked much of Kansas and his old home, and many times he begged for water. "'Buck up, kid,' said Billy. "'The boys will be along in any minute now, and then we'll get you all the water you want.' but the boys did not come. Billy was standing up now, stretching his legs, and searching up and down the canyon for Indians. He was wondering if he could chance making a break for the valley where they stood some slight chance of meeting with their companions, and even as he considered the matter seriously, there came a staccato report, and Billy Byrne fell forward in a heap. "'God!' cried Eddie. "'They got him now. They got him!' Byrne stirred and struggled to rise. "'Likel they got me,' he said, and staggered to his knees. Over the breastwork he saw a half-dozen Indians running rapidly toward the shelter. He saw them in a haze of red that was caused not by blood, but by anger. With an oath, Billy Byrne leapt to his feet. From his knees up, his whole body was exposed to the enemy, but Billy cared not. He was in a berserker rage. Whipping his carbine to his shoulder, he let drive at the advancing Indians who were now beyond hope of cover. They must come on or be shot down where they were, 
so they came on yelling like devils and stopping momentarily to fire upon the rash white man who stood so perfect a target before them but their haste spoiled their marksmanship the bullets zinged and zipped against the rocky little fortress they nicked billy's shirt and trousers and hat and all the while he stood there pumping lead into his assailants not hysterically but with the cool deliberation of a butcher slaughtering beeves one by one the piemans dropped until but a single indian rushed frantically upon the white man and then the last of the assailants lunged forward across the breastwork with a bullet from billy's carbine through his forehead eddie shorter had raised himself painfully upon an elbow that he might witness the battle but when it was over he sank back the blood rolling from beneath his set teeth billy turned to look at him when the last of the piemans was disposed of and seeing his condition kneeled beside him and took his head in the hollow of an arm you order lie still he cautioned the kansan tain't good for you to move about much it was worth it whispered eddie say but that was some scrap you got your nerve standing up there against a bunch of em but if you hadn't they'd have rushed us and some of us would have gotten it funny the boys don't come said billy yes replied eddie with a sigh it's milkin time now and i figured on goin to shawnee this evening them's nice cookies ma i billy byrne was bending low to catch his feeble words and when the voice trailed out into nothingness he lowered the tasseled red head to the hard earth and turned away could it be that the thing which glistened on the eyelid of the toughest guy on the west side was a tear the afternoon waned and night came but it brought to billy byrne neither renewed attack nor succor the bullet which had dropped him momentarily had but creased his forehead aside from the fact that he was blood covered from the wound it had inconvenienced him in no way and now the darkness had fallen he commenced to plan upon leaving the shelter first he transferred eddie's ammunition into his own person and such valuables and trinkets that he thought maul might be glad to have then he removed the breech block from eddie's carbine and struck it in his pocket that the weapon might be valueless to the indians when they found it sorry i can't bear you old man was billy's parting comment as he climbed over the breastwork and melted into the night billy byrne moved cautiously through the darkness and he moved not in the direction of escape and safety but directly up the canyon in the way of the village of the pimas lay soon he heard the sound of voices and shortly after saw the light of cooked fires playing upon bronzed faces and upon the fronts of low huts some women were moaning and wailing billy guessed that they mourned for those whom his bills had found earlier in the day in the darkness of the night far upon the rough forbidding mountains it was all very weird and uncanny billy crept closer to the village shelter was abundant he saw no sign of sentry and wondered why they should be so lax in the face of almost certain attack then it occurred to him that possibly the firing he and eddie had seen earlier in the day far down among the foothills might have meant the extermination of the americans from el arobo well i'll be next then mused billy and wormed closer to the huts his eyes were on alert every instance as were his ears but no sign of that which he sought rewarded his keenest observation until midnight he lay in concealment and all that time the mourners continued their dismal wailing then one by one they entered their huts and silence reigned within the village billy crept closer he eyed each hut with longing wondering gaze which could it be how could he determine one seemed little more promising than the others he had noted those to which indians had retired there were three into which he had seen none go these then should be the first to undergo his scrutiny the night was dark the moon had not yet risen only a few dying fires cast a wavering and uncertain light upon the scene through the shadows billy byrne crept closer and closer at last he lay close behind one of the huts which was to be the first to claim his attention for several moments he lay listening intently for any sound that would come from within but there was none he crawled to the doorway and peered within utter darkness shrouded and hid the interior billy rose and walked boldly inside if he could see no one within then no one could see him once he was inside the door therefore so reasoned billy byrne he would have as good a chance as the occupants of the hut should they prove to be enemies he crossed the floor carefully stopping often to listen at last he heard a rustling sound just ahead of him his fingers tightened upon the revolver he carried in his right hand by the barrel club-like billy had no intention of making any more noise than necessary again he heard a sound from the same direction 
It was not at all unlike a frightened gasp of a woman. Billy emitted a low growl and fair imitation of a prowling dog that had been disturbed. Again the gasp, and a low, go away, in liquid feminine tones, and in English. Billy uttered a low, shh, and tiptoed closer. Extending his hands, they presently came in contact with a human body, which shrank from him with another smothering cry. Barbara, whispered Billy, bending close. A hand reached out through the darkness, found him, and closed upon his sleeve. Who are you? asked in a low voice. Billy, he replied. Are you alone in here? No, an old woman guards me, replied the girl. At the same time, they both heard a movement close at hand, and something scurried past them to be silhouetted for an instant against the path of lesser darkness which marked the location of the doorway. There she goes, cried Barbara. She heard you, and she has gone for help. Then come, said Billy, seizing the girl's arm and dragging her to her feet. But they had scarce crossed half the distance to the doorway, and the cries of the old woman without warned them that the camp had been aroused. Billy thrust a revolver into Barbara's hand. We gotta make a fight of it, little girl, he said, but you'd better die than be here alone. As they emerged from the hut, they saw warriors running from every doorway. The old woman stood, screaming in Piedmont at the top of her lungs. Billy, keeping Barbara in front of him, that he might shield her body with his own, turned directly out of the village. He did not fire at first, hoping that they might elude detection, and thus not draw the fire of the Indians upon them. But he was doomed to disappointment, and they had taken scarcely a dozen steps when the rifle spoke above the noise of human voices, and a bullet whizzed past them. Then Billy replied, and Barbara, too, from just behind his shoulder. Together they backed away toward the shadow of the trees beyond the village, and as they went they poured shot after shot into the village. The Indians, but just awakened and still half stupid from sleep, did not know but that they were attacked by a vastly superior force, and this fear held them in check for several minutes, long enough for Billy and Barbara to reach the summit of the bluff from which Billy and Eddie had first been fired upon. Here they were hidden from view of the Indians, and Billy broke at once into a run, half carrying the girl with a strong arm about her waist. If we can reach the foothills, he said, I think we can dodge em, and by going all night we might reach the river and El Robo by morning. It's a long hike, Barbara, but we gotta make it. We gotta, for if the daylight finds us in the Pimon country, we won't never make it. Anyway, he concluded optimistically, it's all downhill. We'll make it, Billy, she replied, but if we can get past the sentry. What sentry? asked Billy. I didn't see no sentry when I come in. They keep a sentry way down the trail all night, replied the girl. In the daytime he is nearer the village, on top of this bluff, for from here you can see the whole valley, but at night they station him further away in a narrow part of the trail. It's a mighty good thing you tipped me off, said Billy, for I'd have run right into him. I thought they was all behind us now. After that they went more cautiously, and when they reached the part of the trail where the sentry might be expected to be found, Barbara warned Billy of the fact. Like two thieves they crept along the shadow of the canyon wall. Inwardly, Billy cursed the darkness of the night, which hid from view everything more than a few paces from them. Yet it may have been this very darkness which saved them, since it hid them as effectually from an enemy as it hid the enemy from them. They had reached the point where Barbara was positive the sentry should be. The girl was clinging tightly to Billy's left arm. He could feel the pressure of her fingers as they sucked his muscles, sending little tremors and thrills through his giant frame. Even in the face of death, Billy Byrne could sense the ecstasies of personal contact with this girl, the only woman he had ever loved or ever would. Chapter 17 of The Return of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe DeNoya, Somerset, New Jersey. You are my girl. Mr. Anthony Harding was pacing back and forth the length of the veranda of the ranch house at El Robo, waiting for some word of hope from those who had ridden out in search of his daughter, Barbara. Each swirling dust devil that eddied across the dry flat on either side of the river roused hopes within his breast that it might have been spurred into activity by the hooves of a pony bearing a messenger of good tidings. But always his hopes were dashed, for no horseman emerged from the he's hate of the distance, where the little dust devils raced playfully among the cacti and the greasewood. But at last, in the northwest, a horseman, unheralded by gyrating dust column, came into sight. Mr. Harding shook his head sorrowfully. It had not been from this direction that he had expected word of Barbara. 
yet he kept his eyes fastened upon the rider until the latter reined in at the ranch yard and loped the tired and sweating pony to the foot of the veranda steps then mr harding saw who the newcomer was bridge he exclaimed what brings you back here don't you know that you endanger us as well as yourself by being seen here general v will think that we have been harboring you bridge swung from the saddle and ran up to the veranda he paid not the slightest attention to anthony hardy's protest how many men you got here you can depend on he asked none replied the easterner what do you mean none cried bridge incredulity and hopelessness showing upon his countenance isn't there a chinaman and a couple faithful mexicans oh yes of course assented mr harding but what are you driving at peseda is on his way here to clean up el arobo he can't be very far behind me call the men you got and we'll get together all the guns and ammunition on the ranch and barricade the ranch house we may be able to stand them off have you heard anything of miss barbara anthony harding shook his head sadly then we'll have to stay right here and do the best we can said bridge i was thinking we might make a run for it if miss barbara was here but as she's not we must wait for those who went after her mr harding summoned the two mexicans while bridge ran to the cookhouse and ordered the chinamen to the ranch house then the erstwhile bookkeeper ransacked the bunkhouse for arms and ammunition what little he found he carried to the ranch house and with the help of the others barricaded the doors and windows of the first floor we'll have to make our fight from the upper windows he explained to the ranch owner if peseda doesn't bring too large a force we may be able to stand them off until we can get help from Corvaca. call up there now and see if you can get villa to send help he ought to protect us from peseda i understand there's no love lost between the two anthony harding went at once to the telephone and rang for the central at Corvaca. tell it to the operator shouted bridge who stood peering through the opening in the barricade before a front window they're coming now and the chances are that the first thing they'll do is cut at telephone wires the easterner poured his story and appeal for help into the ears of the girl at the other end of the line and then for a few moments there was silence in the room as he listened to her reply impossible and my god it can't be true bridge heard the older man ejaculate and then he saw him hang up the receiver and turn from the instrument his face drawn and pinched with an expression of utter hopelessness what's wrong asked bridge via has turned against the americans replied harding dully the operator evidently feels friendly toward us for she warned me not to appeal to Villa and told me why. Even now, this minute, the man has a force of twenty-five hundred ready to march on Columbus, New Mexico. Three Americans were hanged in Corvaca this afternoon. It's horrible, sir. It's horrible. We are all as good as dead this very minute. Even if we stand off Peseda, we can never escape to the border through Villa's forces. It looks bad, admitted Bridge. In fact, it couldn't look much worse. But here we are, and while our ammunition holds out, all we can do is stay here and use it. Will you men stand by us? He addressed the Chinamen and the two Mexicans, who assured him that they had no love for Peseda, and would fight for Anthony Harding in preference to going over to the enemy. Good, exclaimed Bridge, and now for upstairs. They'll be howling around here in about five minutes. We want to give them a reception they won't forget. He led the way to the second floor, where the five took up positions near the front windows. A short distance from the ranch house they could see the enemy, consisting of a detachment of some twenty of Peseda's troopers riding at a brisk trot in their direction. Peseda's with them, announced Bridge presently. He's the little fellow on the sorrel. Wait until they are close up, then give him a few rounds, but go easy on the ammunition. We haven't any too much. Peseda, expecting no resistance, rode boldly into the ranch yard. At the bunkhouse in the office, his little force halted while three or four troopers dismounted and entered the buildings in search of victims. Disappointed there, they moved toward the ranch house. Lie low, Bridge cautioned his companions. Don't let them see you and wait till I give the word before you fire. On came the horsemen at a slow walk. Bridge waited until they were within a few yards of the house, then he cried, Now let them have it! A rattle of rifle fire broke from the upper windows into the ranks of the Pesatistas. Three troopers reeled and slipped from their saddles. Two horses dropped in their tracks. Cursing and yelling, the balance of the horsemen wheeled and galloped away in the direction of the office building, followed by the fire of the defenders. That wasn't so bad, cried Bridge. I'll venture a guess that Mr. Peseda is some surprised, and so are. There they will go behind the office. They'll stay there a few minutes talking it over and giving up their courage to try it again. Next time they'll come from another direction. You two, he continued, turning to the Mexicans, take positions on the east and the south sides of the house. Singh can remain here with Mr. Harding. I'll take the north side facing the office. Shoot at the first man who shows his head. If we can hold them off until dark, we may be able to get away. 
Whatever happens, don't let one of them get close enough to fire the house. That's what they'll try for. It was fifteen minutes before the second attack came. Five dismounted troopers made a dash for the north side of the house. But when Bridge dropped the first of them before he had taken ten steps from the office building and wounded the second, the others retreated for shelter. Time and again, as the afternoon wore away, Peseta made attempts to get men close up to the house. But in each instance they were driven back, until at last they desisted from their efforts to fire the house or rush it, and contented themselves with firing an occasional shot through the windows opposite them. They're waiting for dark, said Bridge to Mr. Harding during a temporary lull in the hostilities, and then we're goners, unless the boys come back from across the river in time. Couldn't we get away after dark? asked the Easterner. It's our only hope if help don't reach us, replied Bridge. But when the night finally fell and the five men made an attempt to leave the house upon the side away from the office building, they were met with the flash of carbines and the ping of bullets. One of the Mexican defenders fell, mortally wounded, and the others were barely able to drag him in and replace the barricade before the door when five of Peseta's men charged close up to their defenses. These were finally driven off, and again there came a lull. But all hopes of escape was gone, and Bridge reposted the defenders at the upper windows, where they might watch every approach to the house. As the hours dragged on, the hopelessness of their position grew upon the minds of all. Their ammunition was almost gone. Each man had but a few rounds remaining and it was evident that Peseta, through an inordinate desire for revenge, would persist until he had reduced their fortress and claimed the last of them as his victims. It was with such cheerful expectations that they awaited the final assault, which would see them without ammunition and defenseless in the face of the cruel and implacable foe. It was just before daylight when the anticipated rush occurred. From every side rang the reports of carbines and the yells of the bandits. There were scarcely more than a dozen of the original twenty left, but they made up for their depleted numbers by the rapidity which they worked their firearms and the loudness and ferocity of the savage cries and this time they reached the shelter of the veranda and commenced battering at the door at the report of the rifle so close to them billy burns shoved barbara quickly to one side and leaped forward to close with the man who barred their way to liberty that they had surprised him even more than he had them was evidenced by the wildness of his shot which passed harmlessly above their heads as well as by the fact that he had permitted them to come so close before engaging them to the latter event was attributable his undoing, for it permitted Billy Byrne to close with him before the Indian could reload his antiquated weapon. Down the two men went, the American on top, each striving for a death hold, but in weight and strength and skill the Pima was far outclassed by the trained fighter, a part of whose daily workouts had consisted in wrestling with proficient artists of the mat. Barbara Harding ran forward to assist her champion, but as the men rolled and tumbled over the ground, she could find no opening for a blow that might not endanger Billy Byrne, quite as much as it endangered his antagonist. But presently she discovered that the American required no assistance. She saw the Indian's head bending slowly forward beneath the resistless force of the other's huge muscles. She heard the crack that announced the parting of the vertebrae, and saw the limp thing which had but a moment before been a man, pulsing with life and vigor, roll helplessly aside, a harmless and inanimate lump of clay. Billy Byrne leapt to his feet shaking himself as a great mastiff might whose coat had been ruffled in a fight. Come, he whispered, we gotta beat it now for sure. That guy shot will lead him right down to us. And once more they took up their flight down toward the valley, along an unknown trail through the darkness of the night. For the most part they moved in silence, Billy holding the girl's arm or hand to steady her over the rough and dangerous portions of the path, and as they went there grew in Billy's breast a love so deep and so resistless that he found himself wondering that he had ever imagined that his former passion for this girl was love. This new thing surged through him and over him with all the blind, brutal, compelling force of a mighty tidal wave. It battered down and swept away the frail barriers of his newfound gentleness. Again he was the mucker, hating the artificial wall of social caste which separated him from the girl, and now he was ready to climb the wall, or better still, to batter it down with his huge fists. But the time was not yet. First he must get Barbara to a place of safety. On and on they went. The night grew cold. Far ahead there sounded the occasional pop of a rifle. Billy wondered what it could mean, and as they approached the ranch, he discovered that it came from that direction. He hastened their steps to even greater speed than before. Somebody's shooting up at the ranch, he volunteered. Wonder who it could be. Suppose it is your friend in general? asked the girl. Billy made no reply. They reached the river, and as Billy knew not where the fords lay, he plunged in at the point which the water first barred their progress, and dragging the girl after him, plowed bull-like for the opposite shore. Where water was above his depth, he swam while Barbara clung to his shoulders. Thus they made the passage quickly and safely. Billy stopped long enough to shake the water out of his carbine, which the girl had carried across, 
and then forged ahead toward the ranch house from which the sounds of battle came now in increasing volume and at the ranch house hell was popping the moment bridge realized that some of the attackers had reached the veranda he called the surviving mexican and the chinaman to follow him to the lower floor where they might stand a better chance to repel this new attack mr harding he persuaded to remain upstairs outside a dozen men were battering to force an entrance already one panel had splintered and as bridge entered the room he could see the figures of the bandits through the hole they had made raising his rifle he fired through the aperture there was a scream as one of the attackers dropped but the others only increased their efforts their oaths and their threats of vengeance the three defenders poured a few rounds through the sagging door then bridge noted that the chinaman ceased firing what's the matter he asked all gone," he replied singh pointing to the ammunition belt at the same instant the mexican threw down his carbine and rushed for a window on the opposite side of the room his ammunition was exhausted and with it had departed his courage flight only seemed the only course remaining bridge made no effort to stop him he would have been glad to fly too but he could not leave anthony harding and he was sure that the older man would prove unequal to any sustained flight on foot you better go too singh he said to the chinaman placing another bullet through the door there's nothing more that you can do and it may be that they are all on this side now i think they are you fellows have fought splendidly wish i can give you something more substantial than thanks but that's all i have now and shortly peseta won't even leave me that much all light replied singh cheerfully and a second later he was clambering through the window in the wake of the loyal mexican and then the door crashed in and half a dozen troopers followed by peseta himself burst into the room bridge was standing at the foot of the stairs his carbine clubbed for he had just spent his last bullet he knew that he must die but he was determined to make them purchase his life as dearly as he could and to die in defense of anthony harding the father of the girl he loved even though hopelessly peseta saw from the american's attitude that he had no more ammunition he struck up the carbine of a trooper who was about to shoot bridge down wait commanded the bandit cease firing his ammunition is gone will you surrender he asked of bridge not until i've beaten the heads of one or two of your friends he replied that which their egotism leads them to imagine our brains no if you take me alive peseta you'll have to kill me to do it peseta shrugged very well he said indifferently it makes little difference to me that stairway is as good as a wall these brave defenders of the liberty of poor bleeding mexico will make an excellent firing squad attention my children ready aim eleven carbines were leveled at bridge in the ghastly light of early dawn the sallow complexions of the mexicans took on a weird hue the american made a wry face a slight shudder shook his slender frame and then he squared his shoulders and looked peseta smilingly in the face the figure of a man appeared at the window through which the chinaman and the loyal mexican had escaped quick eyes took in the scene in the room hey he yelled cut the rough stuff and leaped into the room peseta surprised by the interruption turned toward the intruder before he had given the command to fire a smile lit his features when he saw who it was ah he exclaimed my dear captain byrne just in time to see a traitor and a spy pay the penalty for his crimes nothing doing growled billy byrne and then he threw his carbine to his shoulder and took careful aim at peseta's face how easy it would have been to have hesitated a moment in the window before he made his presence known just long enough for peseta to speak the single word that would have sent eleven bullets speeding into the body of the man who loved barbara and whom billy believed the girl loved but did such a thought occur to billy byrne of grand avenue it did not he forgot every other consideration beyond his loyalty to a friend bridge and peseta were looking at him in wide-eyed astonishment lay down your carbines billy shot his command at the firing squad lay em down or i'll bore peseta tell em to lay em down peseta i got a beat on your beezer peseta did as he was bid his yellow face pasty with rage now the cartridge belts snapped billy and when these had been deposited upon the floor he told bridge to disarm the bandit chief is mr harding safe he asked of bridge and receiving an affirmative he called upstairs for the older man to descend as mr harding reached the foot of the stairs barbara entered the room by the window through which billy had come a window which opened upon the side veranda now we got a hike announced billy it will never be safe for none of you here after this not even if you think v is your friend which he ain't the friend of no american we know that now said mr harding and repeated to billy that which the telephone operator had told him earlier in the day marching peseta and his men ahead of them billy and the others made their way to the rear of the office building where the horses of the bandits were tethered they were each armed now from the discarded weapons of the raiders and well supplied with ammunition the chinaman and the loyal mexican also discovered themselves when they learned the tables had been turned upon peseta 
They, too, were armed, and all were mounted, and when Billy had loaded the remaining weapons upon the balance of the horses, the party rode away, driving Pesada's livestock and arms ahead of them. "'I imagine,' remarked Bridge, "'that you've rather discouraged pursuit for a while, at least. But pursuit came sooner than they had anticipated. They had reached a point on the river not far from Jose's when a band of horsemen appeared approaching from the west. Billy urged his party to greater speed that they might avoid meeting, if possible, but it soon became evident that the strangers had no intention of permitting them to go unchallenged, for they altered their course and increased their speed, so that they were soon bearing down upon the fugitives at a rapid gallop. "'I guess,' said Billy, "'that we'd better open up on them. It's a cinch they ain't no friends of ours anywhere in these parts.' "'Hadn't we better wait a moment?' said Mr. Harding. "'We do not want a chance making any mistake.' "'It ain't never a mistake to shoot a dago,' replied Billy. His eyes were fastened upon the approaching horseman, and he presently gave an exclamation of recognition. "'There's Rosales,' he said. "'I couldn't mistake that beanpole nowheres. We're safe enough in taking a shot at him if Rosie's with him. He's Pesada's head guy, and he drew his revolver and took a single shot in the direction of his former comrade. Bridge followed his example. The oncoming pesatistas reined in. Billy returned his revolver to his holster and drew his carbine. "'You ride on ahead,' he said to Mr. Harding and Barbara. "'Bridge and I'll bring up the rear.' Then he stopped his pony, and turning, took deliberate aim at the knot of horsemen to their left. A bandit tumbled from his saddle, and the fight was on. Fortunately for the Americans, Rosales had but a handful of men with him, and Rosales himself was never keen for a fight in the open. All morning he hovered around the rear of the escaping Americans, but neither side did much damage to the other, and during the afternoon Billy noticed that Rosales merely followed within sight of them, after having dispatched one of the men back in the direction from which they had come. After reinforcements, commented Byrne, all day they rode without meeting with any roving bands of soldiers or bandits, and the explanation was all too sinister to the Americans, when coupled with the knowledge that Villa was to attack an American town that night. "'I wish we could reach the border in time to warn them,' said Billy. "'But they ain't no chance. If we cross before sun-up tomorrow morning, we'll be doing well.' He had scarcely spoken to Barbara Harding all day, for his duties as rear guard had kept him busy, nor had he conversed much with Bridge though he had often eyed the latter, whose gaze wandered many times to the slender, graceful figure of the girl ahead of them. Billy was thinking as he had never had thought before. It seemed to him a cruel fate that so shaped their destinies that his best friend loved the girl Billy loved. That Bridge was ignorant of Billy's infatuation for her, the latter knew well. He could not blame Bridge, nor could he, upon the other hand, quite reconcile himself to the more than apparent adoration which marked his friend's attitude toward Barbara. As daylight waned, the fugitives realized from the shuffling gait of their mounts, from drooping heads and dull eyes, that rest was imperative. They themselves were fagged, too, and when a ranch house loomed in front of them, they decided to halt for much-needed recuperation. Here they found three Americans who were totally unaware of Villa's contemplated raid across the border, and who, when they were informed of it, were doubly glad to welcome six extra carbines, for Barbara not only was armed, but was eminently qualified to expend ammunition without wasting it. Rosales and his small band halted out of range of the ranch, but they went hungry while the quarry fed themselves and their tired mounts. The Clark brothers and their cousin, a man by the name of Mason, who were the sole inhabitants of the ranch, counseled a long rest, two hours at least, for the border was still ten miles away, and speed at the last moment might be their sole means of salvation. Billy was for moving on at once before the reinforcements, for which he had been sure Rosales had dispatched his messenger, could overtake them. But the others were tired, and argued, too, that upon jaded ponies they could not hope to escape, and so they waited until, just as they were ready to continue their flight, flight became impossible. Darkness had fallen when the little party commenced to resaddle their ponies, and in the midst of their labors there came a rude and disheartening interruption. Billy had kept either the Chinaman or Bridge constantly upon watch toward the direction in which Rosales's men lolled smoking in the dark, and it was the crack of Bridge's carbine which awoke the Americans to the fact that though the border lay but a few miles away, they were still far from safety. As he fired, Bridge turned in his saddles and shouted to the others to make for the shelter of the ranch house. "'There are two hundred of them,' he cried. "'One for cover.' Billy and the Clark brothers leapt to their saddles and spurred toward the point where Bridge sat pumping lead into the advancing enemy. Mason and Mr. Harding hurried Barbara to the questionable safety of the ranch house. The Mexican followed them, and Bridge ordered Singh back to assist in barricading the doors and windows, while he and Billy and the Clark boys held the bandits in momentary check. Falling back slowly and firing constantly as they came, the four approached the house, while Peseda and his full band advanced cautiously after them. They had almost reached the house when Bridge lunged forward from his saddle. The Clark boys had dismounted and were leading their ponies inside the house. 
Billy alone noted the wounding of his friend. Without an instant's hesitation, he slipped from his saddle, ran back to where Bridge lay, and lifted him in his arms. Bolts were pattering thick about them. A horseman far in advance of his fellows galloped forward with drawn saber to cut down the gringos. Billy, casting an occasional glance behind, saw the danger in time to meet it, just, in fact, as the weapon was cutting through the air toward his head. Dropping Bridge and dodging to one side, he managed to escape the cut. But before the swordsman could recover, Billy had leapt to his pony's side and seized the rider about the waist, dragging him to the ground. Rosales, he exclaimed, and struck the man as he had never struck another in all his life, with the full force of his mighty muscles backed by his great weight, with clenched fists full to the face. There was a spurting of blood and splintering of bone, and Captain Guillermo Rosales sank senselessly to the ground. His career of crime and rapine ended forever. Again, Billy lifted Bridge in his arms, and this time he succeeded in reaching the ranch house without opposition, though a little crimson stream trickled down his left arm to drop upon the face of his friend, and he deposited Bridge upon the floor of the house. All night the Pesatistas circled the lone ranch house. All night they poured their volleys into the adobe walls and through the barricaded windows. All night the little band of defenders fought gallantly for their lives, but as day approached the futility of their endeavors was borne in upon them for of the nine one was dead and three wounded and the number of the assailants seemed undiminished billy byrne had been lying all night upon his stomach before a window firing into the darkness at the dim forms which occasionally showed against the dull dead background of the moonless desert presently he leapt to his feet and crossed the floor to the room in which the horses had been placed everyone fired toward the rear of the house as fast as they can said billy i want a clear space for my getaway where are you going asked one of the clark brothers north replied billy after some of Funston's men on the border. But they won't cross, said Mr. Harding. Washington won't let them. They got us, snapped Billy Byrne, and they will when they know there's an American girl here with a bunch of dagos yapping around. You'll be killed, said Price Clark. You can't never get through. Leave it to me, replied Billy. Just get ready and open that back door when I give the word, and then shut it again in a hurry when I've gone through. He led a horse from the side room and mounted it. Open her up, bows, he shouted. So long, everybody. Price Clark swung the door open, Billy put spurs to his mount and threw himself forward flat against the animal's neck. Another moment he was through, and a rattling fusillade of shots proclaimed the fact that his bold feet had not gone unnoted by the foe. The little Mexican pony shot like a bolt from a crossbow out across the level desert. The rattling of carbines only served to add speed to his frightened feet. Billy sat erect in the saddle, guiding the horse with his left hand, and working his revolver methodically with his right. At a window behind him, Barbara Harding stood breathless and spellbound until he disappeared into the gloom of the early morning darkness to the north. Then she turned with a weary sigh and resumed her place beside the wounded bridge whose head she bathed with cool water, while he tossed in a delirium of fever. The first streaks of daylight were piercing the heavens. The pesatistas were rallying for a decisive charge. The hopes of the little band of besieged were at low ebb when from the west there sounded the pounding of many hoofs. Via moaned Weston Clark, hopelessly. We're done for now, sure enough. He must be coming back from his raid on the border. In the faint light of dawn they saw a column of horsemen deploy suddenly into a long, thin line which galloped forward over the flat earth, coming toward them like a huge, relentless engine of destruction. The Pesatistas were watching, too. They had ceased firing and sat in their saddles, forgetful of their contemplated charge. The occupants of the ranch house were gathered at the small windows. What's them? cried Mason. Them things floating over them. They're Giddens, exclaimed Price Clark. The Giddens of the United States Cavalry Regiment. See em? See em? God, but don't they look good. There was a wild whoop from the lungs of the advancing cavalrymen. Pasita's troops answered it with a scattering volley, and a moment later the Americans were among them in that famous revolver charge, which is now history. Daylight had come, revealing to the watchers in the ranch house the figures of the combatants. In the thick of the fight loomed the giant figure of a man in nondescript garb, which more closely resembled the apparel of pesatistas than it did the uniforms of the American soldiery. Yet it was with them he fought. Barbara's eyes were the first to detect him. "'There's Mr. Byrne,' she cried. "'It must have been he who brought the troops.' "'Why, he hasn't had time to reach the border yet,' remonstrated one of the Clark boys, "'much less get back here with him.' "'There he is, though,' said Mr. Harding. "'It's certainly strange. I can't understand that American troops are doing across the border, especially under the present administration.' The Pesatistas held their ground for but a moment when they wheeled and fled, but not before Peseta himself had forced his pony close to that of Billy Byrne. Traitor, screamed the bandit, you shall die for this, and fired point-blank at the American. Billy felt a burning sensation in his already wounded left arm, but his right was still good. For poor, bleeding Mexico, he cried, and put a bullet through Peseta's forehead. 
under escort of the men of the thirtieth cavalry who had pursued villa's raiders into mexico and upon whom billy byrne had stumbled by chance the little party of fugitives came safely to united states soil where all but one breathed sighs of heartfelt relief bridge was given first aid by the members of the hospital corps who assured billy that his friend would not die mr harding and barbara were taken in by the wife of an officer and it was at the quarters of the latter that billy byrne found her alone in a sitting-room the girl looked up as he entered a sad smile upon her face she was about to ask him of his wound but he gave her no opportunity i've come for you he said i gave you up once when i thought it was better for you to marry a man in your own class i won't give you up again you're mine you're my girl and i'm going to take you with me we're going to galveston as fast as we can and from there we're going to rio you belonged to me long before bridge saw you he can't have you nobody can have you but me if anyone tries to keep me from taking you they'll get killed he took a step nearer that brought him close to her she did not shrink only looked up into his face with wide eyes filled with wonder he seized her roughly in his arms you're my girl he cried hoarsely kiss me wait she said first tell me what you mean by saying that bridge couldn't have me i never knew that bridge wanted me and i certainly never wanted bridge oh billy why didn't you do this long ago months ago in new york i wanted you to take me but you left me to another man whom i didn't love i thought you had ceased to care billy and since we have been together here since that night in the room back in the office you have made me feel that i was nothing to you take me billy take me anywhere in the world that you go i love you and i'll slave for you anything just to be with you barbara cried billy byrne and then his voice was smothered by the pressure of warm red lips against his own a half hour later billy stepped out into the street to make his way to the railroad station that he might procure transportation for three to galveston anthony harding was going with them he had listened to barbara's pleas and had finally volunteered to back billy byrne's flight from the jurisdiction of the law or at least to a place where under a new name he could start life over again and live it as the son-in-law of old anthony harding should live among the crowd viewing the havoc wrought by the raiders the previous night was a large man with a red face it happened that he turned suddenly about as billy byrne was on the point of passing behind him both men started as recognition lighted their faces and he of the red face found himself looking down the barrel of a six-shooter put it up byrne he admonished the other coolly i didn't know you were so good on the draw i'm good on the draw all right flanagan said billy and i ain't drawn for amusement neither i got a chance to get away and live straight and have a little happiness in life and flanagan the man who tries to crab my name is going to get himself croaked i'm never going back to stir alive you see yep said flanagan i see but i ain't trying to crab your game i ain't down here after you this trip where you been anyway that you didn't know the war's over why coke sheehan confessed a month ago that it was him that croaked schneider and the governor pardoned you about ten days ago you stringing me asked billy a vicious glint in his eyes on a level flanagan assured him wait I got a clipping from the trib in my clothes somewheres that gives all the dope. He drew back some papers from his coat pocket and handed one to Billy. Turn your back and hold up your hands while I read, said Byrne. And as Flanagan did as he was bid, Billy unfolded the soiled bit of newspaper and read that which set him a trembling with nervous excitement. A moment later, Detective Sergeant Flanagan ventured a rearward glance to note how Byrne received the joyful tidings which the newspaper article contained. Well, I'll be ejaculated the sleuth, for Billy Byrne was already a hundred yards away and breaking all records in his dash for the sitting-room he had quitted but a few minutes before it was a happy and contented trio who took the train the following day on their way back to new york city after bidding bridge good-bye in the improvised hospital and exacting his promise that he would visit them in new york in the near future it was a month later spring was filling the southland with new sweet life the joy of living was reflected in the song of birds and the opening of buds beside a slow-moving stream a man squatted before a tiny fire a battered tin can half filled with water stood close to the burning embers upon a sharpened stick the man roasted a bit of meat and as he watched it curling at the edges as the flame licked it he spoke aloud though there was none to hear just for a con i'd like to know yes he crossed over long ago and he was right believe me bo if somewhere in the south down where the clouds lie on the sea he found his sweet penelope with buds of roses in her hair and kisses on her mouth 